Okay, welcome to the initial public hearing for the inquiry into budget estimates 2022-2023. I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians on the lands on which we are meeting today. I pay respect to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal people and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. I welcome Minister Victor Dominello and accompanying officials to this hearing. Today, the committee will examine the proposed expenditure for the portfolio of customer service and digital government. Before we commence, I would like to make some brief comments about procedures for today's hearing. Today's hearing has been broadcast live via the Parliament's website. The proceedings are also being recorded and a transcript will be placed on the committee's website once it becomes available. In accordance with the broadcasting guidelines, media representatives are reminded that they must take responsibility for what they publish about the committee's proceedings. All witnesses and budget estimates have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. There may be some questions that a witness should only answer if they had more time with certain documents to hand, and in these circumstances, witnesses are advised they can take a question on notice and provide an answer within 21 days. If witnesses wish to hand up documents, they should do so through the committee staff. Minister, I remind you and the officers accompanying you that you are free to pass notes and refer directly to your advisors seated at the table behind you. Finally, could everyone please turn their mobile phones to silent for the duration of the hearing. All witnesses will be sworn prior to giving evidence. Minister Dominello, I remind you that you do not need to be sworn as you've already sworn an oath to your office as a member of parliament. For all other witnesses, I ask that you each in turn state your full name, position, title and agency and swear either an oath or affirmation and the words of both are on the cards on the table in front of you. So we'll begin with our first witness to my left, which is Ms Elizabeth Tidd. Thank you, Chair. Elizabeth Tidd, New South Wales Information Commissioner. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Greg Wells, New South Wales Government Chief Information and Digital Officer. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Good morning, Adam Dent, Chief Executive of the State Insurance Regulatory Authority. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Emma Hogan, Secretary for Digital and the New South Wales Department of Customer Service. I <coughs> solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Good morning, Damon Rees, Chief Executive Officer of Service New South Wales. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Um, Mandy Young, Chief Operating Officer for the Department of Customer Services. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Good morning, I'm William Murphy, Deputy Secretary, Customer Delivery and Transformation <coughs> at the Department of Customer Service. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Liz Livingston, CEO of the Independent Pricing and Regulatory Tribunal. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Now, today's hearing will be conducted from 9.30am to 12.45pm with a 15-minute break at 11am. We are joined by the Minister in the morning and in the afternoon we'll hear from departmental witnesses from 2pm to 5.15pm with a 15-minute break at 3.30. During these sessions there will be questions from the opposition and crossbench members only and if required an additional 15 minutes is allocated at the end of the morning and afternoon sessions for government questions. So we thank everyone for their attendance today and we will begin with questions from the opposition. Yeah. Good morning, Minister. Morning. Okay. Um, I understand that the digital restart fund was not topped up in the most recent budget. Um, is that the case? Uh, yes. It, yes, that it was not topped up. Yes. Thank you. Um, why? Well, obviously, I made a pitch to Treasury. I wanted it to be topped up. I'm a big fan of uh, all things digital, but. Uh, Treasury reported back to us that we just have challenges in relation to um, supply. You know, we've got enough projects in the pipeline, but the challenge is, as you'd be aware, uh, in the market, there's just not enough supply in relation to uh, talent coming through. Um, you know, the coders, the engineers that we need to actually do the product. So 
uh, we've got a, a very strong pipeline of um, product for delivery, and we focus on that, and then uh, I'll make another bid next time. Hmm. So it's fair to say it's not regarded as a priority by the government? It is a priority. It's just a question of delivery. Um, and that's the big challenge because, uh, again, like I was with, uh, uh, where was I yesterday? We were having the same type of challenges in relation to finding uh, people in, in the cyber industry or finding coders. Like everybody is poaching off each other at the moment because, we, and that's why uh, the Prime Minister, to his credit, is holding this job summit. You know, we, we've got a, a national challenge in relation to getting the right skills in the right places. Can I ask you then, what sort of things won't you be able to do now? Oh, we've, you've we've, not been knocked back. We, no, we've got a pipeline of delivery uh, that will continue uh, for a number of years. Uh, but Treasury has asked us to, to put our bid in further, which, we'll, we, we, which we will do. But, um, you know, they said to us that it was... Uh, the but there must be some things that you'll now not be able to do. Um, well, everything on our, <coughs> everything on our agenda um, for Digital Restart Fund is in the pipeline. But beyond that, you know, that's going to be, obviously, because I'm not going to be here, so it'll be for somebody else to, to carry forward. <coughs> so basically, you're saying you've got enough money, you put a bid in, but there was nothing in there that was really important. Um, no, I'm not saying that. I'm, I, I asked for more money. I, I always ask for more money. But Treasury argued uh, that uh, there were supply constraints in relation to skills, and for that reason, pause it for a year so that we could catch up. Three years? <clears throat> no, no. It was my I'm saying it was one year. We, okay. Be, okay. If it's me uh, in the role, which it won't be, but if it was me, I'm be knocking on the door. Okay. Right, thank you. Uh, welcome, Minister. Uh, were you disappointed that uh, this fund wasn't topped up given Treasurer Keane spent $42 billion in new spending initiatives? Were you disappointed this wasn't one? Oh, look, again, I, I advocated for it, um, but every every minister goes up to Treasury advocating for things. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think the default is to be expected, is to expect to be disappointed when you go up to Treasury. That's my experience for 10 years. Like. Uh, it's a, it's a sunny day when you get the money you want. I might uh, just turn to um, an issue we've talked about before, e-conveyancing. Uh, you previously uh, but can I But can I say, like, we have been very well endowed with Digital Resort Fund 2.1B and the largest in the country, uh, and a lot of money going to, as you'd be aware, with digital products. So, um, you know, I, I, I've been uh, blessed over the years. So, you know, mm. one disappointment over many years is, is is okay to handle. Yeah, but not a share of the forty-two billion. Well, that's a matter for Treasury. Uh, uh, turning to Ian Vancing, you've argued the case here, and you've argued the case in the chamber for nationally consistent legislation. Uh, now, industry says you're doing the opposite. You might legislate just for New South Wales. Why the 180 degree turn here? Why the reversal on the previous position? Yeah, I've raised this. It's a fair question. I've raised this with um, uh, Arnek and, and the other ministers uh, around the states and territories. Uh, and I indicated that we need to go alone on this one uh, because we are so far advanced in relation to e-conveyancing. Like, we, by a country mile, are the most mature in terms of our ecosystem. It's essentially uh, the whole end-to-end -end is now digitised. Um, other states are catching up. Uh, so we need to go ahead uh, to make sure that uh, this, the, the penalties are in place mm. for our jurisdiction because if we have to wait another year or two for the other states to catch up. You've argued so hard up till now to say we have to be nationally consistent. That was the argument up till now. What changed to make the position change, in fact, reverse? Well, no, it's, it's still consistent. We're going to be consistent with the national so We're going to be the first uh, lead on it. Uh, but then, uh, Nick, but we're all where you're well, Then there's no guarantee the other states will end up in, in the same position, is there? Oh, I, I, we, I am very, very confident we'll end up in the same position. Like, all the states and territories are aligned in relation to this competition position. Mm. Uh, you know, remember, it wasn't just us. It was the ACCC that backed in competition. It was the, the Law Council of Australia that backed in competition. Mm. Law Society of New South Wales backed in competition. Mm. Australian Banking Association backed in competition. Mm. So all the states and territories came on board. It's not just us. So, mm. But in order to have competition, you've got to have an enforcement. 
Yep. And if the enforcement doesn't exist, then competition won't exist. And so, then so Minister, we might, we'll, well, as you've made this point before, we might come back to this issue later in the questioning. Yep. I want to turn to an issue where almost doing your greatest hits here, where <laughs> you've, uh, you've <laughs> done the opposite of what you've just advocated for there. You've created a monopoly in the $4.5 billion parking uh, market. Yep. I want to turn to the park and pay app again, we've covered it here before. I yeah. might just ask if we can give the Minister some, um, the, just the documents. Um, I just, right, it's a great segue, by the way, because they both, in both cases, I'm advocating for public interest over vested interest. I think, the, yeah, there's one, uh, yes, well, we might give the Minister that one, actually. He'll need the numbered. Just the, for the Minister, yeah. Um, so I just want to run through some of the details around the park and pay scheme. That first uh, document there is the um, contract award notice for the... One that's been tabbed, are they both the same? Yes, you'll find they're both the same. I'd use the tabbed version, Minister. That'll be easier for you. Okay, I'll just take you, you through thank that you. one. Yep, That'll just be more straightforward yeah, for you. So I just want to take you through some of the elements of the scheme. This is the... Um, tender for the rocks parking meters, um, which you can see was awarded, or well, was published on the 29th of October 2018. It was a, con a contract duration from 2018 to 2024. You agree with that? Uh, that's what the document says. Yep, and it's worth $1.131 million. You agree? Well, that's what the document says. Yep, and it was lim it was a limited tender. That's your recollection. Well, that's what the document says. Oh, that's what the document yep. says. And can you recall why it was a limited tender? Uh, I'd have to refer to... I don't get involved in uh, procurement, so I'd have to refer to Greg Wells. Yep, great. Um, I might take you to document three. Right, Mr Wells, thanks. We can come back to that, yeah. I, I don't think it's particularly contentious, Minister. Um, this is a uh, document from Duncan Solutions, uh, who supplied the um, meters and were run the park and pay app. You can see there that's an email uh, to your office from Duncan Solutions. You agree with that? Yeah. It's on the 7th of February 2019. It's addressed to dear Victor et, et al. The others, yep. yep. Uh, and it talks that, you can see that highlighted line there, uh, it's sent in to a range of time next week to progress a plan for this project, scope, timelines and budget, and it's from Duncan Solutions. Yep. yep. Who, uh, so this, this meeting um, occurred on the 7th of February 2019. Uh, who was at the meeting, to your recollection? Oh, that was over three and a half years ago. So you don't recall the meeting? Oh, it was over three and a half years ago. Yeah, no. so you just don't recall meeting them? Oh, I have a vague recollection. Yeah, so you vaguely recall meeting them on the 7th of February 2019 with your office, but you can't recall who was there. Oh, a, lot, a lot's happened in three and a half years, Mr. I agree with that. All right, so no recollections at all of this um, it was a, meeting? It was a vague recollection. This was pre-pandemic. The world's yeah. changed. Yeah, pre-pandemic. In fact, just really weeks before the state election in 2019. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And do you recall... Um, but you, 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 do you recall at all agreeing to progress a plan for this project, including the scope, timelines and budget in that meeting? Oh, uh, vaguely, yeah. You vaguely recall. I, I, I vaguely to recall that. the meeting as to the content. Of yeah. I, I just don't have a recollection. Great. I might take you to document four. Uh, this is a deed of confidentiality, um, which was signed by Duncan Solutions uh, with Customer Services. I think. Um, Customers. Yep. Yep. Customer Services. Yes, correct. And um, over, over the page, then at document five, just that extra tab. This is a quote which was provided by for the Park and Pay project. You can see there that it was provided on the 27th of May 2019, just in the top left-hand corner. Uh, so, yep, got that. Um, and were you aware of this quote when it was provided or subsequently? Probably not. Probably not. Um, 
I, I don't get involved in procurement. Yeah, no. Uh, was this quote received by your office or by the agency? I assume by the agency. Again, I, I don't get involved in procurement. And are you aware of any other quote uh, which was received by your office or the agency? No, for I don't, because I don't get involved in procurement. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I mean, as far as we're aware, that's the only quote that was ever received for oh, this um, the again, provision of this Mr. Wells, I service. Don't, yeah. I don't get yeah, and we can yeah. certainly turn to that. Um, I might take you to this email. Um, which chat? This is number six. Yep. Um, so this is an email, it appears, from Greg to your office. I think that's how I read that. Uh, and you agree it says, so they, I take it that's Greg Wells, Mr. Wells, can you um, confirm that? I don't know if you've got that document there. A minister, I might just take you through this. You, you can see there it says, uh, from my perspective, there was not a procurement process, but a trial set up in a government-owned location, The Rocks, and another council that I opted in. You agree that's there? That's what the word says. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It talks about the current usage, uh, just down there. Current usage is 5910 downloads, 3387 transactions in the two councils. Yep. And further down, the rocks was selected as the trial location by the minister's office. You agree that's what the email says? Yeah, I remember that. Yep. Yeah. Why, given you've said a number of times this morning you're not involved in procurement, why were you selecting the trial location? Uh, oh, well, that was on uh, advice and recommendations. Um, but uh, I think from memory at the time, it's because uh, the rocks is the land that we actually own. So. Um, because we had Sydney Harbour foreshore authority. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, and, you know, when you're doing pilots, it's always good to have controlled environments so mm -hmm. that you can um, eliminate risk. Yeah, so, so, uh, so perhaps area. some public interest case about why this was the location, I, I can see where you're going there, but I mean, this doesn't say this is on advice. This says, in fact, the opposite, the trial side yeah. was selected by the minister's office. Do you accept? that it was your decision to select the trial location, not the advice of your I'll, agency? I'll, I'll own the decision, um, but it would have been on advice and recommendations for sure. Like we, we don't operate in a vacuum. Well, yeah, but that's clearly not what this says. That's why I'm asking I, I the question. Accept, I own the decision. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. I'm not uh, trying to uh, distract from that, but I'm, I'm just saying that I... I, I we get on very well with our agency, mm, so we, sure. we, we would have I'm discussions about what are the best, and I, I accept that I would have owned that decision. <laughs> That's why, why you're now the Minister for Fair Training. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> when was this decision made regarding the trial location, to your recollection? Oh, it would have been by you or your circa office. That, circa that document, I imagine. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, over the page on that same. Uh, document you can see further down the agency saying as we look to roll out to more councils across the state we're intending to onboard additional parking vendors how many additional parking vendors have now been added oh, I'd, I'd have to uh, ask mr wells about that mr wells there's now 10 infrastructure providers that work we work with as part of park and pay mm -hmm. Um, I'll come back to you, to you on that, um, on the detail of that shortly in the, well, poss possibly in the agency um, section. Minister, just over the, um, over the page, this is the contract signed with Duncan Solutions uh, to provide the technology for park and pay via direct negotiations. Why was this a direct negotiation? Uh, again, you have to ask Mr. Wells, I, I don't get involved in procurement. Uh, Mr. Wells, I might ask you that briefly. Yes, yeah, so as the minister said, the rocks was chosen um, because in that area the government owned the parking meters, so it was a good opportunity to trial the, t the solution. And who uh, so operated the, them? So the government operated those those parking meters in that place. So Duncan was the the vendor in that, yes. in that area. Yes. Yeah, correct. So we. Uh, we uh, sole source Duncan through that process for mm. a trial. Um, and as we've talked about here before, uh, a probity have confirmed that was the, pr the proper process to do and we followed probity rules and have a probity advice that we've provided to your notice right. around and that Mr. Process. Wells, how much was this contract worth? 
Uh, I'll try and find that for you. Okay, Minister. Um, this contract was signed on the 16th of July 2019, but not published until the 26th of November. Can you tell us why? Uh, no, I don't get involved in procurement decisions, so you're going to have to ask Mr Wells. Mr Wells? So, can I just check, you said it was published on... Uh, it was uh, committed on the 16th of July 2019, but not published until the 26th of November. Why was that the case? I'll have to take that on notice, but I think we, I think you have to publish contracts within 12 months, so it was probably just in the process of getting it finalised and uploaded to the tender site. I'd well, say yeah, they're usually published almost, I mean, to the government's credit, and I think, Minister, you've driven this mm -hmm. approach in some ways. Yeah. This. But, yeah. Well, this is quite unusual to have it published this late. Well, I, again, that, that's uh, out of my purview, but it's, yeah. uh, it's not like I've been hiding it under a bushel. I've been, we had a, uh, I remember the Telegraph did a summit on it, like yeah. we've been talking. Yeah. Yes, no, uh, that's fair. Putting, so um, you're, you're staying clearly here. You were not the decision maker, mm. Minister, for this contract. No. Yeah. Um, were you, did you receive a brief for information or approval in relation to this decision to employ Duncan Solutions? I don't for believe this so. Again, it, it, procurement doesn't come to me. Yeah. And nor should it. Yeah. So you didn't. You, your, to your recollection, you didn't receive a brief no. for I, approval I, I, or for information. No, that, that is, for very good reasons, procurement decisions don't come to me. Mm. So, um, turning over the um, page to uh, document eight, you can see here this is the department saying to Duncan Solutions, "We'll expedite your application and let you know you? of the document eight. Oh, Just that Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Yep. Yep, we'll expedite your application. Sorry. Over the page at nine, mm -hmm. uh, we have the agency here saying, uh, we do not perform any due diligence checks, either financial or personnel, at the time of the application. Um, it goes on to say, these two documents will include details of their key personnel, but we do not verify those details. You agree with that? That's what the document says. Yep. Over the page, at document 10. Mm -hmm. This is your ministerial office. Uh, it appears that you've met with uh, Parking Australia. Um, again, to your credit, notes the concerns they have about Park and Pay. They see it as a direct competitor and your office asking to review the tender process as a result. Yep. I'll take you then to 13. Yep, page 20. Yep. Um, this is uh, an agency official, I won't, won't name them, um, talking to the property advisor uh, and saying this, that highlighted section, can you please urgently advise if this will mitigate the probity risks? And this is talking about certain additional steps that might be taken. What were the probity risks, Minister? You'd have to ask Mr Wells about that. Yeah, so I you're unaware of <coughs> probity well, risks have, uh, to do with I, this? I don't get involved in... Mr Wells? Procurement decision. So I think we were just looking to confirm that the sole source process undertaken was, you know, in, in accordance with probity rules. Well, that's Which not we what it says. It says uh, the, we seek urgent advice from the property advisor of mitigating the property risks. What were the property risks? Uh, I'll have to just read the rest of this in context, if that's well, OK. You do back. that. Uh, Minister, you can go on to see uh, what it says here. Uh, we're seeking to clarify that the trial was based on the location which happened to have Dunk Duncan technology. At the moment, it reads more like we chose Duncan first, then determined the location. That was your agency's concern. Do you want to respond to that? Well, again, all procurement decisions are made uh, by uh, the agency. My, my, my job is to, uh, to set policy uh, where there is a clear problem in the market, and the clear problem is that if you're travelling between the city and Parramatta, you would have to probably download about 15 different apps uh, because there's that many councils, that many uh, commuter car parks and the like. And that is just not, does not make sense. So we were trying to create government as a platform with this. 
And uh, every time I've spoken about it publicly, uh, either there was the Telegraph uh, summit that we had at the time or when it's through social media or through general media, um, the overwhelming response from the public is, this is a good thing. Even recently, we just... Um, there I'm, I'm, I'm handing sentence. at this point to the oh, crossbench for mm -hmm. questions. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Minister. Morning. Uh, at the last budget estimates, we talked about uh, the pet registry, um, and you advised, obviously, that the work there was still ongoing. Um, could you just give us a quick update on where the work for the register is up to? Oh, thanks, Ms. Hurst. Well, I can, I'm, I'm excited by the pet registry because uh, so many people in New South Wales uh, have a loved one and their family. So uh, I can give you this update. Uh, the, the New South Wales Pet Registry is a pet management system for identification, transfer, registration, payment and enforcement. Now, the Department of Customer Service, together with the uh, Office of Local Government and, and Mr Tuckerman, uh, we're working together to design a digital pet registry, services based on customer journeys to enhance the overall customer experience for pet breeders, owners and uh, veterinarians. Um, phase one of the project is underway and will continue to evolve as feedback is sought and procurement secured. Uh, the solution will utilise digital to drive animal welfare industry reform uh, through pet identification, transfer of ownership, recording of vet services, payment and enforcement. The new pet registry will improve the quality of pet ownership, data to enhance data integrity and to uh, better animal welfare outcomes. And this will result in a digital solution and educational material for all users to receive consistent and easy to understand information and comply with their obligations. Uh, there will be increased adoption uh, and it will make it easier for people to do business in New South Wales for breeders and pet owners. The digital pet registry will reduce complaints and requests for assistance, and I know uh, it is currently a large source of complaints, so we need to definitely improve it. The new pet registry will impact more than 3 million pets in New South Wales, uh, 1.56 million households and around 2,500 registered breeders. Pet industry includes a variety of stakeholders, from breeders, owners, uh, vets, and rehoming organisations. Uh, New South Wales has 3,600 vet practices and 700 vet hospital clinics. Uh, there are also hundreds of animal shelters, rehoming organisations, and all councils and council pounds, and this is why inclusion and education is vital. And we understand the need for inclusion. We're working with breeders, vets, pets, owners, and rescue groups, and I know uh, your particular um, passion in relation to rescue groups, and we're definitely making sure we work with them to ensure that they are included in the consultation period. So I, I know, Ms. Hurst, that um, this has been a bugbear for many, many years, and the amount of times people complain to me about the uh, the current pet registry, it's, it's just, it's a disgrace. You know, we need to do better, and uh, hopefully, uh, as we digitise this process and you know, we'll have something to show hopefully by the end of the year, but then in the next two years we'll see a, a very quick evolution of the digital pet registry that will make it uh, best in class in the country. So you're sort of estimating about two years before it's fully, fully functional? Oh, well, yeah, uh, it's, it's always iterative. We'll start with the pilots um, in, you know, by the end of the year, we'll start with those with a, a, a small cohort. But in the same way you saw with the service app, uh, you know, we, we started very small, but then we continue to build and to this day continue to build. And I just see the pet registry having, uh, you know, the, the whole ecosystem in place. We can do some really, you know, big things with the pet registry that we just can't do right now. Mm. Um, in my understanding is that the project was given two million from the Digital Restart Fund, is that correct? Uh, the total allocation is 6.25 for the pet registry. 6.25. Um, will there need to be additional funding uh, 
um, I know you mentioned that we're at phase one. Um, I, and I understand, obviously, that we can sort of build from a product, yeah. but at what point will it, at a launch, do we have enough money for that with that 6.25, or will additional money be needed? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, 6.25. 6.25. Yeah, 6 yeah so um, I can answer that, Minister. So 6.25 will get us to this uh, beta launch, so that will be sufficient to get us to launch, as, which the Minister said is planned for December this year. Uh, and we're supporting the Office of Local Government in building a, um, a subsequent scale business case for, for scaling up the solution next year. So, yeah, we will get to launch. Okay. And how much more funding is going to be needed before um, my understanding is that what's going to get launched at the end of this year will only be for um, breeders and pet owners. Um, it won't include rescue groups and those sorts of things. How much more funding is going to be needed before we can add those sorts of essential elements to the pet register as well? The phase two. Um, so yeah, so that will be dependent on this business case. So we can come back as soon as we've completed or support, you know, we're supporting the Office of Local Government with that business case. Uh, the pilot this year, though, will include vets as well, but you're right, it won't include those groups. So that will be in the next phase, um, which the business case will cover. Um, and, and Minister, do you know if there's additional funding that, that's been put aside for this phase two that will be needed? Uh, or any commitment for that phase two? Not at this stage. That would go through the budget process, so, yep. Um, and do we have a timeline then for that second phase if we don't have the budget? Like, um, would we then have to wait for the next year's budget before that could even be considered? Is that... So the, the intent and what we've advised, um, again, the Office of Local Government who are leading the process to do is um, to get that business case uh, built, which is happening at the moment. So that will go through the budget process this year, whatever that budget process looks like. Again, we think the $6.2 million from Digital Restart will, will see us to June next year, and then hopefully that business case can pick up scaling that investment from next year. Thank you. Um, Minister, recently you announced that you're retiring from politics, which we're very sad to hear. Um, but can I ask, where do you hope to have the pet registry before you leave? What, where, what sort of position do you, will we sort of see it? Will it be a workable piece before before your departure? Um, well, I'd like to see the, the pilot well and truly underway. Um, and I'll have to check with Mr Wells in relation to the length of the pilot. But... Um, yeah, you know, I've seen through other digital products that we've rolled out that if the pilot's on solid foundations, then uh, there's a rapid acceleration beyond that. So I just want to make sure we get the pilot right. Um, do you know how long the pilot's going to go for? I think the pilot was about three to six months. So again, it's in that period. Um, but to build on what the minister just talked about, the pilot will be built on um, solutions that are really fundamental to the government now. So our, uh, the same you know, platform we use for our licensing products, it'll be a log on through Service New South Wales. So there's lots of uh, payments are all through really sustainable platforms that the government's invested in over the past uh, three years. So that gives it a good chance to, to pick up from there. Yeah. I, I can assure you, Mr. So it's, it's definitely on my you know, top priority list of things to do because it impacts on so many people in New South Wales. Absolutely. Um, and I guess just going back, you, you did mention rescue groups and, and as you know, um, you know, a major issue that is facing re um, rescue organisations at the moment is that when an animal comes into their care, um, to sign over the animal, it, it's a piece of paper um, which they then have to hand deliver into council um, and then the councils have to go into the system. Right and councils are overworked and a lot of these rescue organisations are saying they've waited six months to have the animal handed over into their care and then how do they then move that animal into a forever home um, what sort of what can you give them today like if you know if I'm just sort of looking at this phase one if they're not being considered until phase two which is at least six months away before there'll be any and then there's no additional funding at this point in time for that what, what can you tell them today oh, to make I, them it's a fair point and you're right it, the, it is a disgrace that you know, in the 21st century that we still have these paper processes in place that just just delay things unnecessarily and cause distress to a whole range of people so and animals in, in this case. Um, uh, so what, what I could offer, uh, Ms. Hurst, is to speak directly to those organisations and maybe bring them in as part of a, you know, a, a, like a working group or a task force to see how we can start preparing for phase two. Because look, this is going to happen. It has to happen. Uh, even if I'm not here, it has to happen um, because it impacts on so many people and animals. So. 
Um, and, and the beauty, as Mr. Wells has just reminded me, the beauty, one of the great things about this is it's on the Amanda platform, which is part of our e-regulation vision where, you know, regulators are now talking to each other. So the big vision around this is that at the moment uh, you've got councils talking to, uh, you know, safe work, talking to fair trading, talking to food authority, talking to you know, RSPCA, all the different regulators out there, but they're all on different systems. But if they all come eventually onto the one system, then you streamline a whole lot of this, um, this noise um, that is just unnecessary. Yeah, absolutely. Um, earlier this year, the New South Wales government announced $3.6 to build a whole-of-life e-tracking system um, around the welfare of greyhounds registered in New South Wales. Yep. Um, I'm wondering if you were aware of the funding for that particular program before it was announced. Um, no, I can't say I am, but maybe... Probably with Minister Anderson. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's right, of course, thank you. Yeah. I understand it would fall under his portfolio, but I'll come back to some more questions about that in a moment. I don't know, did it come out of the what digital resale fund? 3.6? Yep. Mm -hmm. I'll have a look while during the next... Is it digital resale fund money? Okay, thank you, Minister. I might just pick up on uh, questions from uh, Mr. Graham. Um, to Mr. Graham's question around the e-conveyancing, you, you, you noted that the other states were f too far behind in, in, in the process. When did that light bulb moment occur for you? Oh, uh, pretty much when we started the journey. Like, we, we were already... When did you start the journey then? I'm, I'm looking for specific dates or rough dates. Um, oh, well, I, I could refer you back to um, the intermediate reports. Yeah, I think the first one that I can recall came back in about 2015, 16, uh, which showed independent reports that shows that New South Wales was digitally more than advanced than anybody else. And, you know, like, for example, when I go to these meetings and I talk about fully homomorphic encryption, the other states don't even know what I'm talking about. So, um, you know, we're, we're just so advanced in our digital journey here in New South Wales that it's, um, it's, yeah, it's, it, it's good, but it proposes challenges because we, we need to wait for the other states to, to catch up. In so, areas. but clearly you were, you were aware uh, that the other states were very far behind. Oh, wait, well, in, well, in well, before, different well different before you brought your first bill in. When you say the first bill? As in the one that we just passed in, in May. February. But that, that, that's national law. That was yeah. by agreement with the other states. Yeah, we're all yeah. on, on the same path. That's that's fine. But you were aware that there was problems with the other states. I wouldn't say problems. It were, there are different levels of maturity. Well, that's a problem for national consistency, isn't it? If they, if you, you know, five out of the. That's you know. federation for you in a in a sentence, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it, it is. Um, so I'm just. I'm just trying to say, you realise in 2015, 2016, other states are very far behind. You bring in a bill this year um, and you argue that no changes can be made because, you know, then the other, all the other states have to then make those changes or it, it slows things down. But then you bring in a, this second bill that we'll be debating shortly um, that that totally goes against that, on, onto the premise that Doesn't all the other states are, are that far behind. Yeah, because we're, because we're the only state that is that essentially uh, completed the journey. Uh, you know, we are now at enforcement phase, and if we wait for other states um, until we have a consistent enforcement regime, uh, then we will essentially stultify competition. The whole purpose of this, and again, there's been national agreement around this, is that we need competition in the uh, Elno network. Uh, that's, that's, that's what we all agree on. No, no one's arguing that. We're just, I'm just trying to get to the... But, but if we don't have enforcement regime in place, uh, then, uh, then PEXA, in this case, can do what it likes, do as it pleases, and without any stick. And if that's the case, then by the time the other states come on board, uh, then uh, Pixel would have been so far down the journey that essentially you will kill competition. 
So the only way for us to, to make sure, and I've, I've been very public about this and very open, and I've indicated to all the other states and territories uh, in the RNEC group uh, that, we, that we will go ahead, but we will align it as much as we can uh, to make sure that it is ultimately a national product uh, when it's finally rolled out. But we will be the first to market, there's no doubt about that. So what are you basing your enforcement regime on? Has the national code been developed? Uh, it's in the process, but um, you know, we're, we're already in the market, so we need enforcement now. So how far, when you say it's in process, can we have some more detail? How far down this process oh, are they? I'd have to. You know, have you seen a draft? No. Has anyone in your department or the Office of Registrar General seen a draft? Like, what are we basing this second bill on if we haven't seen a national, we haven't even seen a draft national code? Yeah, I'll have to take that on notice. Okay. Um, but, but again, Mr. Benaziak, it's, um, I, I've been very open about this to all the other states and territories, and, and, and we're all on the same page. Yeah, you were, uh, my concern is that you said one thing to us in May and other members of your government in supporting your bill said one thing to us about how the second bill would be about improving safeguards yeah, and then our second bill is not about improving safeguards and reliability of the system, it's about enforcing, in, enforcement. No, 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 no that's... No, I've got Mr Taylor, I've got Taylor Martin's comments here, you know, it seems he's been put in a precarious position where he's misled the House no, for his comments. Right. That, that, that's because what, what the second bill promises, yeah. or what he, he promised the second bill would be, is not what the second bill is, is going to be. We've been, like, I, I put in the second read speech um, exactly what the second bill was going to be, and it, it's going to live up to that. I, I, there's, again, there's been complete transparency about this. That, look, um, those that are um, advocating for PEXA, the vested interests of PEXA, um, they, they have a line to play, and, and I accept that. that. They're looking after their shareholders and, and the big um, corporate payouts. Uh, I'm looking after the public interest here of making sure that there is a competitive marketplace, and, and not just me. Uh, state and territory ministers right across the country, uh, ACCC, we're all on the same page uh, to look after the public interest because the long-term benefit of this is that we have competition, innovation and, uh, you know, a downward pressure on prices. That's what happens when you have competition. For the, if, now, if you're in Pex's shoes, you'd try and delay this as much as humanly possible. Before we actually in, indicated that we were going to uh, introduce uh, the, the penalties regime, the enforcement bill, I'll call it, which mm -hmm. also has uh, other uh, mechanisms in place that Mr Martin referred to. But before we did that, PEXA weren't even uh, coming to the table in terms of uh, you know, participating in discussions with stakeholders to try and get that competition. Now they are. Now they've realised we're serious, they're coming back. That's why we have to proceed to protect public interests on this, Mr Medanziak. Okay. Um, the user readiness testing report the Office of Gen Register General was supposed to produce. Um, have you seen a copy of that? This is the one that was in addition to the national assessment. Uh, I may have, I just don't recall. Do you want to take it on notice as to oh, see whether it's been received on by you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Industry stakeholders have actually asked yeah. for a copy from the Register General three times and they've have essentially been fobbed off. So if you do have a copy and you are able to table it to this committee, that would be, have, that would be great. Just have it on this, yeah. Thank you. Um, I've only got about a minute or so left. I might throw Brian. that to Mr. Brown. Okay. Mm. Let's uh, talk about live music, Mr. Brown. <laughs> well, there'll be time for that. Um, yeah, you've been uh, clear in public, and you've been clear here today about the fact that you're um, hanging up the boots as a minister. And uh, uh, look, thank I'm, you. I'm for saddened your... by it. I, yeah. It's not something I want to do, but yeah. uh, for you know, family health reasons, I have to. Yeah. 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 No. Understood. I was just looking for this assurance. So you are, it appeared, serving through till um, the election as a minister. That's your well, intention. Well, that's at, at the good grace of the premier. Yeah. <laughs> that's his his call. But hopefully, yeah. Yeah, and that's the discussion you've had with the Premier. Oh, well, 
I won't reveal the discussion with the Premier, but that's a matter for him. Yeah. Yeah. Can you assure the public, though, that you'll be in the seat? I can assure the public that I, I, um, I, I have a Not countdown on... I, I have a countdown. What does the countdown say? How many days have you got left in the job? Uh, 207 days to go. <laughs> <laughs> in the seat... Yeah, but, but and, and the reason I do that, Mr. Yeah. Graham, and everybody in this room would appreciate it probably more than most, is that you know public life is is such a rare, rare privilege. I know, I know very much that uh, when I leave public life, it's very hard to influence the machine from the outside. So I've got 207 days to make a positive difference, mm. uh, and I want to make every day count. Thank you. Well, let's return to um, some of your greatest hits. Uh, <laughs> I knew you'd come back, back to, to the. Uh, I've got a couple of quick questions for Mr. Wells, just as, as we um, uh, deal with those answers. So, you've we, back to this contract issued to Duncan Solutions on 16 July, published uh, much later, 26 November that year. You say you believe you might have 12 months, or one of you said you believe you might have 12 months. In fact, the legislation requires this to be published within. 45 days. Are you aware of that requirement, Mr. Wells? I'll check that and come back if that's okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, you've referred to the 10 infrastructure providers. Um, I was asking a slightly different question. How many parking vendors have since been added to the program? Yep. What's the answer to that? So we currently work with three parking vendors. Yep. So again, I probably need to go back, and I don't know if you want to do it now, to talk through how the, the solution works, but there are now three parking vendors that provide information uh, through the park and pay solution. Thank for you. Us. We yep. might come back to the detail and the value of the contract you had, uh, you were going to try. Yeah, I'll, I'll check that for you with Duncan. I think it's 1.26 million. Yeah, I, I was about to put to you, we believe it was about 1.2 million, so I think we, we agree on that. Uh, Minister, turning back to you, are you aware that this contract, and I've, I've put a copy of the contract in, in front of you, mm -hmm. um, contains an IP sharing clause where Duncan Solutions gets at least some of the benefit uh, from IP here for derivative materials no. that are developed? You weren't aware of that? Yep. Um, were you aware that the one of the probity reports uh, indicates this, that the perceived risk of impropriety of direct negotiations with Duncan cannot be offset. Um, if, if it's in there, yep. Yeah, well, I'm asking that. though about your awareness. Were you oh, aware I, that? I, I, I may have had a, a vague... Um, I have a vague recollection in relation to that time. Again, it was three and a half years ago. Uh, but, you know, I, as you saw in the emails, when the issue was raised by um, Parking Australia, I, I referred it to the agency. And, you know, because I don't, again, I don't get involved in procurement, so I, I referred it to the agency to say, look, are there problems here? Can you have a look at it mm. and, and find a solution to it? Mm. Um, and I might, um, I might just direct you back to those documents, yep. uh, to that uh, document there about a recent announcement. This is the 13th of August 2022, just very recently, yep. about the accessible parking linked to parking yeah, pay, really a positive proud, announcement. Really proud of that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, a $1.8 million investment. 21. Thank you. 21, is that? Yeah, correct. A $1.8 million investment. So, I take it this is state money going in to support a credible goal. Yeah, that's it. Um, out of the dual resale fund, yeah. Yes, yeah. So you're confirming this is state money. A credible, a creditable goal, but you accept this also is a benefit to um, uh, the Park and Pay app. It's also designed to make that app more attractive. Oh, well, the, pro the primary focus of this is to, you know, it's an inclusion piece to help people uh, with uh, challenges around disabilities so to find um, to have a bit of parking solutions and that's why Serena Robbins from I think she's from D uh, Disability Council um, supported it. Yeah. yeah 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 but Minister can you start to see the issue here that's just created in the public mind this is a these this company's got a limited tender for meters at the rocks uh, there appears to just be a single quote for this app uh, put in, it's worth $1.2 million. We know from some of the previous discussions that um, when councils sign up, uh, there's also additional money flowing to Duncan Solutions where they use them for the back end yeah. for transactions. Yeah. We know your minister's office was encouraging 
councils to sign up. We've previously I'm, I'm discussed that. And you, that. Yeah, you say for a, you know, for a public well. interest, yeah. I, I accept that, yeah. uh, but a benefit to Duncan Solutions as well uh, as that maintenance mm -hmm. uh, and transaction money flows to them. I think you'd have to concede. Uh, I, I can readily concede that uh, that there is a technology provider, mm. um, and uh, sure, that technology provider is 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 going to have a benefit. But mm. again, I have nothing to do with the mm. uh, the procurement of that technology provider, mm. and nor should I. Mm. My job is to try and set policies in place to improve the customer journey, uh, and having one app. Uh, with mm. like fuel check, fuel check's another classic example. Mm. Mm. We won't move on to fuel check at this um, point, and, and we've referred to this 1.8 million dollar yeah. okay. investment here. Uh, again, propping up the app, a public benefit. I agree yeah, with that. I, but I, I, I'm propping up the app, a private benefit here as well. Uh, yeah, I, 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 again, my job is to look after the public interest. Uh, the procurement decisions are made. Absolutely, by agency. I might just refer you to this final um, uh, document. This is uh, your agency referring to um, uh, reasons why they wish to not provide papers on the timeline that the Parliament was requesting. You yep. can see that highlighted line. The project team for the Park and Pay app includes approximately 100 people, including an executive team of 20. Um, is, are there really 100 public servants? supporting this app, helping develop this app, provided by a private, who, who we've already paid a private company $1.2 million to I'll, provide. I'll refer that to Mr. Wells. Mr. Wells? I think this is referring to the... I think when we received this Standing Order 52 request, which I think this document's referring to... Correct. I think what... Our legal representative is saying is there's probably a hundred people who's um, who may have had correspondence relating to. There is definitely not one hundred people working. There is. Well, the, what, there is the, what the legal director of your department is saying is the project team for the Park and Pay app includes approximately one hundred people. I think, Are there well, really one hundred people? I think what the director propping the, up this privately so no, so no, funded. App. So no is the answer. The, pro, the, How many the, team, are the team that work on the since inception there's been ten total, but about three, and they're not dedicated mm. to the to the solution. Mm. Work on this solution. Mm. As I said, Mr. Graham, I think what the director of legal here is referring to is the project team that was looking at the standing order to seek these documents. Well, that's not what the document says, and I've found the legal uh, officials in government to be reasonably precise. So that's why I asked the question, Minister. Can you see that? Like, there is a concern here about the public interest you're advocating for and the private interest here of this company being blurred, um, they are getting a benefit from these things. The shared IP, the additional assistance, the $1.2 million we've fund paid them anyway. Mm -hmm. um, the pe private, the public servants working on improving this app. Oh, but, uh, again, I, my knowledge or my understanding is that there are only about two or three mm. at uh, any given time that have been working on this. Um, cause I, but the lines are blurred here and they're blurred after this company met with you in the lead up to the election, the 7th of February 2019. They emailed you personally that day yeah. and you selected the trial site. Despite when you're say, despite you saying that you're not involved, can you understand why the lines are getting blurred here? I, like, and we want again, some Mr. Graham, like, yeah, my, <laughs> my job is to is to look after and promote the public interest. I don't get involved in procurement decisions, um, and I just yeah. I, again, when I look at um, what we are uh, the benefits that we are driving through Park and Pay, um, it is is where we need to be, and I, I don't apologise for it. And You've every seen time the I second about privacy it, report for this. We've never seen the first into well, the... Uh, again, Will I, you release that privacy report? Well, um, oh. Minister, this is your decision. You you can make the decision oh, to release I'll this privacy report. I'll get some advice. You can seek advice, but it's yeah, a I'll question for you. Mr Wells. Mr Wells, what is the advice you're about to publicly give the Minister? <laughs> <laughs> so we're in the process. Yeah, yeah. This is for the accessible parking component. Is that what you're referring to? This is the original, the first probity report before the changes were requested. I'll have to get the timeline, Mr. Graham, and happy to provide that on notice if I'm able to do that.
Well, I'm asking, Minister, for a commitment that that report will be released. Well, again, that I, I, report. I've, got to speak, I've got to get advice from the agency. So, so you're refusing to agree to release no, that today? No, I'm saying I'll respond to your answer, your questions. So I've um, heard these sorts of answers before from other ministers, not not from you usually. Yeah. Will you release this report, uh, this again, probity report, su into this? Yeah, sub subject to advice, yes. Yes. Subject to Thank advice. Thank you, Minister. Yeah. Right, Minister, just it's just I've got to get advice for this, that's all. As I understand it, the technology provider here, um, my phrase, clips the ticket uh, for each of the transactions with Park and Pay. Um, what, uh, how, how is that determined? Does, does, does the government have a role in assisting in determining what that amount will be? Do we know well, what I, that I, I imagine that's subject to the terms of the contract. Yeah. So do we, do we do we know up front what that? Oh, Mr. Wells might be able to answer. That. Do we know, Mr. Wells, up front how much they're going to clip the ticket? Yeah, I, I reject the fact that they're clipping the ticket. They provide a support mechanism for the solution. Price. Yes, yeah. yeah. So they provide a support mechanism uh, for the services that we've engaged them for. That's correct. There is tiering of you know more use, more support, more cost. Um, but yeah, there's not a clip of the ticket on each parking transaction, for example. Which, are, yep. So there's no. So there's no. And there's no. F transaction f fee or similar? No. Uh, so, the, the, so then the, their payment would be sort of a, a bulk number or a bulk amount, sorry? Yeah, so the, as we talked about before, they were, they were engaged to build the solution with us because we chose to, um, we, and to be clear, we chose the rocks first. Um, that would have been part of this standing order as well. The, the rocks was chosen to begin with. Uh, Duncan provided metres in the rocks, yep. so we had no choice but to sole source the information from those metres in the rocks. Um, so we engaged Duncan to build the solution to start with, and as I just said, they provide a support service for that solution, and when, as that solution scales, there is potentially more support required, so there are tiering of support costs based on that contract. Uh, I think that contract's been also provided uh, as part of this standing order, so I think the only components we've um, removed to the parts that are commercial in confidence. Yeah. Um, was there a primary report on the census? Do we, do we work through that with Mr Graham? We're in the process of getting that together at the moment. Okay. And yep. what about a primary report on the accessibility program? That, that they're the same program. I think they're going yep. to be the same that, probity report? That's correct, yep. Um, we, I think from memory we're rolling out 3,600 census right across the state. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and who's the probity report? Uh, which which probity company are we using? Is it? I'll, uh, I'll come back to you today on that. On a Marsden? Uh, no, I don't think so. I'll come back today. I think it's okay. A, yep. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm just trying to get me. So so Duncan makes no revenue out of the transaction out of each individual transaction. It's it's it doesn't work like that. It's yep. not each trans not each parking transaction. It's it's more about the solution that they provide. Again, I can explain how the solution works if that's helpful. We, but we I might think actually it's more about this this afternoon. I think in yeah, the, in the sure. session we've got a bit more time to do that with. And I think rather than have the minister here while we do that, I just no, think it's I'm, probably I'm, a better use of the time, I'm Mr. Wells. Yeah. Here for whatever you need. Can I? I just want to go on to um, actually the uh, the Strata Hub. Oh, yeah. um, if I could, Minister. So in January 2022, um, there was a, um, uh, a contract award notice uh, publicly made around um, All About Expert Australia, PTYT LTD, picking up um, the contract for what it looks like is phase two of the Strata Hub. Yep. Um, what lessons have you learned from phase one, Minister? What lessons have you learned from phase one? Oh, which, I, which I believe went live on July. Yeah, I, uh, uh, yes it did. I got a briefing on it. Um, but uh, look, I, I have to ask the agency in relation to the, what the lessons they got. It's a good question. I, I just don't have it in front of me though. I, I guess what I'm asking, the, yeah. the next question is if phase two, um, what are the lessons we're going to carry forward to assist in the development of that? Uh, of yeah, the, 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 they're all great questions. I just don't have the answer. I have to. There's just so many products across the board. Yes. Um, but Strata Hub is a, a really good one, um, and uh, I can take that on notice. But okay. Fair questions. Okay. Right. Uh, can I? So, um, a few things about the um, how we selected uh, all about Expert Australia. Um, so was it a, a closed tender minister? Oh, I, I don't. I have nothing to Direct do with Direct negotiation? Yep. I have so nothing that, to do Would that be I, Mr. I just, Wells or...? Again, I'm not trying to be difficult. I just no, no. don't have anything to do with procurement. Yep. So, so again, so. would that be Mr. Wells? Um, 
not uh, on no, the, not on. Yes, I think it's part of the next. Not on the um, strata portal. Um, we would normally have categorised that a bit more along the the fair trading yeah. side. So, okay. um, I'll see what information I can get for you this afternoon. That'll be that'll be really. But otherwise, good. Um, maybe for next week. Yeah. We yeah. Well, I'm, week. I'm, I think I'm listed to be with you for next week. Okay. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, we, we can revisit I'll have this. I'm a relevant person because they are legitimate questions. They're good questions. Okay. Yep. Right. Um, and. In that, well, actually, I might explore the rest of these uh, next week, I think. Right. Yeah, because it is about phase two that I wanted to go on to, which is okay. the new thing. Yeah, no, it's important. It's important work because it really does align with the, the work that David Chandler is doing as well. And David's going to be here next week too. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, Natasha, yeah. Natasha Mann, our DEPSEC for better regulations, got the, the brief on it, so. Yep, okay. I think that's one of the ones we've asked to come, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I'm up. Oh, okay. Um, Minister, you mentioned um, probity reports um, a number of times in relation to park and pay. Is it is it usual practice um, by your agency to do probity reports after the fact when these projects have already been announced? I'll have to ask the agency on that. Um, you know, again, it only ar arose because we uh, we had that meeting as, as evidenced by the documents with um, uh, Parking Australia and they raised concerns and I raised those concerns, I forwarded those concerns to the agency. So so you don't know whether property reports are done before well, you, you make that, the announcement? They are operational issues, but you, don't, you know, Mr Wells is here, you can answer that. Uh, so it doesn't concern you that there may be issues of property before you've made an announcement? No. the. Oh. Probity should be um, dealt with, uh, you know, before announcements are made. But in, in this case here, uh, there was an issue raised. Um, I f referred it to the agency, and they sought a report. Okay, so I'll ask whoever's in the appropriate officer: Is it standard practice to do the probity report after the minister has made an announcement of a project? Um, Mandy, do you want to answer that, Miss Young? Sure. So it, through a procurement process, you can do a property report at any time. So it may be prior to going into it to give you advice on the best ways to deal things. It might be through the process to consider whatever coming up and what risks are in place then, or it may be following if, if something is raised at a later date. So a property advice or a, a seeking a property report can happen at any time through a procurement. And you have no concern about putting your minister in a position where there may be questions about a project that he's already announced? So if we weren't aware of the issues prior to, to going into that, then we wouldn't have had a, probity, a reason to, to do the probity report on that particular issue. So when the, when the issue becomes aware, we become aware of the issue, then we'll, we'll, we'll seek the probity okay, well, That may be a question we take up with future ministers when they make announcements. Um, um, can I go on to looking at Service New South Wales, um, um, the uh, centres? Um, if I compare the allocated funds for 21-22, um, budget of 6.1 million, to an estimated expenditure of allocated funds, it seems there's about an underspend of $1.5 million. Would you agree with that? Oh, that would be Mr. Reese. Are you do talking to the minister or Mr. I'm Reese? talking to the minister. He's, oh, he's well, the I minister. Again, it's, um, uh, it's Mr. Primrose, are you referring to the funds allocated for the opening of the 10 new service centres? Yes. Yes, so there has been some movement in the schedule of the delivery of those centres. We've brought uh, some centres forward. We've had to move other centres back. So the discrepancy in the figures you're seeing there will primarily be an issue of timing um, for the delivery of that overall uh, envelope of new centres. So how many new, uh, service New South Wales centres were actually opened last financial year? Uh, we've opened six of the ten. Uh, Last financial year, one, two, three by my four. quick count. Is there a fourth, is there? Yeah. Three. Three. Breezy, Ingadine, Roselands. Okay, so how many have actually been delivered to date? So of the ten, six, six are open. Uh, we have four um, still at various stages of readiness. Okay, when do you expect that those four will be open? Uh, so we expect two to open early um, 2023. 
Uh, we expect one to open middle of 2023 and the final one to open uh, late 2024. Okay, which will open mid-2023? So Glen Glenmore Park, uh, there's, there's the redevelopment of the site uh, taking place there. Uh, that work hasn't commenced, but for our, uh, our best estimates, uh, we're looking around the middle of next year for that site. Okay, and what about, the, you mentioned another one that wouldn't open till... Uh, I, th I think the one that will come in latest next year is the Schofields or Tullawong site. Uh, we're looking at the end of that site. Again, uh, we're reliant on a new development, um, and so we don't think that's going to become available to us until towards the end. Okay. So, effectively, um, um, there will be... You expect to have eight open before the next election under all the ministers? Yeah, we should have eight open, but the commitment was by the end of um, 2023, uh, we'll have the 10 and we're on track for that. I understand the commitment was for in the term of the government. Oh, well, uh, it's, uh, my understanding was uh, in, by 2023. Um, uh, that was my understanding, 2023, but Mr. Uh, uh, Reese has already indicated the delays in relation to two, which were pretty much out of our control because of the local planning decisions with the council. But I, I've informed the local MPs, and the and the other big challenge we had was around uh, Randwick and East Gardens and Coogee. And again, I've spoken to the local members um, in relation to the challenges around that, and they've been um, they've been very good about it as well, to their credit. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'll ask you a question just to clarify, okay. Looking at the 2021, 22 and 2022, 20, 23 electorate budget reports for service New South Wales centres, the New South Wales service centres appear in the 2021, 20, 22 budget electorate reports um, where the service centres are proposed to be built, but not this year's um, fin financial years. Have the previously announced locations been changed? The only location that, to my understanding, that's, that's been changed is the one in relation to uh, Coogee and Randwick, and I've just explained that. Um, I've, I've spoken to both the members for Coogee and Randwick about the, the challenges that we had in relation to locating a site there and, mm -hmm. and why it needs to move, and I've had um, both the members uh, in my office together with the, the relevant person, Service New South Wales, and again, to their uh, credit, um, they understood the challenges that we faced, um, and and they've been um, they've been very good about it. Okay. How long do I have? Cause I've got a complex. One minute. One minute. Okay, I'll, I'll use my minute next time because I have a complicated question okay. rather than break it in the middle. Fair Thank you. Oh, okay. Can I just very quickly come back to a question? Um, it's to do with, uh, the Dun with Duncan Solutions. I believe their contract expired uh, on 5 July this year. Was it extended, rolled over, or did it go out to another tender? Uh, that, the, again, the solution that we use Duncan for, again, we play no role in council procurement of metres or infrastructure, this, so the solution that we use Duncan for was extended. It was extended? Yep. And, and did you go to tender? Or? For one year, yeah, that's right. But did, did you go to tender? No, did not. Just so you rolled over the existing yeah, arrangements? Uh, the original agreement was it had provision for that uh, extension and we, we exercised a one-year option on that. Okay, and at the end of the next year, does it roll over again or is we it, have, is we it a point the where we actually sort of yeah, look at this we, and go, hang on, we talk, this, yeah. there's an interest of the public, are we getting value for money? Yeah, as we talked about last last time, we've uh, we've been through a process to, to determine our forward strategy for the solution, um, and we have the option to roll that over again next year if we need to, or to look at other options. So all of those things are on on the table. Uh, Mr. Premier, I was going to just quickly uh, clarify that uh, North Mead has also moved to North Rocks in terms of the uh, service centres, uh, but the local member is again uh, supportive of that. Ms. Host. Thank you. Um, just before we were talking about um, the announcement of um, money towards an e-tracking system um, specifically for greyhounds, um, and I understand obviously that's come from Minister Anderson's office, um, but I was wondering if Minister for Digital Government, you've been involved in any way in the development of this tracking system or if your team have been involved no, or I, consulted? Sorry, I, I haven't. Yeah. I, I can get involved, um, but I, I haven't. 
I'm just wondering how this system is going to interact with the pet register, given that many greyhounds obviously then enter into the pet industry. Um, and I'm just, I guess I'm confused as to why uh, Minister Anderson's office hasn't reached out to your office, given that these two systems yes, are going to have to interact. Really, really good question. Um, I'll, uh, I will reach out to Minister Anderson following this and find, get some more detail about that, because what you said makes sense. Thank you. Um, do you, know, do you have any um, awareness of why um, this greyhound industry project was actually given priority for funding over phase two of the pet registry, given that it almost sounds like, I mean, we've got 6.25 for the pet registry and 3.6 million for this industry, and it almost sounds like it's recreating the same system, like it's sort of like we've got two of the same system. Maybe Ms Hogan has some more information. Um, I, I don't, but I'll try and find some for you this afternoon because I'm not clear on whether the Greyhound tracking project came out of a regular budget or whether it came out of anything to do with restart or whether it's a subset of something else mm. uh, to do with um, gaming in general, so or racing, sorry, not gaming in general. Um, but I'll have a look in the break and I'll bring an answer back to you this afternoon. Thank you. Um, Minister, you also recently announced that there'd be alert, an alert system added to the New South Wales, uh, sorry, Service New South Wales app um, in regards to fireworks and for people with companion animals. Um, can you give us a bit of background on that and a bit of a timeline on that project? Well, well the background is um, when, when fireworks go off, um, obviously it causes distress to a, a number of animals and um, all we need to do is make sure that people have information about when those fireworks are going off. And uh, Linda Scott reached out to me and she indicated that um, uh, that there was already a, a place in Safe Work where you've got to notify in advance of if you're going to let off fireworks. And it's a simple data matching exercise. Why wouldn't we just uh, quickly say, well, there's all the information in South Wales. Why don't we bring it across to uh, Service New South Wales so that if you want to be notified, for example, you, you have an animal that just does get distressed, then you can um, get notified. And, and to be honest, it's just, it's, it just made inherent sense to me um, because there's a range of things that we're trying to use through service mm -hmm. to get notifications on, and, but we want to personalise the notifications. So, you know, I, I don't have a pet, so I won't need that. But um, I, you know, I might be asthmatic, so I will want that. So when it comes to air quality, I want to get notified about that. But maybe I'll, I'll pass to Mr. Reese to expand about when the delivery will be. Yeah, look, I, I, unless Greg knows, I'll need to take the actual timing on question. But maybe just to I'll notice, but just to build on the minister's mm -hmm. point. Uh, as we've been working this through with customers, we have found sort of broader, uh, broader interest in this feature. Um, certainly one example is children, uh, families with children that are often scared when fireworks are, uh, are close or distressed. Uh, so we see it as really valuable. Um, Greg, unless you have the delivery date for that feature, I'll take it on notice and revert. It certainly is in the backlog. I think it's early next year, Damon, but let's, we'll come back to you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Um, Minister, given, you know, we've just talked about, you know, children afraid of fireworks, asthmatics, mm -hmm. companion animals, um, do you think that there's sort of a move towards sort of more digital laser displays and away from fireworks in the future? Um, well, <laughs> I, I, this is my personal preference. I, I love the, um, the laser displays and the drones, and I've um, posted about that many times. I just think, I just, that's so far more interactive and engaging, but... Um, that's really dependent on local councils. I was at a recent school fete, and, uh, and in the fete that was run by um, local schools, they, you know, they wanted the fireworks. So, but yeah, you know, in, in my world, yeah, definitely, it, it definitely moved to lasers and drones. I think the technology. It's having said that, drone technology is probably on par in terms of the, the cost, but I think that will rapidly come down. Mm, very true. Um, I want to talk about um, the Smart Beaches um, and the Smart Beaches program that received $1.6 from the Digital Restart Fund. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what that funding was used for? Uh, Greg, it's... It's OK, we might come back on notice. OK, something. yeah, I've, I've got a few other questions around... Digital Restart Fund, yep. Yes. Um, I understand that the program's being trialled in five councils, is that correct? Do you know which ones? 
it oh. wouldn't be DCS's program, so I'm not yeah. okay. You're on. You don't have that information. Yeah, it, it would be one of the smart places initiatives that yeah the smart places group is running. So we'll check exactly which councils the scope of what that business case covered, and we, we should be able to come back today. It would have come out of the $45 million yeah, that's allocated. 45. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Minister, do you know that? Um, if that program does sort of get rolled out further beyond the trial, um, whether that will kind of coordinate in any way with the Shark Smart app? Uh, it should, um, but I, I'll get some more details. The, 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 one of the things, when we designed the Smart Places Fund, we made sure that um, that we could pilot but then scale up as well. But initially the funding is for the pilots, but then if the pilots are successful, there'd need to be a separate source of funding uh, for that. But yeah, that may, I'm, I'm, the takeaway from today is in relation to the Greyhounds and the, the Shark App Bowl, yeah, there's a lot of digital products ha happening across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess with the Shark one, just to um, yeah. give a little bit of context there, is that there's a massive shift away from using shark nets, yeah. um, which is great because obviously they're ineffective and they're very harmful to many animals. Um, but, you know, a lot of the other, some of the other programs is this Shark Smart app, which is an element of, of beach safety, I guess. And so it would be great to have those two programs working together um, and interacting. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely make some inquiries. I'll report back to you separately on this. Great. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, in May, it was reported that you're also developing um, a patient app, Minister, that would allow members of the public um, to check emergency room waiting times. Um, and it was reported that the first iteration of the app would be released by mid-year. Um, now that we're in August, can you give us an update on where that, that program is up to? Yeah, so I've received the first iteration of it. Um, it's, it's in very basic form, uh, but hopefully in where are we now in August, uh, September, October, we should have uh, the next version, which will have a bit more, a um, bit more uh, functionality. Because at the moment, it's just, it's just getting all the information together. It's, it's just basically like consolidation of all your, um, you know, critical information that you see in web pages all over the place, just into one place. But then we want more functionality ar around what you can do with it, like we've done with Service mm -hmm. New South Wales. Um, do you have any idea when that the app will actually be up and running for people to be able to use? Um, we're in the... Uh, who's across we're that, Greg? Yeah, I think the beta is available for 3,000 people, Minister. Yeah, we'll we'll confirm pilot. this exactly. The pilot is available yeah. for 3,000 people either now or shortly, and then that will be scaled in, as the Minister said, September, September October this year. Um, and you think that it'll be fully run, running before the next election, or...? Maybe we're away, f not not quite at that point yet. Oh, when you say fully, like mm -hmm. the, the I mean fu a fully lot that we want to put in this. Yeah. Um, but it, will we have the public version? Do you think by the next election? Group? Yes, certainly the version. I think that's being that's uh, released too that we talked about for September October. I think has broader um, a broader set of stakeholders that can use that. So, yeah, it'll definitely be more broadly available before the election. But so, so like the, again, it's like it's going to be like um, you see with the service app. There's going to be a lot of iterations. A lot of, uh, for example, we're in discussions with My Health Record, so that if you want, you can access your My Health Record on the patient slash health app. You know, so there's just the, the potential for that is enormous, and then we're digitising the blue book, uh, hopefully by the end of the year. And again, like that, that's something that you should be able to access through your, your health app. So it's just going to continue to evolve over time. Yeah. We just I just want to get you know the first product to market as soon as we can, so that people can see the utility and the potential. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can I ask how much funding has been allocated to the patient app so far? Can we come back? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And, I, and if you could also let me know how much more, if, if there's a figure noted before we get to a final product, if, if there's additional funding required. Um, I'm also wondering, uh, Minister, if this app will tell patients if there's actually a doctor in the emergency room. Um, this was a major concern at one of the inquiries um, we ran um, in PC2 around rural and regional health and that some hospitals um, didn't have doctors on call and people were just being going into the hospital and then being sent off to another larger hospital where there was a doctor available. And some of the feedback we got at that inquiry was that members of the community really wanted to be able to access that information before rushing to 
to a hospital and finding out that there's no doctor there. Um, is that something that's been considered as part of this app so that people in regional, rural and remote New South Wales can get access to that sort of information? Uh, well, I know that the emergency mm. wait times, because that already exists in a web page somewhere else and not many people know about that, so we're bringing mm. that in, so that's tick. Um, parking, <laughs> we talk about parking. Again, uh, we, we're trying to make parking easier for people, so that will be available. Tick. In relation to um, doctor's availabilities, I'd have to uh, check with Mr Hazard, who's obviously got the primary responsibility around that. You know, you know, our, our job here is to create that, you know, that seamless digital interface uh, so that people can use and trust. But you know, the primary source has to come from health, so I'll have to check with him. Thank you. Um, if you could let us know, that would yeah. be fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Um, I think I've only got... 30 seconds. Oh, I've got 30 seconds. Oh, I'll I'll we'll start in the next one in the next round. <laughs> okay, Ms. Hurst, if I could just mm -hmm. confirm, April 23 for the firework notification in the service New South Wales app. April 23 for the fireworks. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. So I might just uh, try and close the loop on the uh, e-conveyancing stuff. So you, before we finished, you said that we confirmed that safeguards were going to be in this second bill. It wasn't just about enforcement, is that correct? So there was, in this second bill, you are going to address the concerns that were raised in the inquiry and raised through consultation. Yeah, yeah I'll have to, I'll, have to, I'll take that on notice. I yeah, I'll take that on notice. You don't know what's in your own bill? Uh, I haven't seen the final form of it yet. No. Okay. Um, did, well, did, when you sent drafting instructions, did you include uh, uh, safeguards? I'll, I'll have. To, I'll take that on this. Uh, again, there's just so much material across it. I, I've, I've got okay. to my memory. Um, can you provide an explanation as to why the Register General, when they put forward their proposal paper? Uh, for some of these enforcement, or well, this enforcement regime on the 8th of July, they didn't include any of the other safeguards that you're talking about will be in the bill. Why? I'd have to speak to the Registrar General about that. Okay. Did you know about the proposal paper that was sent out on the 8th of July? Did you see it? Uh, I've seen so many documents over, over, over the 14 years. Um, just try and narrow it down to probably yeah, from I, 8th of I, July. I, I, can't, I, I don't have a specific recollection about it, no. Okay. So it's not to say I haven't seen it. Okay, so who would have, I'm just trying to work out who advised who. Did you advise the Register General to put out that proposal paper and what should be in it, or did he tell you that he was going, or she tell you that she was going to do it and then send it out and it'd then judge it? It'd be the latter. The latter? It, it, yeah, highly likely it'd be the latter. Okay. Yeah. But you can't recollect whether you saw that and whether I, I whether that came before no, your drafting I instructions? Wish I, I wish I did. I don't have a uh, my I don't have a uh, memory like a seal trap, no. Uh -huh. um, there's just too much information going across my desk. You need to maybe need to up you need to upload your your, your brain to the metaverse maybe. Well uh, mate, well yeah Musk <laughs> is talking about you know have you heard about Neuralink? Synchron? We'll, we'll talk about that we we'll might talk about that after. Yeah, um, after. what you ask him. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah. so the just... And that's when you definitely would need fully homomorphic encryption <laughs> to protect you. Yeah. Um, that's probably also... Glad glad you, right? this, this sounds like a wonderful uh, cafe conversation, not in here. <laughs> um, the, just clarifying, the proposal paper suggests, obviously, this, as you've outlined, the enforcement powers are a matter of urgency because we're doing everything electronically now. Um, Victoria and South Australia are also doing most things electronically now. They're not. They're not uh, at the end uh, of the journey like we are. That's so, in your view, how far be how far behind are they? Um, well, from memory, they're about six to twelve months behind. Okay. From memory. Okay. Yeah. No worries. Um, I think that pretty closes that off for the moment. Um, I mean, so just go to the Digital New South Wales uh, strategy or the Beyond Digital strategy. Um, just a really basic question. You've got three sets of horizons in each, in each cluster. What do we mean when we say short term? What do we mean when we say medium term? Can you quantify that in a, in a year or years? Bracket, like you might need to look at Mr. Yeah, Wells. He's sort of nodding his head, like he's got Mr. something. Mr. Wells will be able to help me out on this, but you know, I can say that uh, fully homomorphic encryption will be probably in about five to ten, so the back end of this decade. Sorry, what was that? Short term. Back end of this decade. Is short term. 
No, in relation to fully homomorphic encryption, that would. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not talking. I'm not talking about your little pet project. I'm talking about just in general. What does Horizon One mean? What does Horizon oh, Two? What does Horizon Three mean? Well. Yeah, so those plans were a first iteration from all clusters that informed the statewide yeah. prioritisation. So it was a first pass, so it's not, it'd be fair to say it's not standard across every cluster, but what we think about when we think about those horizons is probably one year, zero to one for mm. short term, probably one to three uh, for medium term and beyond that for longer term. And that, that um, uh, those plans form the basis for the prioritisation of all of the digital restart fund process. Okay, and what did mm -hmm. what input did you, Minister, have on what that looked like for other clusters, or did you solely deal with customer service? No, no. Or was no. there some interaction between, obviously, projects that would have some connection with service, the Service New South Wales app? I'm just, I'm looking at some of the other clusters, I'm just wondering how much I can ask you about them. Are you asking about, sorry, I'm just a bit confused in relation to the question. Are you asking about the digital resale fund and my involvement? No, I'm asking about the strategy and, and what they put for, what other clusters have put forward as uh, goals or objectives. Oh, as and Mr. Wells, that they, they, you know, clusters, um, you know, all agencies of government have to have an input in relation to the digital uh, roadmap for New South Wales, mm -hmm. not just us. Okay, so. During the, the recent flood inquiry, it was put to us by the Commissioner of Resilience Centre of Wales that they were developing a, an app yep. where people would come to the centre, that tell tell somebody once, and then that would translate across all yes. all departments. They said it was still it was somewhere tell us, in the tell us once approach to disaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what involvement has Service New South Wales had in that? And what can you tell us in terms of where it's up to? Just yeah, we, we, we've had a, an important role to play. I'll let Mr Reese answer the detail, but you know, my understanding is it should be hopefully available in, in a prototype in, you know, in, in the months ahead, in the very near months ahead. Um, and yeah, it, it's essential because it, it is such a, a terrible pain point. Uh, people go through disasters and, and they have to repeat their story over and over again. Mm. And I, I refer to that as process trauma. Uh, and we need to solve for that. And um, yeah, the solution that we're building out will provide that central repository. It, you know, that's, that's not the hard part. The hard part is then getting all the other agencies to buy in and to share in that. It's just the sharing of that data. So, um, so who's, the, who's the lead agency? Uh, so, well, Mr. We, uh, uh, Mr. Murphy and Mr. Reese are working on that together. Okay, so where does that sit in the, the Beyond Digital strategy? Because I couldn't see it in Stronger, no mention of it in Stronger Communities, which I thought is where it would be. And I'm looking to see where it would sit mm. in this. And you said it's within <laughs> months we'd see a prototype. Yeah, I, I, again, I'm, I'm hoping Greg. very, very soon. Um, so where, where in this strategy does it sit? Can I just answer the strategy component? So those those uh, plans from clusters were developed three years ago to inform the digital restart fund backlog. So this would have been a priority that has emerged since. We're in the process of updating those three-year plans currently um, as part of the next round of um, uh, you know, bidding for a sustainable restart fund. So that would be one of the programs in, in that list, Mr. Benaziak, then. Okay, you would agree it should be a, a, a priority? Oh, absolutely, yes. yeah. without a doubt. Yes. Yep. Cool. Um, just going to some of the other uh, items listed there, it says modernised licensing and compliance. I've asked you this before, it, does this mean we're going to see a digital firearms licence and, and everyone else, you know, we've got a licence for everything else electronically and the one thing that we don't have is, and I know some of my constituents are calling for, is being able to have that digital firearms licence in their digital wallet. Uh, it, it, it would ultimately be... Sorry. Sorry. I, know, I, I know, obviously, you need to deal with firearms registry, and I, I feel your pain, but w <laughs> they, cri they use a critical part of your, uh, your, your ecosystems to, to do their functions, so I'm just... 
wondering what the holdup is. So we have an e-regulation solution which we're bringing multiple licences onto the platform, which will see different licences then mm -hmm. shared in the My Service app. Where the firearms one sits specifically, I don't know. I'd have to take it on notice as to whether it's on the roadmap and if so, uh, when it would be um, released. Currently, the primary licences we've been dealing with are more things like uh, white card or tradie yeah. kind of licences, yeah. unless Mr Reese has got... But they're, they're, already, they're already up, aren't they? The white card and... They're up, they're, they're up. up. But they, and so we've got lots of those in the pipeline. I'm just not sure where the firearms one is, so I'll find out for you after the break. Okay, thank you. It'll ultimately be a question for New South Wales Police. As yeah, I, my colleague will probably be asking the same question, but I just... I, I noted it here. Um, one of the other elements which is not in your strategy but it's in the stronger communities one is to do with the registry and it talks about a continued development of a connected ecosystem. I'm assuming that means Service New South Wales as, a, as part of that connected ecosystem when it talks about the continued development and the contemporary insights platform. I'm just trying to understand all these, bi these buzzwords that really mean nothing. <laughs> So I don't have the context of exactly what you're looking at in the Beyond Digital strategy, but um, if it's talking to digital ecosystem, it'll be about more systems and platforms talking to each other. If it's talking about customer insights, it would be talking about um, the work of the Data Analytics Centre and Mr Murphy's work around customer and behavioural insights that we do. That's an all of government um, okay. service. Sure. Um, probably just one final question to wrap up. In previous assessments we've spoken about the obviously the, the delays in driver's licence testing that that were caused by COVID. I wonder if we can get an update on that and whether we have any projected modelling about how these new proposed changes where we have uh, international drivers having to yep. sit a test, how that's going to impact and yep. whether we've, we've done any calculations as to... Mary's coming up in, I think, in the next few months, but Mr Reese can give you... Yeah, so knowledge. first possibly an update on where we are with those delays in terms of churning through the backlog. Gone from 18 days to nine days, so we made inroads into that, but Mr Reese can give you... Yeah, so, so there's been very good progress. Our target for people to be able to access a driver test is um, 10... Uh, working days. Uh, we've now brought our average across the network down to that. There are a number of sites where we're still sitting above that where there's more work to do. So of our 103 sites where we do testing, there's still about nine that we're not happy with. The worst of those sits at 25 days. Most of them are in the teens, but we've got to bring that down. And we've got a number of things to do that. On without. notice, can you provide the ones that you aren't happy with that are above your expectation or sitting above what you expect? We, we can, we can. Those wait times can be quite dynamic, but they're the sites that we're focused on at the moment to do further work. We've brought on additional driver testers. Our driver testers have uh, done Super Saturdays in a range of locations across the site, so all of that has helped. Uh, as the Minister flags, we have a new driver testing hub uh, opening in September in St Mary's. Uh, we have a mobile um, driver testing service that goes online later this year as well. So, so we've we've got most of the state back where we need to and work through most of the um, the pent up demand from COVID. Uh, we're working very closely with transport on the overseas licensing um, uh, changes that they're looking to make. We're still working through the detail with them and we need to land exactly what the details of their reform are going to be so that we can work out how best to operationalise that. Uh, our, our approach will be to ensure that that additional demand doesn't impact our current performance around driver testing and people's ability to access driver tests. Uh, and so we are working through what is that demand shape going to look like, what's the extra capacity we'll need, and are there extra sites that we're going to need to bring online to logistically support that additional demand. Sure. Thank you. That's my time. And I'm looking above Mr Donald's head. We are now at 11 or close to 11 o'clock. So we... Peter, so is your, or he has his coffee. He already has, but none of it. Staffing is very efficient. Very, he, very he, he, he jumped very on. Job. He jumped on that app straight away. Um, <laughs> so we'll break for about 15 minutes, and we'll come back at 11, 11, 15. Yep.
Okay, welcome uh, back after that short break. We will now throw back to the opposition for questions. Well, thank you, Minister. Just a few on workers' compensation, if I can, please. Um, um, I'm advised that the um, McDougall's recommendation 34 stated that the government should, and I quote, appoint a suitable agency or body to conduct a review or reconciliation of the Workers' Compensation Act 1987, Workplace Injury Management and Workers' Compensation Act 1998, and State Insurance and Care Governance Act 2015 into one single piece of legislation, as well as respond to the gig economy. Can you tell us when that's likely to happen, please? Uh, that's if you got the, if you got yep, the so um, that work has actually commenced in terms of the preparatory work for that. Um, that'll obviously be a very long-term project. Yeah. Um, to rewrite legislation that complex won't be an easy task. We've already engaged with the Parliamentary Council's office to get some sort of guiding instructions on how we might approach it in the first instance. So, for example, the consolidation of the legislation has been flagged as not a particularly great idea and it's one where we might more try to start again with a fresh bill. Um, so that work has already started. The team has been recruited to start the process of, of redrafting throughout the course of that initial work will determine what resources are needed and what approaches and more important, most importantly I think, what the stakeholder consultation strategy will need to be for something that complex. The public service love Gantt charts. Um, what's, the, what's the time frame for this? What's your Gantt chart look like? Um, the process at the moment is to develop the Gantt chart, so we, we haven't actually fully um, mapped out what the complexity of bringing those is there a Gantt chart for the Gantt chart, I suppose. Yeah, pretty, pretty yeah. <laughs> I'd hate to, to, to admit that, but yes, essentially we're in the very preparatory phases now, um, so given the government accepted that recommendation, we'll prepare all of that work um, over the coming months. But uh, there has been progress, like we've been on the journey now for about five years and you know, we did establish the Personal Injury Commission and that was bringing together those two statutory schemes and that was a massive amount of work. But you know, the end goal is we should have all personal injury, I think. And I remember speaking to Mr Shoebridge about it at the time. But that's, I think, where we need to be and you know, we're on that journey. Hmm. So not being familiar with Gantt charts, I'd, I'd use ballpark figures. Um, any ball Probably more park. accurate. Any <laughs> ballpark? Uh, I, would, I would ballpark to say it would be um, a good 12 months before we'd be in a position to bring um, a draft bill. Uh, I would even think that might be optimistic based on the advice I've been given internally at this stage. It will depend on the stakeholders, and I think you'd appreciate there are very substantially um, different views across the stakeholder groups that would need to be navigated. Okay, so the government's accepted that recommendation and work's taking place and you'd expect a, a draft bill in about 12 months? No sooner than 12 months. No sooner than 12 months and no later than two years? Oh, look, I would hope, I, I'm the ever, ever the optimist, um, Mr Primrose, so I can't imagine my policy teams are sitting listening to this now hoping I will give any commitment at all, um, but I would, I would, given the complexity, and we're talking, if, if we talk just about the two principal workers' compensation acts that Mr McDougall mentioned, there are also others, and to understand the economy, I, I don't expect it will be a simple process from a consultation point of view at all, so um, I would like to think within two years that would be a reasonable target. Okay, thank you. Look. Just continuing on with the outstanding um, McDougall recommendations, um, are you moving on changing whole person impairment as threshold test for medical treatment expenses? Uh, we weren't able to reach uh, a reasonable position with stakeholders on that in the original consultation around that. So um, in the absence of being able to deliver on that any sooner, it will be part of the overall rewrite. Um, there, we, as with any of those benefits we uncovered, when you start to deal with one element of them, they link to another and it becomes quite, uh, quite untidy. So if we can't in the short term reach a position on that that would allow us to bring a bill next year sometime, it'll be part of the overall rewrite. But we'll continue working with the stakeholders in the hope that we can land that. And that's in your Gantt chart? If, were there to be a Gantt chart, uh, you would find it in that Gantt chart. Precursor to the Gantt there, chart. It, it, okay. look, in, 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 in the preparatory work we've done so far, we've ultimately identified there's a couple of tranches of work and we still want to focus on some of those key benefits issues that were raised in McDougall early. Uh, and the CIRA board and I have discussed that our view would be rather than to try and tackle everything holistically, there would be some merit in at least doing that work around benefits first. If that doesn't get us to a point we could bring it as a bill in its own right, then it would just fold into the overall work, but we will attempt to tackle that first. 
Can I ask you a question in relation to Professor Driscoll's work on deemed diseases for Safe Work Australia, Minister? And I'll just read out the question that was given to me by a worker. Why are you not following other states in adding the Driscoll Report's deemed diseases to the New South Wales workers' compensation system, given this will not only help injured workers but also save the scheme money because it stops disputed claims in the workers' compensation system? Um, I'm not across that no, the report, um, Mr Dent, do you, are you aware of it? Um, that le first of all, that legislation is actually with Minister Tudor Hope rather yeah. than with Minister Dominello and Sarah. Having said that, um, that work has been passed on to um, iCare for, for them to develop the advice to the Minister for Finance. So the, the Driscoll report was, uh, we, Sarah was responsible for doing the actuarial assessment. That was done and passed on in November 2021. Thank you. Okay, I'll come back and I'll just hand over to my colleague just to continue asking a few questions and then I'll come back to work as complainer. Okay. Yeah, thanks. <coughs> um, yes, I just want to go back to the, um, uh, the e-conveyancing uh, regime that's been put in place. Um, and I guess my question sort of flow on a bit from Mr Banasiak's line of questioning, but w were um, Arnick consulted on the proposed second bill or have you consulted <coughs> them on the... Proposed oh, sorry, I didn't. Can you repeat that? Have, have you consulted Arnec on the proposed second bill? Uh, I've, I've definitely informed Arnec of the uh, proposed second bill, um, and uh, the the officer Richard General uh, would have no doubt been involved in deeper discussions around it. Okay. Have they? Did they see the discussion paper? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about that operational detail. I'm not sure. Um, I, I can. I can. I can take that on those and report back next week. Okay. Um, has DCS had discussions with representatives of the conveyancing in industry and insurance industry uh, about an insurance scheme for conveyances, given the increased risk, the potential increased risks that they may be exposed to? Sorry, sorry Mr Beach, can you repeat that? About question? insurance, some sort of insurance scheme for conveyances going forward. Yes, what about it? So, um, have you had discussions with representatives uh, of the sector around what that... Oh, I haven't. No, not me, but the, the ORG, the Officer Registrar General may have. Okay. I, um, but again, I, I'll, I'll make sure, if it's okay with you, I'll ask yep. the uh, ORG to be here next week. Yep. Well, that'd be... Yep. 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 Um, cause we, so, we'll go back to your statement around, you know, part of your role as a minister is to act ensure that the public interest is being protected. Absolutely, yeah. One of the, one of the concerns I see here is oh. um, if there is a re, um, insurance put on, if conveyances take out an insurance process, yeah. they add that cost. And so then the, the consumers, the, the punters, actually then have to pick up the cost. And so some sort of insurance product that covers them um, that, is that is affordable is really critical. Oh, that, that makes sense to me. But having said that, you, know, you would have thought conveyances would have to have insurance anyway. Um, you, you, like they are dealing with the largest, uh, uh, you know, in most cases, the largest investment a person will ever make. Um, you know, so I would have thought they would have some form of professional coverage. Uh, okay. Um, and so then, um, can I, just, I just want to talk about it's a segue here. It's about probity advisors, probity auditors, a bit of discussion. Um, I gather from your earlier comments, Minister, you probably don't get involved in that level where the determination on each contract or... I definitely don't get involved yeah, yeah. for good reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the role around determining the probity advisors in the first instance or probity auditors, because there are actually two different things, um, how does that work within the agency? Is, it, is there a, a, like a taxi rank where the agency goes to oh. first off the rank? Can I just, I just want yeah, to know. It's, it's, it's a good question. It's, that's operational, I'll leave it to. Miss Young, do you want to take yeah. that? Sure, so I think the first thing to say is that we have a responsibility to ensure the high standards of probity are maintained through procurement. Um, the responsibility derives from the fact that we are spending public money, as we know, and we need to be accountable and transparent. In some events, it might be considered to use an external property advisor to oversee a procurement process. However, it's the exception rather than the rule. So primarily, we will use internal property advice from our, our legal team 
to provide the advice around procurement needs, and sometimes we will go externally if it's warranted. So if the risks are quite specialist or depending on the size of the contract or the nature of the contract or what's coming in, we might go and seek that external property advice. So that can be provided by a range of providers, and those would be um, part of our, our, our broader government procurement panels. And so, so the, the government would have um, already, so the, the, I see this panel has been predetermined via an assessment process undertaken for government, and then the aid, respective agencies, including the ministers, would then go to that panel um, to select someone. Is that I'd, I'd have to come back to you, but that's my understanding, is that there is a range of consultants or, or external providers that can provide that advice, and that that's part of the way that they are accredited to provide support to government, and yep. that would be through that process. But I will we'll come back to you on the exact process, if that's helpful, and okay. which particular panels we might use. Okay. And so um, I guess then for um, something like park and pay, uh, I think earlier Mr Wells, you said it was OCM. Is that O'Connor Marsden? That was the original um, private advisor, yes. Okay. Um, as a matter of interest, how many does the department use a, a, a different, a range of different probity advisors and probity auditors, or do you mm. tend to use the same two or three? I, I, I say this because I think the field's small. But. I, th I think you're right. I think the field is small, but I think, again, that's the detail we can come back with you on, on who is available to do that work and who's accredited to do that work. Um, we don't use external probity advisors that often because we have a really strong legal team who provide um, the advice internally, and it just will depend on the type of information we're seeking or the risk that we have and whether that risk can be managed or mitigated internally or whether we actually need to go externally to seek that advice. OK. And, and Minister, when... Um so when a probity, I know you stay above the procurement process, but probity advisors essentially are to provide protection for the taxpayers of New South Wales that a process is being followed. That's essentially why governments of all persuasions use them or engage their services. Are you ever advised when there's a contract that there's a probity advisor who's been appointed or a probity order at the end of the process? Oh, well, in, in this case here, um, yeah, as I said, we, we got a... Uh, a concern was raised by um, Parking Australia and um, we referred that off to the agency and the agency then uh, you know, went through uh, the process that they've just outlined. But no, in day-to-day -day operations, no, I'm not informed. You're never, never really informed then? No, no, there are operational issues that the agency you know, do and should do. Okay, um, so... Um, I just want to get my head around this process. There, there, so, so I'm, I'm not saying I'm never informed. Like there are occasions when you know somebody, if, like if, if an issue um, is, you know, if, if 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 an issue is becoming contentious, then obviously um, you know the agency will report to me and say, well, this is an issue. This is how we're dealing with it. But, but in the normal day to day. Uh, workings of an agency the size that Ms Hogan has to deal with. No, I wouldn't be informed. So, if, if the, so to follow on from that then, so if there was an issue raised, um, if, if, if the probity advisor has picked up on something that's actually um, potentially high risk or uh, not, a, not, a, not appropriate in the process, would the department flag that with you, Minister, to say, look, this has been identified and this is how we're working through that? or? Like, at what point... I know you want to remain above that, but if there's a circumstance... Like, as a minister, I would suggest you would need to know when something's untoward or... Yeah, so if, if, if there is a concern, a, a, a material concern, um, that it goes beyond the day-to-day -day operation of a matter, yeah, of course, it'll come to my attention. But, but again, in the day-to-day -day operations, um, yeah, Ms Hogan has my complete confidence. Thank you. Uh, so... Thanks, is that mine? Thank you. Got the Thank real you. coffee. Whoever that is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You'll note we went downstairs too. Um, so... You started it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I start a lot of things, Minister, and sometimes I don't even know I've started, started the fire. Um, right. So, um, with the... Uh, so, I'm just trying... So, the probity advisors, so we go through that process. At the end, the decision's been made. Oh. As a part of the brief for the, the, the decision that's been made that comes to the Minister, does that include who the probity advisors, probity auditors are? 
Oh, oh, do you want to? Um, it, it could, but it wouldn't be something specific that we would mention. We would be more likely to highlight um, particular risks or issues that we've dealt with and how we've dealt with them. Um, it, whether or not we'd used a specific property company um, may or may not be mentioned. It wouldn't be something I would think specifically about. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we genuinely do try to deal with all operational mm. and probity matters and contract management internally within DCS. Obviously, we have a positive and productive working relationship with the minister and his office. If there's specific things we need to mention, we will, but uh, it wouldn't necessarily um, be a requirement to share with him or the office which probity advice we'd used. We might talk about the advice we were getting specifically, but... Um, yeah, it's not sort of a standard operating procedure. And, and to Mandy's point earlier, we don't actually use them all that often. We, it, it would be more common that we would get internal legal advice on probity matters. Okay. How big is the legal team within the department, Minister? Is it of uh, About 120 lawyers. I'd, I'd, I'll check uh, with you on the numbers and I'll come back to you. But F 120 FTEs or 120 individuals? I believe, but let me come back to you with the exact numbers. Okay. Uh, Just um, in terms of your note, the, the approved supplier scheme is scheme 0005, if you wanted to. Yep, yep, okay. Um, I think that's... Uh, um, so, Minister, um, does, your, does your cousin work for one of the, um, the probity teams in New South Wales, do you know? No, no, I, I, I don't know. Which I've got a lot of. I've, I've got, I've got ancestry.com, and, <laughs> and uh, the last time I checked, I've got about 472 cousins. I, you see, I've got 42 uncles and aunts. I appreciate. Yeah, so I've got a lot the of cousins. Of so, uh, so the the answer should be I don't know. Okay. Because I've got so many cousins. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there would be a process. I'm happy to share them with you if you want. <laughs> we, we may already do that. But, ministers, um, but there would be a, a process within, in your office, though, if, if there was a potential conflict, how that's managed. I know you keep the, you've said many times you keep this I, separate. Yeah, I have, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so, but how does that work within your office? To, in what sense? To, to manage the, any potential conflicts like that? Is it. Um, well, I, I, I disclose my conflicts. I uh, inform. Uh, Ms Hogan of the conflicts um, and and then I will not get involved in any decision. Okay. And Ms Hogan, you, you record that somewhere so that it's... Um, oh, yeah, um, we would. I'm, I'm not sure if you're referring to a matter that was raised last time where um, I think one of your colleagues referred to one of the Minister's cousins working in a, a legal firm or a probity advisory. He wasn't aware of that and he hadn't raised it as a conflict because he wasn't aware of that and also the contracts that we were dealing with had nothing to do with the minister. They were dealt with 100% operationally. I can't remember exactly what no, the no. case was. It may have even been okay. no, right. park and pay, but... Okay, thank you. Do you want to go on to your speaker or do you want to keep going? Yeah. So, um, Minister, can I... What are the, the projects that were funded in the digital... Oh, I'm fascinated by this bit. The, di the digital um, fund, digital restart fund, Re restart fund yeah. is, is a smart curb, or is, is a curb sensor or something. Do you, are you aware of this? Smart yeah, sensors. Smart, yeah. So, oh, yeah. how does this work? So that you, that you're talking about disability sensors. Yeah. So, well, basically, the, the sensors that you put uh, on the ground actually, if you go and have a look at them, they're in Bondi, um, and they just look like. Um, like a scratch, like a, like a micro pothole type thing. Uh, they're about like two, mil, two millimetres, maybe three, below the surface, so you don't even know um, that they're there. Uh, and they just, uh, they just detect whether a car uh, is over that sensor or not in that disability space. Okay. That disability, then that lights up, so on your Park and Pay app, which I'm happy to show you now, um, will show you whether that sensor is available or in use. So, you know, in Bondi, for example, if we go there now, you can see all the sensors there. Yep. 
And this is fun. This this project, which I'm not saying is a bad project, just to make it very clear. Oh, it's, a, it's a great project. I think project. it's a very yeah. good thing. So, so you, I don't know if you can see that, but you can see yeah, yeah. that red shows there's a car on that sensor. On that so, you know, if you're in a wheelchair, don't go bother going there. Because yeah, because it's already taken. Yeah. yeah. So projects that are funded from the Digital uh, Restart Fund, yeah. um, is there like an, um, an annual report? That they like a, an acquittal on the funds? Yeah, is there a there, process? There is, um, and that went through ledge. So uh, Mr. Wallace can go through the details of the report. Yeah, and, and, and the list of projects too. Like I'm just mm. some of these projects, like that one, I think quite worthwhile. I just want to get my head around what what are we funding from this this but that, project? But again, that is the beach is on the park and play platform. We've got to put it somewhere because imagine if you're somebody in a wheelchair, you, you, you want to have all your options on the table in one ecosystem and that, that's why this is customer centric rather than downloading four different apps. It's just crazy. On one and have it. Yep. Hold on. So, yep. for example, on the Park and Pay app, it's not just the disability sensors. Um, you know, it, the long-term vision is to put loading zones there for tradies, you know, because that's another pain point. Um, you've got, uh, you got um, Charge Fox on there. Uh, you've got Park Hound for people wanting to rent out their driveways. You know, so you put everything there in one place. So, um, and, and, and again, it's... It has to be the way we move forward as as governments around the world. Government as a platform has to be the way of, of a of a digital world. Otherwise, it's just too complicated. I, I come back. I just want to go through some of these projects in your digital restart funds. But yep. my time, I believe, yeah, of has sorry. Yeah, sorry. No, no. Yep. Is it okay if I just jump in just to clarify that we only have 85 lawyers rather than ah. 120? We could do with 120 <laughs> though. So, so you've um, made the amount an of work that they do. You've made an ambit claim. I, I'd rather have more engineers. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a view about uh, this building and and lawyers. But uh, right. one of our lawyers' friends is probably about to ask some questions. So <laughs> we're named and shamed. So. <laughs> A lawyer said well. <laughs> um, good morning, Minister, good morning. and to all of you. Um, I wanted to start by asking um, some questions that were inspired actually by a tweet that you uh, you made a couple of weeks ago around e-tags oh. and replacing e-tags with um, an app on your oh. phone. Um, now, I completely appreciate the um, the failings um, of those plastic. E tags. Um, what did you have in mind, and is this something that you've seen elsewhere? I have. Well, again, I credit to uh, uh, Minister Ward because she came up to me and said, "Like this, this is a problem." And I readily agreed with her. It's a problem, and you know, you only have to do a quick search on the net to find out that you know, smart places around the world have got um, uh, you know, cameras. Mounted on on the bollards, as it were, the above bollards on the bridges, uh, so you can have um, camera reading technology in relation to number plates. So, and and then that way you can connect it straight to an app. So that's how you know, smart countries are doing it. Um, but that, that's something that Minister Ward and and the team are working on in terms of what a good solution would be. Having said that, uh, I, I think governments need to start moving away from prescribing solutions. I think the, the smarter way to go about things is to say, here's the problem. You know, why don't you tell us what the possible solutions are so we're not sort of narrow in our focus. So um, we're going down that pathway now. Um, are you aware of... Um, so in some parts of the US, Transurban has been, um, I guess, appointed to... Um, you know, as toll collector, but they're doing it based on distance charging and time of day charging, etc. And they've they've been installing um, like a you know some sort of device in people's cars that tracks them on a GPS basis, um, so that they can then work out where they are, when they are, and sort of how much they then get charged. Yeah. Um, and we've heard some horror stories about that, where people have been imagine. unsuspectedly found in congestion when picking up their kids at 3 p.m. Yeah. Um, has that idea come to you in any form, either from Transurban or from someone else in the government no, already? That's, that's the first I've heard of that. Sorry? No, that's the first I've heard of that. Um, Again, the, the, only, the only issue that came to me was Minister Ward saying, you know, this is old tech. 
you know, what, you know, surely there's a smarter way. That's why I tweeted about it, posted about it, saying there's got to be a better solution. And then, again, I just did a quick search on the net and said there's at least one or two options that I can see. Yeah. But, again, it's, it's not... That's going to have to be dealt with through Minister Ward. She's got primary carriage of it. Sure. Um, obviously, there is a concern. At the moment, we have private toll operators who are able to, they've got records of sort of where you're driving, when, if you're going through yeah. um, the gantries. Yeah. So, gantries, thank you, that was a word also. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've spent too much time doing tolls work lately. <laughs> um, uh, uh. Is, um, is it concerning to you that, or, or I guess, if I ask that question, you, you, you'll say yes. So, I'll say, um, is it, I guess, what would you suggest that the government put in place if we were to have that more sort of um, GPS tracked um, style of app, um, how would we ensure that that data isn't uh, misused in private hands? Um, yeah, that's that's a really good question. And I actually um, posted about this also just recently in relation to the AI. Um, and I asked the, um, the Privacy and the Information Commission, Ms. Uh, Tid, to, to do a scan, of, you know, global scan of what's best practice, because you're right, like, you know, privacy data, uh, then, you know, whack a bit of AI on top and you get some horrific outcomes, as, as you've suggested. Um, so I think what we need to do is make sure that we have those assurance frameworks in place. Now, we've already got a number. So we've got um, AI assurance framework. Uh, we've got the AI policy that frames it all up. Um, we've got the AI ethics committee. Um, and, and then ultimately we got oversight through um, Ms. Tid's organisation. But, you know, what is best practice? Because that, that small example that you just gave highlights how bad things can get if we don't have assurance frameworks and oversight, independent mm. oversight. So that's what I'm looking for. So, so I guess tolls is an example of the type of service that people have to use or regularly use as part of their day-to-day. What other examples are there of, I guess, that sort of thing that we have outsourced to private companies? Just trying to think. When you say outsourced to private companies, so in terms of there's a contract between us and the other, between the government and the um, the toll operator in this case. Yeah. Um, do we that allows them to collect that information? Do we have other examples of that? What other data is sort of being collected other than through the Service New South Wales app? What is what other? Uh, that's why that's why I'm, I'm trying to think in, in, because I, you know I, I know in our space, but in terms of other agencies, I, you know, I'm just trying to think what would be there. Can I? Can I yeah, it's, yeah. Can I take on those? I'll think and I guess that. where I'm going is is there an opportunity then for that app? Um, the app idea that you've been suggest uh, you've been uh, talking with Minister Ward about to be brought within the sort of Service New South Wales sort of oh, stable of apps, so the, that we're not giving out that information to private so, companies. You raise a like this is such a fundamental question that you're asking, and it's something I'm very very passionate about um, because you know I really believe that we have to empower the individual with more control over their data, their privacy, their security, like. I, I've given that many speeches around um, trust in the digital space, and you know, we can put out all these apps, all these products, but as soon as you break that covenant of trust, it, everything just goes to naught. So, um, you know, this is something that is exercising me very deeply in relation to what we do. Um, so if we do bring it into the you know, service suite, mm. it would absolutely uh, frame up within the highest privacy and security uh, regimes that we have. Um, the EV legislation that went through last year included when the EV tax comes into play, um, a number of exemptions, for example, if you drive on your private land or on a farm or some other things. And at the time I asked um, the Treasurer how that would actually be calculated without using some sort of a device that's yeah. attached and is GPS tracked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is something that is coming in the very near future. Is this something that that your department has been asked to look at already? Uh, I, it's, it hasn't come across my desk. Not mine either. No. But, uh, I'll, but I will make some inquiries about it. 
Okay. And I'll, uh, I'll put that on my to-do list. Thank you. Because um, that, that does concern me greatly, the idea yeah, no, that I, I, I will within a make, few years put that to you. we yeah. could have everybody yeah, being yeah. tracked. Yep. Um, yep. Preferably that should be in government hands. Yeah, uh, yep. I'm with you 100%. So I'll, let me, I'll, I'll put that on my to-do list. Um, the other thing I'll just cover in the time I have left is in relation to this, um, the, the artificial intelligence and the, you know, the application of algorithms and machine learning. Um, I did see your tweet on that as well. Um, you said that you've asked the, um, the uh, Information and Privacy Commission to scan the AI and privacy landscape to see what's currently evolving in best practice. When do you expect that to come back? Oh, well, uh, Ms. Tid is here, so um, I maybe I'll ask her. She's got so much on her plate, so I don't want to. In two days, already. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's I normally right. ask for things yesterday. Let's have it. <laughs> Thank you very much for that important question. Um, we're hoping to have that within weeks to months. At, um, it's something that the Minister has seen as a priority, and there certainly is a lot of attention globally. I would like to um, present it as a an assessment of the rights that we administer in the IPC. So that's my colleague, the Privacy Commissioner, and privacy rights and information access rights. And to look at the gaps in relation to the model that we have operating in New South Wales against best practice. Now, there are many more rights that are impacted by AI, including um, disability, for example. And those would not be within the scope of this high-level presentation that, that we would prepare. Um, certainly, the focus for us would be looking at the um, resources that are highly credible. The UK is doing a lot of work in this area. Um, there's also work on different models in the EU. The states has a different model again. But from an information access perspective, the three core requirements must be notice that AI is being used so that citizens are fully aware of that or any form of machine enhanced decision making. The second would be a general explanation of how it's being used that, that a person could understand and the third would be the right to access the information as to how the model actually works upon request, such as a GIPA request. So I'm firmly back in my domain now. Can I, sorry, just one tiny follow-up on that. I um, appreciate those three um, uh, features you've highlighted. At what point is it taken into account that you have an informed choice. So if, sorry, you've talked about you, you're informed, but if you, for example, you, you have no other choice. So if you want to use the road um, in an electric vehicle and you are obliged as part of that for, for um, tracking to be installed on your phone or to be, you know, to have an app, there's no real choice in that. Mm -hmm. um, at what point does that factor in um, to the, I guess, the policies that we develop around that sort of thing. That, um, that approach is outside of my jurisdiction, but it is a very important one in terms of the risks that might be associated with the technology that's used. Yep. And certainly as a factor, a monopoly provider, an outsourced provider in relation to the type of information that's held, if it's sensitive personal information, my colleague, the Privacy Commissioner, would certainly look at that and rank that in relation to a hierarchy of risks. And then hopefully with in that context, we are able to recommend mitigation strategies to better manage those risks. But, but from an information access perspective, those three absolute fundamentals, two of which in my view um, are already provided for under the GIPA Act, agencies should all be proactively disclosing when they are actually using any form of machine learning because it goes to the issue of how decisions are made mm. by agencies about members of the public. <coughs> Thank you. Just can I ask one final, final? Um, <laughs> sorry, Minister. Um, you know, we saw what a disaster robo-debt was um, and the very real consequences it had for so many people. Um, how widespread is, is the use of machine learning in terms of applications that the New South Wales government uses? I, I think it's still in its nascent phase. Like, I, I don't have a, a suite in terms of, uh, you know, this is how many we've got, but I still think it's just at the beginning, and, and that's why, you know, legislators really need to be aware of this. We just can't bury it and think it's going to go away. It's just going to... 
you know, grow exponentially in the decades ahead. And, and, and imagine when quantum really kicks in. Um, in, in the middle part of this decade and imagine when, you know, biotech really starts getting, you know, a few legs on it. It's, it really, we have to get on top of this now um, because if we don't have these safety rails in place, then it's really going to go to mud very quickly. So, um, yeah, it, it, again, it's, it's probably my number one priority around the trust in the digital space. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've just got a um, follow-up question I was asking before about the Greyhound e-tracking system and the pet register. Um, my understanding is that, that they were actually given funding at around the same time, but that the Greyhound e-tracking system is pretty much at a point of up being up and running, whereas the pet registry is much further behind. I'm just wondering how um, those priorities are decided and where the talent is being pushed towards to actually make one functional and one still you know, a very slow, long run. So uh, I managed to get a, a short update in the break. Mm -hmm. um, so the Greyhound tracking work began when Minister Anderson was in this portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, and there was some departmental budget out of the Better Regulation Division that was set aside to support that function. Now, Minister Anderson and the game, liquor gaming and racing function sits somewhere else, so that part of the budget, I think, went with, with them, and they are finishing that. The My understanding is the regulatory and compliance system that they use for that is quite different from anything we would be using. It, there isn't a plan to integrate it at this stage. It's not on a, uh, it's not on a plan that Minister Anderson's office is aware of. Um, but something, as Minister Dominello, Dominello said, we would take away and have a look at. It would have, at that stage, been looked at in isolation because I think when. We talked last time, Ms Hurst, about the pet registry. We were really only gaining momentum, and I think that was being run by local councils at the time, whereas now we're getting um, yeah, a lot more involved. So um, we'll certainly take it away to have a look at what the opportunities are to integrate, um, but it wouldn't be something I'd be able to provide more detail on today. Thank you. Um, so it was just that even though the funding was provided at the same time, that the pet registry sort of had a delayed start, and then now it's I just got don't a bit of a think kick. they were looked at in the same category. So one got departmental funding because it would have probably been a relatively small amount. Um, the pet registry overall, whole state of New South Wales, yeah. multiple homes, 8 million customers would have been looked at very differently through the digital restart fund lens. Like the Greyhounds, I'll be very upfront about the Greyhounds I always left to you know, Mr Anderson at the time when he was in the cluster, but, but the pet registry is a whole of state and, and that's why I took a particular interest in that because I know I realised that we need to do something. So I, I reached out with uh, local government. So how can we help to accelerate this? Thank you. Uh, but it, yeah. it, it does it does annoy me uh, that that uh, that greyhound thing is not uh, linked. It should be yeah. it should be part of a you know, new regulation. So I'm going to have a look at that. Thank you. I appreciate that. That was going to be my follow-up question. So that's good. I'm glad that you'll look into that. That that does annoy me, but. Uh, yeah. And I'm glad you've given a push to the, the pet registry as well because it's a very, very long time coming. It, it, it's, it's well overdue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask um, about your work um, in regards to um, digital inclusion. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's um, a lot of benefits to streamlining everything and making everything digital, but um, obviously there's a lot of access issues for um, various sections of the community, people without reliable internet, um, elderly people, people with disabilities. Um, I just wanted to know what you're doing to address the issue um, across those digital projects going forward. Yeah, and, and I've got to have a mea culpa on this. I think in, in the first part of my journey as uh, Minister for Digital, uh, I, you know, I was so uh, passionate about driving the digital agenda. I, I did have a blind spot towards inclusion, but I think during the pandemic, my... Uh, you know, watching my mum, uh, who is not a digital native, go through uh, the challenges around COVID, I realised um, there is definitely a segment of our community that are not digitally engaged, and uh, we had to work around that. Now, having said that, um, there are, you know, we can create digital solutions for non-digital people. And what I mean by that is, for example, um, the inclusion card during uh, during COVID. So, you know. Again, using my mum as a representative of a cohort, um, she's not digitally savvy, but we could give her a card with a QR code. So we reversed engineered it. So 
um, you know, the shops could then scan her code rather than her scanning. So we can use digital in a reversed engineered way to help people with inclusion. You can also use digital, for example, and then smart sensors to improve accessibility uh, for people uh, that would normally be, you know, off the grid as it were. Um, but, you know, Mr. Reese and the, and the team, particularly, you know, through the leadership of Ms. Hogan, I know they are very passionate about uh, in making inclusion a critical element of design thinking at the beginning of the phase. Sorry, yeah. I was just going to say specifically as it relates to service, you know, we still have call centres, we still have yeah. all of our service centres, we have, um, and Mr. Reese can talk more to it, but we also have... Um, uh, digital staff, when you arrive, who can help you uh, process your request digitally and they'll show you how, help you get email addresses set up, etc. So uh, when we think about services being no wrong front door, um, whilst of course we will always push digital services for so many reasons, they're often safer or better, um, it is never our intention to exclude customers and certainly in Mr Murphy's remit where he deals with communications, yep. we had learnt a lot of lessons about communications then as well well, um, and not just about digital communications, but how we communicate through leaders in the community, etc. So we've got a lot of lessons learned from the last few years, which we'll apply going forward. But uh, again, my, my problem, and, and it is my failing, is that for the first couple of years in particular, I was just so driven to making sure, why are we doing this paper? Why, you know, let's digitise it. I really didn't think enough or deeply enough about that inclusion piece, but hopefully I've, you know, that I've learnt that lesson and I'm talking more about it now. But it's not to say the agency weren't doing it. Um, they were. Uh, it's just I wasn't communicating it. Thank you. Um, I want to talk to you as well um, about the Drone Biodiversity Hub, um, which was recently announced um, that there is an investment of $2.3 million from the Digital Restart Fund. Um, my understanding is that um, the hub will use drone technology to detect wild species at risk with a focus on koalas. Um, I was wondering if you could advise how that's actually going to work um, in, in a practical sense. Uh, are you across, the, I know the broad, I don't know about the detail of that. Uh, Greg, are you across that? I'm sorry, I am aware that it was funded and it was part of a planning and environment bid to the Digital Restart Fund through the Smart Places um, process, but I'll, I'll come back to you if that's okay with the details of technically how that works. Yeah, the, the technicality I haven't gone into the detail of, but I, I know the project and it's really exciting. Um, again, this is using tech for good um, in relation to a critical area and that's why when I saw it and I remember reaching out to um, Mr. Griffin about it and I love this stuff and this is what we need to do more of, but um, yeah, I, I'm not across the detail of it. But do, you know, get some. do you know if it's going to be deployed for other species or is it just focused on koalas? Uh, I, I, I will take that on notice. Yeah. I, ideally... I imagine it has the capability to do so, but I don't know if it does. It. Yeah, I think that's pretty much a requirement of most of these programs that they trial and make sure that it works with the potential to scale to other, other like species. Like, which other species did you have in mind? Um, perhaps the vulnerable eastern bentwing bat. Well, I'm just... Cause of what I'm <laughs> if you want some very specifics. <laughs> I'm just thinking, again, off the top of my head, if it's a drone, they normally go... Obviously, they get the treetops and yeah. they could probably identify heat, uh, you know, through a koala and a tree type thing. So I imagine if it's that type of technology, maybe getting access to a ground, it might be harder. But, but again, I, I'm just speaking off the top of my head. So I can get some detail. Yeah, thank um, you. And I'm, I'll, that's number five. I'll report that <laughs> to you as well. Thank you. Um, and, and, and Mr. Wells, while you're looking it up, if you wouldn't mind, um, just tr I just got a bit of a question around um, how the project's actually going to work to increase the koala numbers. Um, yeah, like I so said, how will it work in practice? Is it like a thermal camera? Um, and if there's any early results from the project, I don't know how far along we are um, and how it will actually work to overall increase the number of koalas. Yep, sure, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Minister, in late March um, this year, there was a report on the initiatives um, to create safe, reliable, um, connected transport networks um, with a focus on active transport cycleways as a proof of concept. Um, 
I'll just finish this question, but I, I understand it's seeking to capture data on cycleways um, uh, and meaningful insights to ultimately lead to improvements. Um, given we want to obviously encourage more people to cycle um, for environmental reasons, um, how will this initiative actually help that and help people who are choosing to cycle to work, for example, or on weekends? Yeah, I, I'm, are you across that one, Greg? Yeah. It's just, I'm sorry, Ms. Hurst, so there's just so many projects across the Digital Reset Fund, but if I can take that on those and I'll, I'll give you a separate briefing on that as well. Okay, I thank think. you. Back to Labor. <laughs> Minister, if I could just return back to the Digital Restart Fund yep. for a moment. Um, I look on the Digital New South Wales website and my last update is the 15th of August this year and it says under the heading who manages the fund and it says Minister for Customer Service and Digital Government, Minister for Small Business, Minister for Fair Trading, under the Digital Restart Fund Act 2020. What responsibilities in that The title? Minister for Customer Service and Digital Government, Minister for Small Business, Minister for Fair and they've left out the word trading but that's a typo, is responsible for controlling and managing the fund. <laughs> Is that the case? Oh, well, ultimately, yeah, it reports back up to me. Yeah, but there, there, it's not just me running the state. It's, uh, there's great people around this table that have the data the operations. Oh, yeah, but in terms of ministers, is that that statement's correct? Yeah, that's, okay. that's correct. Okay. So, from the digital restart... But I, but I think it's fair to say that the, the father of the DRF is on this table, and that's Greg Wells. He's the... Uh, the well, he's, he's not mentioned it. in the Act because the digital he, he, restart... I want to give him credit for Responsible minister, he get minister for... for customer service and digital government. It ultimately reports to me and I take full responsibility, but I'm just saying, the and it is such an important design architecturally that even West Australia's picked it up and you know, other governments are looking at it. But again, the genius behind the design thinking is Greg Wells. I want well, to give him. I, I, Minister, I'm, I'm, he's, he's not mentioned in the... No, no, I accept the full I Allocation of the Administration of Acts, and that's I what I'm trying to get from you. Please, I accept full share, responsibility. share the love all you wish, Minister. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to work out I if, if I am going through through the digital New South Wales I expect, site, I, I accept and then I go through the Digital Restart Act, which yeah, refers people to that's the me. allocation of the administration that's, of that's that's and and the other than yourself, the other minister's not mentioned. So I'm just trying to clarify. Which other minister's not mentioned? The other minister who, as per your digital New South Wales, um, the Minister for Customer Service and Digital Government, Minister for Small Business and Minister for Fair Trading. That's me. Yep. So I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm to nominalise all of those? I, that's all me. Okay. So... <laughs> I'm a bit lost, Mr. Brown. I apologise. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not being difficult. I'm just trying to understand the question. Well, my, 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 my question is that the um, if I go through the um, allocation of acts, yeah, okay, under the alloc allocation of acts for those respective ministers, okay, there's no mention because you won't always be and haven't always been minister responsible for all of those. Those acts? There's no mention. My, sorry, Mr. Primrose, again, that may be a miscommunication, but uh, my understanding is I was always the sole minister responsible uh, for the administration of the DRF. I, I could be wrong on that, that, but that was my clear no, understanding. No, that's right. I think right. it's just capturing the fact that the, since um, Minister Patinos's departure, Minister Dominello has taken over the whole portfolio and his title has changed to incorporate those other issues, which is why the Act's been updated to reflect his full title, I think. Well, no, it hasn't. That, that, that's my point. Oh, it, does it have Minister for Small Business and Fair Trading in there? No, it has Minister for Customer Service and Digital Government. Ah, OK. Understood. I'm, I'm simply, I'm not being funny about this. No, no there I'm are just three different ministries mentioned, each, and one is your website, and the other one is the um, allocation of the administration of acts, and there are different ministers mentioned. I'm just trying to clarify. The discrepancy. Oh, right. Well, OK. Well, again, my uh, clear understanding is all roads lead to, to me in comes of, when it comes to DRF. Okay. So if there is a discrepancy, we'll fix that. So thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, well, thank you. And I think that's that, that's all I'm seeking. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll, thank you. We'll, we'll fix that up. Thank you for pointing it out. Um, it, 
It's the case that you recently announced that there'd be a $25.3 million cyber security operations centre to safeguard New South Wales police force systems. Is, is that correct? Yeah, the uh, uh, Deputy Premier and myself uh, visited that yesterday. It's in operation. Thank you. Was this part of the 2023, 2022-23 uh, budget process? Uh, I think it was. It came out of DRF. I, I forget which year, but it definitely came out of DRF. Okay. Can I ask maybe if you could ask one of your officers? Yeah, Mr. Wills, are you aware of that? Yeah, I th I'll, I'll come back exactly with the with the amounts and the years on notice if that's okay. But part of this and part of police's uh, maturity in building um, cyber resilience was part of the Digital Restart Fund, definitely. Okay, so it's already in operation, so I imagine it came out of that budget. Okay, can you please also indicate where it appears in the budget papers? Yeah, well, we will have a look at that. I imagine it's probably in police's budget papers under a DRF allocation, yeah. so I'll check it in the break for you. OK, because um, I, I can't find it in the capital infrastructure papers. Um, um, did, was this um, recommended to you um, by your... Oh, right, um, I'm, I'm back back you, sorry. Oh, Mr. Premier, can I just make it clear? I, I, Ms. Hogan correctly pointed out that I'm not the only one that signs off on the DRF. I, you know, I, the I, I am the minister responsible, but um, obviously there's cabinet oversight. There's a cabinet um, infrastructure committee. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that, but I, I mean, just I, want to go back to the. I go back to both the Digital Restart website that no, I you're right. previously yeah. and the... You're right, and, and we'll fix that up. Yeah, but I'm trying to work out who actually has responsibility. Yeah, uh, in terms me. of ministerial responsibility, me, yep. but, uh, but ultimately, you know, all sign-offs have to go through a subcommittee of Cabinet. It's okay. just another oversight mechanism. Okay. Um, OK, well, look, we, we might come back to that when, when we sort out who actually yeah, is the responsible minister. Oh, I'm the responsible minister. OK, so did you recommend this project? Which project? The project that I've just read out, the um, Cyber Security Operations Centre. Oh, that would have came as a recommendation from um, the steering committee uh, through the agency, so they, they all get together and make a, a series of recommendations in relation to DRF, and then it would have been signed off through, um, ultimately, the subcommittee of Cabinet. It would have been, you know, I would have taken that to the subcommittee as a as a responsible minister, and then would have gone to the subcommittee to sign off. Okay, who would actually be then the minister um, who would recommend to that subcommittee that this would be funded? Well, I would take the proposal forward with a series of recommendations on advice from the agency, in collaboration with all the other agencies. Uh, and then, yeah, the subcommittee of cabinet signs off on it. That'd be your recommendation as the yes, response. Yes, I would take. Minister. Well, I would take the submission forward that would uh, incorporate the uh, recommendations of the agencies here. I come back to that because I'm still trying to track down the who actually, yeah, the, the processes by which this right. goes through. Because I'm all I'm doing is reading through your sites and having difficulty understanding who actually, as opposed to the Minister for Fair. Yeah, no, uh, fair enough. Yep, we'll fix um, that up. OK. Um, now, my understanding is that in October 2021, the Auditor General released a special report compliance with the New South Wales cyber security policy and concluded, and I quote, Key elements to strengthen cybersecurity governments, controls and culture are not sufficiently robust and not consistently applied. There's been insufficient progress to improve cybersecurity safeguards across New South Wales agency. And again, in December 2021, there are a number of um, specific um, um, recommendations by the um, Auditor General on the customer service cluster. Um, and I won't read through all of them, but given the types of information that the New South Wales government agencies um, um, produce, you would agree, I presume, that the public wants and needs to know what measures are taken to ensure that information, especially private citizens' information, isn't being... Yes, I agree with that statement, yep. 
So, referring to that document, projects that receive payments from the Digital Restart Fund in financial year 2021, can you say what information is available publicly in budget papers and information provided by the fund? Are you talking about the Auditor General's report and the response there too? Yep. Uh, well, I can say that um, 50, there were 17 recommendations. Uh, 15 have been done. There's uh, two to go. Uh, and I'll, I'll let Mr. Reese speak to it. Um, in terms of the publication. I wonder if I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not. Mr. Primaris is referring to. We were dealing with two audit reports. One was on a cyber incident that occurred with, within Service New South Wales, yep. and there was a uh, likely a separate report that was on the broader effectiveness of cyber New South Wales as a yes, function. Yes, I, I recall them well. Yes. So which which one? Well, I, my. my my original statements referred to um, the specific, then the more general Auditor General's report, um, and and then I quoted from the December 2021 Auditor General's report that specifically you know, recommended in relation to the customer service cluster, and then I read out that that section. So where's all that up to? Oh, that's the cyber report. So the. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Wells can speak more broadly to our general cyber auditing reports from the Auditor General's office. Uh, we've got core programs of work going on both in DCS and across all of government uh, on those to continue to improve our cyber posture. Um, and so Mr. Wells can speak to that and Mr. Reese can speak to where we're at specifically on the cyber uh, incident that occurred within Service New South Wales and the recommendations that were made, which uh, the majority of which have been um, now completed. We could, we could speak to those now or this afternoon, Mr Primrose, whichever well, If I asked, um, for example, if I looked at the capital infrastructure statement for um, a number of, um, um, say, budget years 2021, 21, 22 and 22, 23, and I look for DCJ cyber security program, would I find funds allocated for that? Uh, in terms of where it's located in the budget, that would probably be a question for the, the minister or associated ministers for DCJ. Sometimes um, my experience from last year when, we, when you asked a similar question was that depending on the dollar amount, uh, sometimes it's categorised in an other category as opposed to being specifically called out. So we would have the amounts of money that the, di uh, the digital restart fund has distributed to other clusters as it relates to coming out of our $240 million of cyber funding. Uh, we could tell you what the distribution mechanisms were for that, but in terms of where they've recorded it on their own budget or capital papers, I'd have to take that question on notice. Okay, that, that's fair. I, I think, Minister, you'd agree that having transparency on cyber security capital infrastructure projects being funded by the taxpayer, um, that it would be good for the public to be able to go to a site. Yeah, I agree with that. Just as we need to be able to go to a site and know which ministers are responsible for recommending projects, we also need to know what projects are actually being funded within those particular agencies. I, I agree broadly with, with that statement. Obviously, with cyber, there's information we don't want to make public uh, for obvious reasons, but, um, yeah, the broad allocation... Well, I, I, I appreciate we're not talking Mission Impossible yeah. here, and I understand the reason for cyber security, but, I mean, if, if, there, is a fund, if there are funds allocated... No, I, I agree with that probably. OK. Do you want to go for yours? Yeah. With the projects that are um, allocated out of the, the digital restart fund, um, understand you're the minister, you take it to a, there's a process for you to advance the projects at some point on the recommendations of others. But the acquittal of the funds, does that rely with you as well, minister? So the money's allocated. Um, how do, how, who's monitoring the funds as, they, uh, as they're being expended? Is that the relevant minister? So, for instance, the, the, um, the police... Operation Centre One, that would be the police minister would be responsible? Ultimately, yes, but the, the, you know, there'd be... Uh, we, we have a steering committee that uh, Mr Wells <laughs> chairs, uh, interagency, um, and they would have oversight in relation to that as well. Okay. We and have so a strong assurance program around the Digital yeah. Restart Fund that's coordinated centrally by Mr Wells. As okay, he's the Government Chief Information Digital Officer, so ultimately, yep. as I said, he's the father of uh, the DRS. So if there was an overrun on the expended, which is, you know... I'm certain the Treasurer would want to make sure that we're not 
you know, overrunning too much on our expenses. But um, so, how, how do we, how are we managing, I guess, the funds to make sure there is not an overrun? Or, or a need for supplementation? Yeah, we, uh, in the same way infrastructure, New South Wales do it with physical infrastructure, we do the same with digital. So uh, as well as bringing all of the project pipeline through the various cabinet um, meetings for approval, uh, ultimately the act of which Minister owns and I recommend, um, Mr Wells's team then, once those projects are passed, run a full assurance pro uh, process. And there's specific milestones uh, where we check in on how the program's going. Is it meeting its budget? Is it meeting its deliverables, uh, you may on occasion, um, using that process, uh, decide that something can be accelerated or something needs to be stopped, etc. Uh, but it's the full process uh, and it's fully incorporated into the program of work run by Mr Wells and his team. Okay, thanks. And when, we, when this was all designed, we, we, we took a lot of um, instruction from the uh, that infrastructure uh, committee. Yeah, yeah. committee. Okay. Um, yeah, I, mean, so I just want to go on to, uh, I think, following on Basically, again. this is digital infrastructure, which in my view is just as, if not more important than digital age. It, it, it may well, as time goes by, prove to be the case. Yep. Yeah. Um, just following on some questions from Mr Van Asiak earlier in the morning um, around um, when Service New South Wales rolls out programs, um, particularly in the disaster, the flooding uh, yeah, yeah. inquiry, yep. the Rural Assistance Authority, which reports to the Minister for Agriculture also has uh, obligations. What work is being done with the RAA to facilitate, because um, I can tell you as a shadow for agriculture, a lot of people ring me and say, I just did, I, I self-assessed, I looked at the, um, the, uh, the grant program and thought, I don't have time to fill this all in and I've already, already have a previous loan with the RAA and I've got to go through this all again. The streamlining, are you doing any work at all, Minister? With I'll, I'll let Mr. Reese answer that, but let me let me agree with you, and and that's the, that's one of the big problems with governments all around. It's not just us uh, that people, if they find the process too difficult, they just abandon them, and I don't blame them, and that's why we have to have that one-stop shop for grants, um, and which hopefully will be available very very soon, which will be a a big movement forward for those in, that are in desperate need of relief, but. Mr. Reese, can you explain the relationship with us and then? Yeah, absolutely. So, so each grant program government mobilises, there's a different part of government allocated ownership for that. Uh, we work closely with that, um, that owning agency, so uh, sometimes that will be the Rural Assistance Authority, sometimes it will be Resilience New South Wales. In COVID times, sometimes that was Treasury. Um, the majority of uh, you know, flood response and support has been delivered through Service New South Wales with Resilience New South Wales as the partner agency there. Um, it's typically the primary producer style support that um, uh, the, the Rural Assistance Authority are allocated to deliver. I think the, you know, the thinking there is that there's a long established relationship and history between that agency uh, and many of the customers that, uh, that need support in, that, uh, in those cases. Uh, we work closely together. There have been examples where a, you know, a grant will start in one part of government and you know, due to one reason or the other, the responsibility yep. may shift over time. Okay. Look, and I'll probably explain. Uh, can, can I say, I'm special. I, I think, you know, I know every agency thinks they're very special, but ultimately there should be one place. I, I, I really believe that. Uh, but, you know, that's part of the, the journey I guess we're on. Okay, and I think I'll explore this a bit more this afternoon yeah. with the public servants. Minister, so when, when Service New South Wales, um, I guess, uh, operates these programs or manages these programs on behalf of an agency, um, uh, there's a, a fee that is paid from. So I'm looking at the the mice, yeah. the plague of how is it? The plague of mice or the mouse plague? plague. Or the mouse plague. plague. Anyway, um, on certain hands, I look at the grammatical side of that right for me. Um, but so you ran some of those programs, and there was a, a fee that is levied um, against that to, I guess, uh, support the operation of Service New South Wales. Is that correct? Yes, there's a range of different funding models in, in place and, and it's really designed case by case um, under the guidance of Treasury. So sometimes the funds are fully provided either to Service New South Wales or the Department yep. of Customer Service to administer. Uh, sometimes Treasury will hold those funds and uh, pass, you know, pass blocks of funding across to us you know, in line with uh, customers drawing down on that need. T typically there's two types of cost we incur when we're delivering a program. There's, there's an initial cost cost to 
you know, to, to implement, design and implement that program. Uh, and then depending on the nature of it, there may be an ongoing support cost either for the customer servicing that sits around that or the, um, you know, or the assessment of grants, for example. Uh, we, we tend to try and avoid sort of uh, very granular fee-for-service type arrangements. They just don't reflect the nature and the elasticity of the cost that is associated with delivery of those programs. Uh, and typically when these programs are mobilised, there'll be work up front to say, right, of the overall envelope of funding, how much do we think is required for the implementation and management? Uh, and how much do we think is required for uh, payment out to the affected parties? Yep. OK. I'm going to explore that a bit more this afternoon as well, if I can. Uh, Minister, um, my last round of questions relate to the the, um, <clears throat> the unexpended dine and discover vouchers. Regional New South Wales was a very large component of the um, unused or non-used vouchers. So, sorry, what was the last bit? Regional New South Wales was a large, like if you look at the LGAs, they were a very large component. Um, have we looked at why that was the case? I actually, I actually posted about that uh, and I accepted that up front, saying that you know, there were you know, there were gaps, and I've asked sort of to have a look at that. But I, I imagine anecdotally that, for example, in relation to um, you know discover options in regions, they just wouldn't have as many options as you'd have in you know in the metropolitan area. So. But I've, I've asked us to have a look at that because overwhelmingly it was a very successful rollout. Um, but it, it, nothing's ever perfect in, in government. But you know, I think we got to about close to 75 per cent of the funds being used, which is just extraordinary. But um, maybe, Mr. Reese, if you want, if you want any other insights over it. Yeah, look, I mean, to total economic stimulus from that program oh, was just a shade yeah, under a billion dollars. Um, and we had, you know, 23.65 million vouchers redeemed. Uh, but certainly there's analysis to be done, I think, to find yeah. where there's variations in adoption. Um, that variation is not just in regional areas. We've seen yeah. some metropolitan areas as well, which we think are, you know, where, where redemption was proportionately lower. Uh, and there's a range of different insights there. Anecdotally, certainly the point that the Minister flagged around the accessibility of discovery options in regional New South Wales was uh, is certainly one issue that we're aware of, okay. uh, one constraint we're aware of, but we're going to look at that more broadly. But, but having said that, like in some areas like Blacktown, I know because the figures are super high, you know, massive adoption there. Um, but, yeah, as Mr. Reese said, it, it, it's like a patchwork quilt. There's different areas, but we need to understand that. Yeah, is it an inclusion piece that we're missing? Uh, we need to understand what the lessons of all this are. Okay. Because it's the first time anything like this has been rolled out, to my knowledge, around the world in terms of using a digital platform essentially for digital stimulus like this. Yeah. Um, well, the bell's rung, Minister, so my time's up. Sorry. Um, yep. but, but I'm not going to spend a bit of time this afternoon with, yep. uh, with your crew to work through some of that. Thank you. Um, Ms Hayden, you were indicating that you might have some updates for yeah, us. Yeah, so um, uh, I've got two and Mr Dent has one. So just on the firearms registry, it's not on the digital app roadmap at this stage. Um, and Mr Primrose, um, for you, uh, I'm informed that um, the request you had earlier about the uh, cyber security um, centre that was launched yesterday. It's in the police paper in infrastructure for 8.6 million in 21-22 with just over a million in 22-23. Um, DRF approved 23.5 million in intake three with a split of approximately 8.6 million in capital infrastructure with the remainder as OPEX for the police. And in relation to safe uh, beaches or beach watch, that, that is a federal government initiative, but I know there has been involvement through the Data and League Centre. So, uh, again, I'll come back to you on that. And Mr Primrose, Mr Dent had a clarification yeah, for My you apologies. Well. I answered, uh, started answering with such alacrity that I um, merged two answers for you. So I just wanted to elaborate on the issue around deemed diseases. There are two distinct uh, issues, both of which Professor Driscoll provided reports on, which is why I may have um, taken the wrong path. The first is related to dust-related diseases, and the second was around um, other diseases and illnesses. So in terms of the dust diseases, uh, the reason it was top of mind um, is that was updated by regulation on the 12th of August to include uh, five new um, diseases that were listed by Professor Driscoll. The more complex one is the significantly expanded list of deemed work-related diseases and illnesses that Safe Work Australia endorsed. That included COVID-19, PTSDs, various cancers and skin issues. So we now have that updated list and we've started work on understanding the costings and the other impacts of that um, and we'll be providing advice to government shortly. One of the challenges is uh, perhaps by accident the 2012 
health changes mean that those that updated list would only apply to exempt workers and some legislative change would be required to make that available to general workers as well. So there's a slightly more complicated piece of work that has to happen there. And a large proportion of those costs are likely to be borne by Treasury uh, through the Treasury Managed Fund. So we'll be working with Treasury in the next little while to clarify that. So the work's commenced on that around the costings for the general deemed diseases piece. But I did, I think, start answering in relation to the dust diseases because Professor Driscoll's work um, most recently ended up in regulation on the 12th. Thank you. Um, just quickly, Minister, looking at your ministerial diary on the 29th of March, you met with uh, <laughs> you met with Uber to discuss the government's digital and technology policy priorities. Um, was that a meeting that you initiated or that Uber initiated, from memory? Oh, okay. Um, Noting from your diaries, you haven't since then met with the other arm of point to point, which is the taxi industry. Um, is it safe to assume that you don't seem them as, Im as important in, in this digital policy, the government's digital policy priorities? I, I've got a very strong working relationship with the Taxi Council. You can ask them. Oh, I'm, a, I'm a strong advocate for a lot of reforms that we push together. Do you plan to meet with them to discuss your digital policy priorities and how they would work with within them? Oh, more, more than happy to. Again, like we get people asking to meet us all the time, but um, yeah, I, I've got a very strong, healthy relationship with the Taxi Council. That's that's good to hear. Um, just trying to wrap up the conveyancing thing. So. The enforcement bill is, you, you see it as important, it's crucial, but you can't tell us whether it uh, will align with the National Code, because you can't recall whether you've seen the National Code. Um, you can't tell us what the uh, safeguards will be outside of the enforcement regime, because you haven't seen a draft yet. When do you plan to bring this well, bill? When do you plan to bring this bill up? Yeah, well, given that we're running out of sitting weeks, uh, quite quickly. Yeah, my understanding is uh, we're bringing it uh, soonish. That's not. A, that's not. That's a ballpark. But uh, uh, what I did commit to to you um, is because we weren't prepared for that today. Because it, uh, the office, the, um, the registrar general, I'll commit to. If you want, uh, chair, I'll bring her to the next week's estimates. Uh, and that way we can have a thorough discussion around all these uh, questions that you've raised. Yeah, look, that, that, would, be, that would be fantastic. Um, I might pass to Ms Hurst for the remainder. Thank you. Um, I've only got a couple of questions left. Um, can I just clarify, Minister, did you say that the Smart Beaches project was federal? It's, I just had a quick look on the, uh, on, the, on the net, and that's what it appears to be. When I look at Smart Beaches, it's got here... Smart Beaches Project, and it's, uh, it's got here its um, Australian Government website. Uh, okay, on the, on the New South Wales Government website, it says Smart Beaches provides an opportunity to make New South Wales the leader in beach safety management. Uh, yeah, I'm just, going it might through, be. I'm just going through the <coughs> website, uh, which is um, yeah. AGS. I'm just looking at the Digital Restart Fund. Yeah, so we're, we're no doubt plugged into it. Yeah, um, but, Greg's but it's come coming so down we'll come from back. there. Yeah, okay. It's uh, it's infrastructure.gov.au. Okay. So if you want to look it through there. Thank you. Um, one of the recommendations from the recent flood inquiry, um, which relates to your portfolio, was that, that Service New South Wales established teams of assessors that can be on the ground to assess and approve grant applications. Um, I was wondering if you'd had a chance to review that inquiry report um, and if that's something that you're looking to implement um, for future disaster situations. Yeah, that, that's around the blitz that we conducted. Yeah, that, that's been unbelievably successful from what I hear. But, you know, Mr. Reese, if you want to expand further on that. It's been invaluable. So we, we, we still have 257 assessors working across a range of these programs between Service New South Wales and Revenue New South Wales. Uh, the, the, the grant splits that the Minister mentioned um, took a whole range of skills and people and put them under one roof in location for customers. Uh, that wasn't only assessment, but the assessors were on the ground and we found that it... Uh, it made a great difference, and, and you know, particularly for those individuals with quite complex, you know, circumstances or cases that were that were struggling to work through the process, we've been able to um, thankfully resolve, you know, many of those for our customers quickly. 
And that goes to your inclusion point. Like, there, there are a lot of individuals that are, you know, and I think Mr. Veach or Mr. Primrose raised the issue before, if, it's, if the process is too complicated, they're just gonna turn off. And, and, that's, and they're therefore excluded, and that's why we can have the greatest digital platform in, man, in humankind, but the, the truth is we need to have those direct human-to-human -human channels. Yep. And those blitzes have proved really successful. Thank you. Well, I'll just I'll pass back to uh, the opposition for the last 15 minutes, if they want. Yep, thank you very much. Um, Minister, I believe IPART's undertaking a review of the pricing framework for reconveyancing. Yep. Um, I was wondering if we could maybe get uh, Ms Livingston to provide a, an update on that for us. Thank you. Yeah, our review is about the costs that uh, what are called ELNOs or electronic lodgement network operators might uh, need to pay each other depending on who plays what role in a transaction. Uh, so once you introduce competition, it's quite possible that more than one ELNO will be involved in a transaction and we're just trying to work out um, the, the appropriate charges between the two ELNOs. And, and what's the time frame for that work, Ms Livingston? Uh, it's well underway. We've had uh, consultation with um, industry, with other regulators around Australia. Um, I think our draft report is due out later this month, but I can check that and, and get the details back to you this afternoon. Uh, that, that, would, that would be really good, thanks. Um, and uh, I guess there's a bit of consultation in the development of that work. Mm. Um, um, can you just, maybe when you come back this afternoon, just let us know about the scope of that and how you actually engaged, not who you engaged with, but how you went about engaging with the... Yeah, certainly. The and it's all on our website. You can see videos of some of the public hearings we've had and so forth. So I'm um, happy to provide that yeah. detail. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Minister, can I just want to go back to the Dine and Discover vouchers? Um, now, the, the crossbench have gratefully handed over some time for me to explore this. Um, look, um, I, I think regional, regional New South Wales... Uh, the money was actually meant to be stimulating economies. Yep. Um, that's pretty much the fundamental upon which this, this yep. occurred. Yep. Um, some of those uh, communities, um, I think, have missed out because they just didn't have the opportunity to to, to spend the funds, as you've alluded to yep. previously. Yep. Um, so as a part of the, the, I guess, the work that's got to be done now about lessons to be learnt, we should always do that. Yeah, definitely. Um, some of those regional councils, I think, would be pretty keen to be involved in that in that process. Um, I'm not sure whether, so my question to you is really, uh, as a part of that, um, I guess, review, are you engaging with the regional councils, particularly those LGAs? Um, I think in answer to one of my questions uh, on notice, there's a, a large number of LGAs tending to get further west you go, tends to be a, a um, less use. Are we looking at engaging with those LGAs? Uh, I'll, I'll ask Mr. Reese, but it, it makes, yeah, I, I've already announced, um, you know, at, at the time that the uh, the program finished that we w would undertake a review because it was uh, not consistent across the board. I accept that. Uh, and these are the learnings that we need to have. Um, but it makes sense that we would then, you know, drill down in relation to the council areas that uh, did not have as as significant as uptake as, say, other areas and work out why, but, you know, Mr. Reese could probably go through in terms of how we'll, we'll do that review. Yeah, we, we will serve, particularly Service New South Wales for Business has well-established relationships with the vast majority of uh, councils um, in New South Wales. Yes. Uh, also really important that we engage with uh, local customers as part of that review as well. Um, we find very, very powerful perspective coming through there. Uh, but that, that's something that we'll undertake um, in due course to make sure that we capture the learnings and feed them into any programs of this nature. And again, Mr Beach, so you, to your question, like, you know, it could be around, you know, the, pol you know, the policy itself may be okay, but, but, you know, how do we, for example, uh, that was targeted in relation to, you know, dining and, uh, you know, tourist or quasi-tourist type activities. Did we need to expand the reach uh, for regional areas? Um, that did not have as many options, but you know there were other parts of their economy that required stimulation. Yeah, so, you know, you raise really good questions that we need to drill down into. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm keen at the time frame for that work. Again, like I'm pretty keen uh, to find out what we can do better. Yeah. We'll come back on that. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
And was the uh, was the department monitoring uh, throughout the rollout of the Dyna Discover um, to see where the expenditures were taking place? So we maybe, I guess what I'm saying again here is, did we know early that some of these issues were occurring in regional New South Wales around a low take up? Yes, yeah, so, so for us, the, the goal is um, is adoption and redemption of those vouchers to drive the, the benefits that the program was designed to achieve. Uh, we do have um, you know, good analytics that shows us how that adoption and redemption was tracking over the state. Uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr Murphy, uh, is responsible for the communications um, uh, role within the department, and we've worked very closely to drive targeted interventions in areas where we thought that uh, there was an opportunity for greater uh, greater uptake of the scheme. Um, and as, as a part of this, um, Minister, with a low take-up in regional New South Wales, did any consideration, was there any consideration given to maybe extending the expiry date for the, those regional LGAs, um, just to allow them to have an opportunity to use the vouchers that others had the opportunity to do? To do? Well, again, I, I don't accept that there was a low take-up. There was lower take-up in, in some of the areas. But across the board, as we've got about 75%, which is just, again, unheard of in, in terms of the scheme of this magnitude. So there would have been um, some areas that were lower uh, than the peaks. Um, yeah, we, we came to a... I think we extended it twice, Mr Beach. And, yeah... <laughs> As demonstrated at the end, when we said, no, no, we're going to put a guillotine on this for the last day, then there was this extraordinary take-up. Now, I, I think there was like a, what was it, like a 40-fold increased take-up in the last three days. It was just crazy. Uh, you know, and, and to the point where, you know, w it, it went way beyond our expectations of take-up. But if we didn't put that final date and you know, line in the sand, as it were, then we were always going to come across the, uh, the, the the problem that people say, oh, yeah, they'll, they'll extend it again, they'll extend it again, they'll extend it again. So we had to draw a line in the sand. Yeah. Minister, just I, I accept in some places really high use, but Central Darling had a 72% underspend. Like, but was that in relation to both components or one component? Oh, I'm not, again, I'm, I think that's for both, but... But, but, that, but that's the stuff that we need to, yes. to go through. Yeah, so there are some parts... You've got to accept there were some parts of the state for whatever reason which we need to find out. But yeah, and I yeah. accept that. And, and that means those those economies in Menindee, Wilcannia, whatever, didn't get the chance to have that investment, that stimulus well, well, story well, that we, to, that we to wanted. Your, to your point, uh, whether they had the chance, whether it was a lack of communication, oh. we don't know. Uh, so that's one of the things that the, our learnings that we needed to find out. Uh, was a lack of um, access, uh, was a lack of um, the venues available for them to spend. You know, there's a range of things that we need to... And if it is lack of venues, then that goes back to the primary policy settings at the top of saying, well, you know, should it have extended beyond just those two? But, but again, Mr. Leach, you know, th this was... Th this policy was done in the middle of the, the teeth of the pandemic, and it was never done before. Um, but... I've got no doubt there's lots of lessons to be learned. I, I, think, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, Minister, I just want to go back to the, um, the fee that um, Service New South Wales um, levies or strikes or whatever, but um, I think Mr Reese was talking a bit earlier about there's a, a couple of different ways. But who actually determines what that is? Is, is it a, like a percentage of the total package, of the total program? So, the, you know, the mice plague... The plague of mice uh, funding was, um, I think, was fifty million dollars, and originally budgeted five million dollars to go to Service New South Wales for rolling out that program. I, I don't think the full five million dollars, by the way, was in the end uh, paid, but that was the budget amount. So, how do we come up with that percentage? Is there does Treasury say this is the percentage, or does within the, the systems within your department, Minister, determine what that percentage is? Like, I'm just trying to get them how that works. So, so it is, you know, it is largely case by case, but in general, our um, our preferred way of doing it, that is to base it on actuals. Uh, so where there's sufficient um, lead time for a program, you know, we're able to estimate the cost to deliver and operate that program, and you know, we'll base the uh, the funding to service New South Wales on those predicted actu actuals. 
um, I believe that Treasury sort of have some, you know, rule of thumb guidelines, which is they don't want administration costs to exceed X percent for a program. Um, but uh, but wherever possible, we'll, we'll base our um, our funding requirements on the actual costs that we'll incur to deliver yep. the uh, the programs. Um, and and so, Minister, was there some sort of administration fee or this levy or whatever it is? But, but uh, for the Dine and Discover vouchers for the department? Did you get, receive any funds from Treasury or did you...? So, yes, yeah, so we were funded for um, the delivery and the operation of that program. Um, there was two, two components to that. There's an initial funding to build the digital assets and the capabilities to deliver the voucher. Um, the Dine and Discover program was the first of quite a number of vouchers that have now been developed, uh, delivered by New South Wales Government. And so it was used to build a lot of the underlying assets that could be used for those subsequent programs. As a result, we've seen the cost to deliver subsequent programs, uh, you know, come in dramatically lower than the first program. Um, operating that program as well um, uh, required many customers to uh, prove, you know, prove who they were in order to get these funds. Uh, that actually unearthed uh, some legacy data quality issues in government and some differences between state and Commonwealth um, data quality, particularly impacted people where there'd been a, an address change. So if someone had got married, for example, in New South Wales, and the way that that was recorded at the time, and a lot of this dated back decades, meant that there was some friction between state and Commonwealth systems. So the cost to administer the Dine and Discover program uh, also um, involved helping many, many customers through that data quality clean-up exercise that ensured that subsequent programs for them were a much more seamless experience. Thanks. Before I hand over to my colleague to wrap this all up, uh, Mr. Reese, you might want to take this on notice. But so, uh, as at today's date, then what what is the amount that's been um, paid to Service New South Wales mm -hmm. for the operation of the um, Dine and Discover vouchers? You be able to yes, I think I think we've previously yeah. provided a breakdown of all programs on notice, but we'll give you an updated figure for that. Yeah, updated figures would be good. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hand over to Mr. Primrose to wrap this all up. No, I'd, I'd like to be able to wrap everything up, Minister, but that, at the moment, my, my simple question is: we this morning in relation to park and pay, um, there was a bit of discussion in relation to the various probity reports. Can I ask if they will be made available to this committee and tabled this yeah, afternoon? I'm happy, I, as I said to um, Mr Graham, um, I'm happy to do it subject to advice. Like, you know, okay. I, I need to get advice from the agency. But it would be valuable for us, Minister, obviously, and I appreciate that um, um, in terms of asking questions of your officers, if we could actually see that. Yeah, I'm happy to do it subject to advice, yep. Okay. So can, can I ask through you to the Secretary, is that... Will we see them this afternoon? Uh, I'll get some advice at lunchtime and come back to you. So uh, that'll be, you'd be aware what our first question may be. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, how long do we have? Uh, Two minutes. Oh, I can Two be minutes. Really, How long? Sorry. Two. Two minutes. Oh, okay. Um, oh well, I, I I might be kind and wave but leave it till this afternoon because the questions I have are again, are uh, quite complex and it'll take me more than two minutes to explain. Well, no, that, gives, uh, Mr. that gives Mr. Paul 17 minutes to interrogate the minister. In his Go case. for it. Thank, thank, last estimate, you thank you, Chair. Uh, Got one good, af week. good afternoon, oh, Minister. Good afternoon, Mr. Paul. Uh, thank you for your attendance. Um, on today's performance dashboard, I'd rate your contribution as first class oh, thank impeccable you. <laughs> you may be a bit biased but thank that's you that's not a question not at all no. that's uh, not just, a question. Uh, just, uh, just wondering before we wrap up the lunch minister was there anything else you wish to share with the committee and enlighten us as always oh, I, just um, just really focusing on what uh, this boy uh, pointed out that uh, you know we're, we're on this huge journey of digital um, transformation here in New South Wales but we are definitely leading the country. But the most important thing around that is building trust. We don't get everything right, I accept that. Um, but we're constantly uh, trying to learn where we get things wrong. Um, and you know, I, I'd like to think that New South Wales is in a, is in a really strong position in terms of the pipeline of digital products uh, that we've delivered because it's, it's building on that assurance framework. So you know, the, the average person in the street Sure, they like the, the product. Sure, it's you know it's easy to use, but they will not adopt it on mass like they've done if they don't trust the system. So you know we we need all of us need to continually focus on that. 
you know, and, you know, whether it's the opposition, crossbench, whatever, we all need to hold each other to account to make sure that, you know, in the years moving forward, we have that trust in place. Odin, were you going to add? I, I wasn't going to add to that, but I was going to just oh, ask yeah, um, the committee, uh, Danusha Cameron, who's the Office of the Registrar General, yes. well, she is the Registrar General, is happy to be sworn in this afternoon if you have questions for her rather than next week. I think that would suit her better. So if you're comfortable, I, she can be here this afternoon to answer your questions on conveyancing. And, um, that, would, that, would, that would be good if she, if she just appears via a WebEx or? Uh, no, I think she can come in. Okay. Oh, um, Excellent. Uh, but I think she would prefer today rather than next week, if that's OK. Yeah, yeah, look, Great. But yeah that's fine. As long as the minister's comfortable. If, uh, hey, you're, you're the chair. No, as long as you're comfortable with her appearing without, well, without you. I can agree on. Yeah, oh, OK. That's fine by no, me. Thank you for that. Oh, well, that concludes uh, this morning's session with the minister. And we'll return at 2 o'clock with yeah. uh, the remainder of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.
That's the broader bucket. Yep. Okay, lights are on, that means we're on. <laughs> Welcome back to this afternoon's uh, session. Um, before we go to um, opposition questions, we just need to swear in uh, Miss Cameron, uh, and we thank you for making a, a, la a late minute appearance um, and obliging us. Um, so, Miss Cameron, if you could uh, state your name, position, title, and swear either an oath or affirmation. Uh, thank you, Chair. My name is um, Danusha Cameron. I'm the Registrar General for New South Wales, uh, and I'll give the oath. Uh, so I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Um, so I'll throw straight to Mr Moody. Thank you, Chair. And greetings to you, Secretary. It's a pleasure to see you, and thank you to your officials as well. It's a pleasure to see them. Um, Secretary, through you, is it possible that I could ask some questions directly to Sarah? Please do. Thank you. Greetings to you, Mr. Dent. Um, Greetings, Mr. Mookie. Can I um, just ask you first to provide us with an update as to how your supervision is going of the nominal insurer? Uh, it's a very broad question. Is there a specific issue? Um, just in general, any, any relevant regulatory activities you think we should be apprised of? Uh, <laughs> most recently, um, I've written to iCare off the back of their filing uh, in relation to my ongoing concerns about the performance of the nominal insurer, both in terms of its return to work statistics and... Mr Dent, do you mind moving this microphone forward? <coughs> is that better? It is, yeah. Excellent. Uh, so I've written to them in relation to both my ongoing concerns about return to work uh, and my ongoing concerns about the financial situation with the nominal insurer. Um, the response was, as you might expect, that it is a long-term process to resolve those issues. Uh, we've also been dealing with iCare in relation to the privacy breach, which of course we've been mostly managing through um, working with the Information and Privacy Commission, but that has been one of the more recent, um, more recent significant matters. Okay, um, so let's just unpack the two of those particular matters. Um, let's talk through, when did you write to iCare to express your concerns? Uh, on this to work most rates? recent occasion, um, I have the dates here, just give me one moment. Um, I wrote to Mr Harding on the 12th of August. What did you say? Uh, I pointed out to Mr Harding that um, I continue to maintain, notwithstanding the fact he had kindly provided me a copy of their statement of business intent, which we'd asked for, um, I pointed out that while I acknowledge that the uh, work around the nominal insurer improvement plan will take some time to complete, I was still concerned about the prolonged period during which injured workers will continue to face inconsistent services while that work is underway. Um, I pointed out that we have over numerous um, periods of time discussed the fact that we have available to us a recommendation from the McDonald's that we carry out another audit of the nominal insurer. I had, I think, quite reasonably delayed that for some time on the basis that we would not have found anything substantially different than, than prior, and I think I've perhaps even mentioned that to you before. Um, I'm of the view now that we need to start a rolling series of small audits just to try and assess whether there has been, in fact, any improvement based on the work that's underway, acknowledging that significant improvements will require the change of their claims management model. So commencing in October, I've advised Mr Harding that we'll be doing small file reviews on a quarterly basis and reporting on our findings at the end of each quarter. And they'll be focused on, in particular, um, three of our um, standards of practice, injury management, managing psychological injury claims and return to work early intervention, so that hopefully uh, we can start seeing some improvement on that front. And have you made that decision because you're yet to see any evidence that the uh, eye care is turning around its performance of its responsibilities in the nominal insurer? Uh, broadly speaking, yes. However, the more recent uh, return to work rates have stabilised somewhat and there's been a minor improvement, which I think, to be fair, is... Um, at least mildly hopeful, but um, to this end, at, up to this point... But you maintain I, you've got concerns about the return to work rates? Yes, they're still, uh, they're still considerably lower than where I would ideally we'd like to see them. to the extent to which they are stabilising, they are stabilising at a historically low level, is that That's fair? That's correct. I agree, absolutely. And <coughs> do you have your... I had it for Friday, but I seem to have lost it, but do you happen to have the return to work rates with you now? It's almost like I knew you'd ask. Um, so at the moment... The, the four the years of questioning on this issue has given you a, 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 a <laughs> well, trial I, to follow, Mr. Mr. Dent. Okay, I, I'm, I'm afraid I can't say I've had four years of the benefit of that questioning, but certainly um, it's not a surprise. So the current return to work rates as at April 2022 at the four-week rate for the scheme uh, is 65% and 78% at the 13-week rate. Uh, for the nominal insurer, it's 64 and 78 respectively and TMF 65 and 77. So as, as is always the case, the nominal insurer and TMF 
effectively represent most it's of the It's disastrously state. low, isn't it, Mr Depp? Uh, I wouldn't use the word disastrously relative to what is going on nationally. I think there's declines all over the country, which is well known, but every single well, one of those percentages that it isn't there is a work and not back at but work. But the nominal so insurer yes. is underperforming um, compared to what it was 12 months ago, correct? Uh, compared to 12 months ago, uh, there is actually some minor improvements, particularly at the four-week rate. So in May 2021... I was looking at the 13-week rate, and to be fair, just so it's equal, uh, the, the scenario that I was putting to Mr Harding on Friday was February 21 to now. So I don't have February number in, in front of me right now, but at May 2021, the 13-week return to work rate was 80. Mm -hmm. uh, 20, no, 21, it was 80. And at May 2022, it's at 82%. At the four week or 13? 13. 13. Well, I'm fairly positive you'll find that if you go back in time, it was around 85. Around that. Oh, absolutely. There is no question that this current performance is below its well, historic performance. It's underperforming like every it's other return. insurer in the system, is it not? Uh, the nominal insurer? or the TMF, uh, it depends on the which rate you're looking at, but they underperform specialised insurers. And they underperform many of the self-insurers as well, correct? Indeed. And the lag, the distance between their underperformance doesn't seem to be getting any closer. It's not like they're narrowing or getting closer. It's, it's at best, you could say, they're maintaining their consistent rate of underperformance. I would take your word on that without having the numbers in front of me, but that wouldn't Your be data. unreasonable. Um, yes, I don't, ha I don't have the numbers in front of me. Yeah, you fair. do, Mr. Walkie. <laughs> That's fair. Um, but, Mr. Dent, um, is it not the case that we assume that for the purposes of premiums that their 13-week rate or they should be close to 88 um, I think it's slightly more complex than that. I mean, obviously, that would be ideal. I think the change in claims mix is really important, and the sure. increase in the number of psychological claims does start to skew the overall rates because a psychological claim will generally last longer. How much are they as a percentage of the claim book? They're about eight percent still. Uh, in the, it's about eight percent overall. The t the TMF, it's about thirteen, I think, as at April twenty. Well, you can take out the psychological claims. And you can if, you were that if you were simply looking at physical injury claims, then you would expect to see a much higher return to work. Indeed. And so uh, psychological claims present complexities for all insurers, of course. Absolutely. But they're 8% of the claim. Granted, they're more of the cost. <coughs> That's clear. That's correct. But in respect to the other 92% of the portfolio, we are not getting the improvement that we need. That's fair, Mr. Dent, isn't it? Correct. And as a result of that, the scheme is under... Uh, more financial pressure than it was 12 months ago? I think that's correct. Um, what was your reaction to the news that the scheme lost, um, the nominal insurer suffered a $900 million loss last year? Uh, the reaction you'd expect. It's obviously not good news at all, and which is why I continue to share my concerns with, with iCare, and I continue at this point in time not to have yet seen any significant improvement. The work that there is considerable work being undertaken to improve, but the fact remains that a $900 million loss is, is not good news. The insurance ratio, which is itself a much disputed method of measurement, but it seems that we should measure using the insurance ratio, it's gone from 122% to 102. That's correct. That's disastrous, isn't it? <laughs> Again, I wouldn't How do you necessarily justify a 20% reversal I, I, drop. Is it, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Of course it's a bad thing. However, um, with, with respect, it, that's a matter for Mr Harding and the eye care board, and he assures me that as a long tail scheme, it still has a capacity to meet its liabilities. Well, that's because not everyone is claiming all their... It's not under insolvency risk, but it is the case that even on an accounting basis, its liabilities exceed its assets by that's now correct. a factor of close to a billion? That's correct. And uh, really, the only reason why it hasn't topped over is because not all of the people who could make a claim are making a claim uh, right now. They're basically relying on the fact that not all the dues, all the claims are coming due right now. That's fair. Well, and because the benefits are sp spent over a period of time. Indeed. Um, but we were told that this was meant to be turned itself around. Almost two years ago, we were promised a plan. It's been two years since a lot of these issues first came to public attention. Can you point to me to one factor that should give us any encouragement that the NIS, that the nominal insurer is improving? I couldn't point to a specific factor right now. Uh, the perhaps hopeful thing is there is actually a plan, and two years ago the nominal insurer improvement plan did not exist in the form it does today. Two years ago they were in denial, and that wasn't your fault, Mr Dent. So, um, but that's progress, and that there's at least an acceptance that there needs to be an improvement. I think you'll find we are more aligned on this than um, 
than I, I can possibly express. So there is a nominal insurer Feel free to try, Mr. <laughs> Dan. No, don't hold back. Um. Uh, there is a nominal insurer improvement plan. The assurance process around that um, is being run, as we mentioned before, by Promontory, which gives us at least some insight that it's not just iCare's view that we're being, we're being provided, uh, that that plan has any prospect of success. Uh, Promontory have raised a number of um, ongoing concerns, and they're, they're concerns that are not unique to iCare, and particularly around resourcing uh, that is a problem for the Insurer, nominal insurer improvement plan at the moment. However, there is a program of work. We're pressure testing some elements of it. My concern is there are uh, targets that I don't yet think, yet think um, are necessarily anywhere near aspirational enough. What's realistic, I think, is probably another, another matter. So we are looking at whether we think those targets are going to be reasonable, but more important than the target, whether the activities we think actually match the evidence and we'll likely see any turnaround. Indeed. Now, in terms of the finances of all this, ultimately someone has to pay for this, and that means that that will be uh, through premiums, premiums, correct? Correct. Now, I care. Um, when did they submit to you their filing for the coming financial year? Uh, the filing, the recent we had, yeah, the most recently approved filing was for this financial year. Yeah, as when was that to submitted coming. to you? That would have been submitted to us in March. And was that after the minister had issued a direction for them not to increase their premiums for more than 2.9%? That's correct. Absent that direction, how much were premiums required to go up? Um, the filing didn't state how much it was they were required to go up. I, I haven't done the math on what it would look like, but it would be substantially more than 2.9% in terms of meeting the operational break-even. Well, the operational break-even premium, according to Mr Harding, is uh, currently at 1.82%. Yeah. Uh, as of 30 June 2021, uh, 22. Is that accord with your recollection? Uh, I believe it might have been as high as 1.88 at the filing point um, based on the December 2021 evaluation. So if it's now 1.82, that well, would indicate potentially an improvement. Okay, that's interesting because Mr Harding gave us the impression that there was an improvement in the six months, not a deterioration. But I can tell you this. So fact, that would be true. If, so if the break even was now 1.82, that would indicate that less was required. Yes. So from uh, 1.88. As in, so that um, uh, but it is a case that as the equivalent 12-month period, so 30 June 2021, this is not disputed, it was 1.77. Correct. And so in the span of one financial year, rather than it closing, it's gotten worse, which means that the maths are quite straightforward here. The premiums, in order to reach its break-even premium point, would have to rise by a percentage of roughly 30.3 or 1.5, which works out to be 25%. So in order to cover the existing losses, premiums would have to rise by 25% to reach a break-even premium level, correct? That would be correct. And it is still your understanding that um, premiums are going to need to rise to that break-even point um, each year, every year, until the end of the decade? Ultimately, yes. So it is the case that the 328,000 small businesses who pay into the nominal insurer are facing at least a decade of rising premiums. Yes. And that doesn't allow for the restoration of any benefits, does it? That's correct. That would be to meet the current liabilities of the scheme. Yeah. And um, this all goes down to the core point, which um, seems to be still disputed by iCare around the findings of the Door review. Um, it's your understanding that Ms. Door recommended strongly against any strategy that was based on using investment returns to make up for underwriting loss over the long term? That would have been the case in the door review that was later disputed, obviously, in the McDonald's Almost review. said word for word what I just said to you was Miss Dawes' finding. And you rightly allude to the fact that that hasn't necessarily been accepted by iCare. And that, but it is the case. I can't think of a single other Australian insurer <coughs> that is relying as much on investment returns to cover that underwriting loss as <coughs> iCare. Can you? Oh. So, um, you still don't have the power to impose conditions on the nominal insurer's licence, correct? That's correct. That bill is still before the parliament. Absent you having that power, you basically have to beg ICARE to do the right thing when it comes to the nominal insurer, correct? Effectively. We can, be, we can attempt to be persuasive, but ultimately I don't have any particular power to direct them in that way or to impose conditions on the nominal insurer or indeed therefore ICARE. And in the absence of you having that power, we still have to rely effectively on ICARE and its board deciding to implement your suggestions. That's correct. And has there been any sign of that happening? 
I think it, it, it would be fair to say that through the process of the nominal insurer and enterprise insurer, uh, enterprise improvement plans, iCare have been very receptive um, and they have been constructive. What continues to frustrate me is how long it will need to take before I see any results. What are they telling you? What's the time scale that they're giving you? That's a um, frustration. I, I think in the grand scheme of things, we're not expected to see any significant change until after the change to the claims management model, which uh, the new providers are likely to be onboarded at this stage in January. That, as far as I understand, they've not yet been announced. So that time is ticking, I think, relatively quickly. And I think for ultimately we're looking at toward the end of 2023 before um, I understand we're likely to see any substantial improvements. And there's a risk we will suffer a continued deterioration in that period of time? Uh, there is, and of course the change of claims, ha claims management provider has the potential for further deterioration by iCare's uh, own own descriptions because of that particular change is generally likely to cause um, key risk. poor results. It's a key risk for that process, absolutely. And indeed, historically, return to work rates, performance upon changing of claims agents, um, results in under five points can drop return to work rates. Um, that's correct? Or that's there? correct. So it's, we're in for a lot more turbulence. I mean, the only mitigating factor is turnover generally would cause the same problem and turnover across the claims agents hasn't been, um, hasn't been absent. So, uh, but yes, you're quite right. It could be a significant, um, a significant drop in performance over that period. Have you had the opportunity to provide any, or do you even have the power to provide any sort of inspection or assurances to the new claims handling model that's being pursued? Um, my intent would be that the rolling series of small audits that we're doing will, will pick that up. Uh, so we're going to start in October this year, which of course won't generate any knowledge about the current, uh, about the new claims handling provider uh, or the model. But into, new, into next year, we'll continue to those audits and looking at how those files are being handled as that transition continues. Sarah ordered EY to do an audit of the fund um, under your predecessor, did they not? Uh, that would have been the predecessor to the door report or around the same time, I understand. Well, it's yes, I, I believe that's true. I, I'm not familiar with it. Uh, well, maybe it's not EY, but you definitely ordered I, I, I do believe EY did do some work in relation to an audit. And this was about, about whether iCare was incorrectly billing matters to the fund that they shouldn't have been before. That wasn't EY. Okay, who was that? Uh, that if, if, I, if I am thinking of the correct thing, Mr Morgan, feel free to correct me. It was the Workers' Comp Insurance Fund audit that my predecessor ordered. Um, I believe it was uh, probably Grant Thornton or someone who might have done that. Yeah, you, you're, Mr Dennett, well, again, approving that your memory is better than mine, because that's correct. Um, why hasn't that report been <laughs> released? Sorry? Why hasn't that report been released? Um, the report is available on our website. It effectively, all it really did, quite honestly, was relitigate matters that were already well known. The report didn't find anything that required any further or allowed for any further regulatory action by CIRA. Okay, but it did find that they were systemically charging matters to the workers' comp fund that they shouldn't have been. At a point in time, and it also found that that had been addressed and the new model that they were using was now fair and appropriate and wasn't using the sort of the concept I understand at the time was essentially certain things were billed directly and the, resi the residue went to the nominal insurer. Um, that process has changed and has certainly not been the case uh, since either uh, myself or Mr Harding have been in the organisations. Is iCare still underpaying workers when it comes to pre-injury average weekly earnings? Uh, the remedy, I, I don't know that they're still, um, I think it would be unfair to characterise that they're still doing that. I haven't seen any new evidence of underpayments based well, on the power. to be fair to them. Not just, we haven't, we have also haven't necessarily more recently looked, but the, as for the matter I imagine you're talking about, the remediation no, program no, is No, are two separate matters. We'll get to the remediation. But they, look, to be fair to them, like, they told us at the hearing that the Law and Justice Committee had a year ago, thereabouts, gee, it's been a while, uh, that... They were, um, and the six to eight percent of people were still not having the correct uh, PR we applied to them. Can you on notice perhaps come back to us with any information you have as a regulator as to whether or not Sierra has done anything to check? Um, uh, yes, I'll take that on notice. Yeah, and incidentally across all the schemes and all the insurers. Um, equally, I think you were about, or your organisation, Miss Donnelly may have made this decision prior to your arrival, Mr Dent, but as I understand it, there was going to be some examination as to whether other insurers have uh, suffered from the same mistakes when it comes to applying the Piawi. Can we just get on notice whether what the latest report is from CIRA in respect to um, the prevalence of this practice across the scheme? Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, uh, on the remediation, have you checked into how they're remediating? Uh, yes, uh, I'm aware of that process at the moment. Um, it's currently being undertaken um, in partnership with Service New South Wales. Um, a good number of the workers, I'm sorry, looking for the numbers, 
Um, at this stage, I understand that around 10,782 of the workers who a proactive payment was being applied to yeah. have actually received those payments. Um, so that's that's a positive start. I understand at the moment um, there are a number of workers that cannot yet be contacted, so that work is underway. Well, this is when we get to do the the, the estimates equivalent of the Marvel multiverse of questions here, because I now get to go to Mr. Wells, Service New South Wales, who tells me that uh, ICARE says that. You, so, uh, sorry, Mr. Reese. <laughs> sorry, Mr. Mr. Reese, that's you. Uh, I'm still caught with the Marvel multiverse. Your organisation made a decision during the response to the floods or COVID to have to delay the contacting of uh, up to 21,000 injured workers who have been underpaid uh, to allow for the redirection of your internal resources. Are you aware of that? Uh, I, I am. And why was such a decision made? So maybe just to recap, we were engaged. Am I using the microphone? Apologies. So we were engaged late last year to assist uh, iCare to make contact and, uh, and support these underpaid workers. Uh, we entered agreement with them in December. The goal of that agreement was to contact and pay workers that, um, that responded to that by the 30th of June. Uh, once we got into that work, we identified there's two cohorts, one where contact information uh, was available from iCare, the second cohort where contact information was not available. Uh, so for that first cohort, we're on track with that original, or we yeah. achieved that original that's, commitment of 30th of June. Confirmed. We commenced yeah. uh, contacting those customers from mid-April, uh, mid-May, sorry, through to mid-June. And so that's the number that um, uh, that Mr. Dents referred to. The second cohort, we have further work to do from a privacy standpoint to ensure that uh, we can, whilst preserving all privacy safeguards for our customers, leverage additional data sources within Service New South Wales to make contact with those customers. That, that work's ongoing. Uh, at this point, we expect to contact that remaining cohort by the end of the year. Thank you. Um, I might just start. Ms. Ms. Cameron, thank you for joining us. Um, my question is obviously centred around the uh, e-conveyancing uh, project. When were you first advised by the Minister or his office that he was going to disregard previous statements about national uniformity and, and, and go it alone uh, in, in terms of an enforcement regime ahead of it, the other states? Uh, thank you, Chair. So the, um, the, the New South Wales uh, enforcement regime sits apart from um, the national regime and isn't inconsistent with it, but rather um, enables us to enforce those provisions. Uh, the Minister um, in... So New South Wales continues to develop the national enforcement regime in conjunction with other states and territories. Uh, the Minister flagged um, New South Wales as, was considering looking at a New South Wales regime as an interim measure ahead of bringing in a national regime at a meeting with, um, at a ministerial forum in June this year. Um, and that was because of um, concerns with the time uh, it was taking to develop the national regime. It's so just an inherently complex thing to do to um, synthesise the, um, the, 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 the requirements for each of the states and territories into a single harmonious scheme for enforcement. Okay, so that was in a forum. Was that in a direct conversation with you or was just as an announcement in, a, in some sort of speech at a forum? Just. Oh, it, was, it was part of um, discussions in a forum with his, his um, ministers in other states and territories, with his counterparts in other states and territories. Okay, so you went at that forum? Uh, we, yeah, we were at that forum. Okay, yeah. so that's when you first found out that's, that we were heading down that path? I think it was an idea that we had been um, canvassing at an informal... Um, um, as, it, as an idea before then, but that was the um, the first um, formal time the minister indicated his intention to do that. But at that time, it was also flagging an intention. Uh, and as time went by, um, and as the complexity of developing the national regime became more and more apparent, um, the the proposal to develop a New South Wales regime as an interim measure um, crystallised. Okay. Did, in that announcement at that forum, did he also indicate that it wasn't just about enforcement, but it was to address safeguards um, or concerns around safeguards um, that had been raised during the debate of the previous bill? Yeah, thank you. So the, the concerns um, around safeguards for the previous bill um, are being currently reviewed by ARNIC. 
um, at a national level to be um, considered as part of the second amendments to the, the economic electronic conveyancing national law. Uh, so those safeguards um, are being considered as part of a separate national process that is currently continues um, and is underway. Okay, that wasn't my question. It was, my question was, did the minister, as part of his announcement, say that, that this enforcement regime or this bill would also include those, those safeguards? I'm asking you because the minister's memory this morning was hazy. <laughs> Uh, at best. So I'm hoping your memory of how this all came to pass might be a bit better. No, thank you. So the Minister's comment um, at the forum was one that was um, in, in passing. It was a couple of sentences. It wasn't um, it wasn't designed to be a comprehensive description of everything that would be covered, but the intention was to cover um, a New South Wales enforcement regime and and only that territory, not, not um, cover um, the issues that have been raised um, at the committee. Okay. So when, at what point after that uh, brief announcement, we, was your office asked to initiate this uh, proposal paper or this discussion paper that you released on the 8th of July to the industry? Uh, that went through the enforcement proposals? My apologies, I'm not sure of the exact dates, but we would have um, been working on it um, shortly after. Okay. Were, you, yeah. were you asked by the Minister's Office to do that, or was that something that you guys initiated yourself? He seemed to in indicate that it may have been something that came from you guys. It may well have been a proposal from our office, um, but it was something we discussed with the Minister's Office. Yep. Okay. Sure. Um, have you, has your office been asked to provide any advice to Parliamentary Council regarding this second bill? The Minister seemed pretty hazy as well as in terms of where it's at with Parliamentary Council. So has your office been, has your office been obviously taking the feedback from this proposal to Parliamentary Council? Yes, so in terms of, the, it is a bit confusing because there are two second bills. So this, the New South Wales Enforcement Bill, um, we've, been working, <coughs> we've been working with Parliamentary Council on that. Yes. Um, but the second bill that we're working on with our colleagues in other states and territories to bring in a national enforcement regime and to consider the safeguards that industry proposed, um, we're not yet at the stage where we can start providing drafting instructions. We're still before that stage. And so there hasn't been engagement, as far as I'm aware, with Parliamentary Council on that second bill. Okay. So th the second bill that you have been engaged within, uh, has that also been informed by the National Code, which we're unclear as to whether it's been released or it's still in draft form. The Minister was once again hazy as to whether he's seen it. So yeah, thank you. So the National Code um, actually relates to a different, a different concept. So the National Code relates to the financial settlement arm of electronic conveyancing, so the, the connections into the Reserve Bank and out to their financial institutions. Um, following reviews by the Council of Financial Regulators, they tasked AusPayNet to work with ILNOs, Ele Electronic Acknowledgement Network Operators, and um, financial institutions to develop an industry code, and it's kind of similar to what's done for credit cards. So that work is underway. There have been a number of meetings at the STEERCO level and also at the, um, there's two working groups that sit under that. Uh, as I said, the ILNOs and the banks are primarily working on that code, but ARNIC, the Reserve Bank, the ACCC are all observers to that process. We expect that to finish by December this year, and then the ACCC, oh, excuse me, the ACCC undertakes a review of that. Okay, thank you. Um, I might leave it there uh, in terms of that line of question. I've just got one more line before I try to the opposition, and then that's to you, Ms uh, Livingston. Um, in 2018, your, your department did a review of taxi fares in New South Wales. Uh, it was a fairly lengthy report. I think it was about 70 pages. Are you, you, were you, you familiar with that report, or was that before your time? Before my time. Okay. Um, in that 70 pages, the idea of surge pricing was mentioned once. Given that the concerns of the industry and customers has essentially emerged as truth, that surge pricing has become rampant in the point-to-point -point industry with rideshare uh, companies. Is your agency looking at doing, or is, are you doing any work around how we grapple with this issue of surge pricing so customers aren't continually ripped off? So the work that we do needs to be referred to us somehow, either 
it's a function in legislation or a minister refers a terms of reference to us. We haven't been asked to do work on that. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll throw it to the opposition. Thank you, Chair. Um, Secretary, do you mind if I just resume that question? Thank you. Um, Mr. Reese, you were telling me that you think that you're going to have it all done by the end of the year? Uh, so cohort one, we've com we completed by the 30th of June, which was the commitment with iCare. Uh, for cohort two, we believe we'll have that completed uh, by the end of the year, subject to being able to find a way to achieve that within the appropriate privacy. Uh, Do you have clearance data. from the Privacy Commissioner? Uh, I believe we're still working through that at the moment. No, just innocent question, Ms Tide, but you're not the Privacy Commissioner, are you? Correct. Good. Um, okay, and when do you expect to have... Uh, where are we up to in terms of getting clearance from the Privacy Commissioner? Because it seems to be where it's the hurdle here is in respect uh, to remediating these workers. I, I don't believe it's exclusively resting with the Privacy Commissioner, but I'll, I'll take on notice exactly where we're at in that process, if that's helpful. That, that would be helpful, if you don't mind, um, in that respect. That would be good. Um, Mr Dent, is there any further information you'd like to provide in respect to remediation? Uh, only that at the moment, so so far 21,000 of the 51,000 uh, people have been contacted, so the cohort re the re the relies on this privacy piece is still around 30,000 people. Yes, it's a so lot. So it's not insignificant. It's not insignificant at all. Having said that, I think the what it is worth noting, that's for the, sort of, if you will, the proactive payments. Each of those individual workers, should they become aware and think they have an issue, are still able to contact iCare yeah. and have the full review of their matter. Uh, have you, by any chance, managed to inspect the reasons why there was underpayments of people who were entitled to payments under the Dust Diseases Scheme? Uh, the Dust Diseases Scheme is not a matter where CIRA has any regulatory role, I so it so. suffice to say that no it was does. equally disturbing, and when, when it was brought to my attention, it was uh, on the basis that there would be likely more overpayments and underpayments, and as you'd be well aware, uh, you would have found out probably the same day I did that the number of underpayments was actually far more significant than perhaps had been indicated. And the scale of the underpayments huge. Yep. The average amount of the people who have now, many of whom are dead, have been underpaid is, is quite large. That's fair? Uh, that is fair. And, and over a very long period of time. Yeah, but no one has, outside of iCare, has regulatory authority over them. Yeah. That's correct? That's correct. So CIRA has a limited role in relation to uh, the Dust Diseases Authority, and it's mostly around how each year the levy is to be distributed across the group of insurers based on the different um, categories. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you give us an update as to any regulatory update you have for us on the HPCF, please? Uh, on HPCF, so um, there is a, a number of matters on foot. Um, so first of all, from a regulatory point of view, um, we continue our investigation of the application of the eligibility model used by iCare. Um, I recently expanded that from uh, an individual uh, issue um, to looking more broadly across a series of builders to ensure to assure ourselves that the eligibility model had been provided and implemented correctly. That's underway. There's a Why did you make that decision? Uh, because I I wasn't persuaded that it was in isolation that the issue we'd found had occurred and the information from the forensic team suggested that it was worthwhile looking more broadly. When that may indeed find nothing, but I felt it was worth doing. Indeed. As a regulator, that's what you do. Um, when did you make that decision? Uh, I'd have to check the date, but it was in the last eight weeks. Uh, at some point in time, um, I commissioned a further audit. Well, it's been established on the public record that uh, there was the specific matter you had that gave rise to your need to inspect the application of the eligibility model arose from the decision to provide Metricom with insurance. That's fair. And as a result of that, um, you've now expanded it to look into other people who may have been insured as well. And what we're checking is both whether the, the methods through which assurance were provided, so whether there whether, whether were deeds or other means used to secure the liability, whether they were appropriate, um, but also whether the financial assessments were appropriate and accurate. What, have you concluded the first set of that? Or I expect the report from uh, the forensic team next week. Okay, and that is the expanded report, or is that the first No, that will be the original. That will be the initial matter. Um, we did have to go back and ask for further information and uh, look into a few more matters. So it's taken a little bit more time. So I expect that to be concluded next week. The broader audit, I don't have a completion date for at this point in time. Has it been done by the same auditor? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank so you. So they, they have the benefit of everything that they've uh, discovered so far. Given the sensitivity of that matter, Mr. Den, I won't push you any further on that. Thank you. Um, but the HBCF, other regulatory activity that you may or may not have done? Um, 
not specific uh, regulatory activity. We are looking from a policy point of view. We're consulting at the moment on the, rep the findings of the IPART report. Uh, I think it's fair to say that there's a lot to do in terms of whether the scheme is now fit for purpose given the current situation within the building industry. So we are looking more deeply. That public consultation's underway at the moment. Um, and in addition, within CIRA, um, I've committed additional resources to the home building scheme. I think um, what we've learned over the last uh, the last 12 months and with the state of the industry is there's far more to do than we've had the capacity to do. Has today. the collapse of Oracle caused CIRA to make any further inquiries into the HBCF? Uh, not so much further inquiries. Um, when an event like Oracle or Willoughby or those happen, um, we work very closely with Fair Trading, who have a principal regulatory role in relation to the builders themselves and the suitability of those builders. Um, so between iCare, CIRA and Fair Trading, we're working actively. Uh, at this stage, the Oracle, um, the Oracle collapse does look to be not insignificant um, and we'll be monitoring to make sure that those claims are handled appropriately along the way. Well, we established last week the size of the potential liability, but it works out to be from memory, um, as you like, as you put it, not insignificant. I think uh, off, off the top of my head, the number I can't find on my page here, it's in the order of about a $10 million liability to the HPCF. There's around 179 bills current. What that won't take into account is any bills that have been completed that are in a warranty period for defects. So that's a little harder to ascertain what that might look like. Okay. Um, Mr. Dent, are you in a position to provide us an update as to how we're going in terms of the consultation that we were promised in respect to the establishment of a workers' compensation-like scheme for the gig economy? Um, yes, if one moment. I, so at the moment, um, one, of the, one of the most important things I think that's going on at the moment that we need to watch is what's happening federally. I think there's some really positive movement um, that will deal with the industrial relations system nationally, which the trickle down of that will be very helpful. Um, we have done some consultation. Um, what's, what's frustrating, of course, is as I've mentioned before, the very diverse opinions uh, across employee and employer groups around the gig economy and what the appropriate solution is. I think the other thing that's really important to understand is most of the conversation to date has been around food delivery riders and there have been some um, absolutely appalling tragedies there that, that shouldn't be forgotten. But the gig economy is a much bigger and broader issue and even McDougall called that out, that I think the, the rise of independent contractors in a range of industries presents huge challenges for the workers', workers compensation system. We intend to address that in the overall recommendation 34, re-look at the whole workers compensation system. But on the delivery riders platform, I think really importantly there has now been, while it's still not equivalent, um, which would obviously be ideal, the individual platforms are now providing broader and better insurance coverage voluntarily. So that's useful. Um, um, we continue to look at ways in which we can provide advice. Its usefulness is debatable, but, Mr. Temp, but I won't cut you off. Uh, we, but we continue, we're continue. we continuing to, to look at options and consult around what advice we can continue. Your job is government. to make sure employers who are meant to pay premiums pay premiums, correct? That's correct. And that gives you the ability to launch investigations into whether or not a person has paid the premiums they Oh, fair. That is correct, which we do reasonably actively. When was the last time you checked a gig company or a gig platform as to whether or not they meet the definition of employee and employer for the perspective of workers' comp laws that would require them to pay a premium? Um, I'd have to take that on notice, but the short answer would be if each of those gig platforms, it would depend which workers you're talking about. So people working at the specific. head office of a platform, for example, would absolutely uh, uh, be considered uh, be an employee. very specific. Have you investigated whether Hungry Panda should be paying premiums into the workers' compensation scheme above what they already do to cover the people who pay their... Not specifically for Hungry Panda, I'm aware. So the reason why I mentioned that one is because we have a PIC finding that suggests that they were. The insurer accepted liability in that case. The PIC finding was around the distribution of the death benefit. I don't think it's fair to say the PIC found that that person was an employee. Well, that's interesting because um, how that PIC process is characterised was slightly different by Mr Harding. But I thought the insurer accepted liability too. There were, yeah, and I think importantly, there was no liability decision made by the Personal Injury Commission. That decision only is around the apportionment of the lump sum. Okay, so but did that catalyse you to perhaps inspect whether or not you should be testing? Um, on that particular matter, I believe, and I can take this on notice if you will, I think I, I did ask my team uh, whether there was anything in that decision and whether we needed to, to look more broadly. And I, from memory, the answer was essentially um, that under the circumstances, the insurer had made a decision uh, on, in relation to that. In the main, most of the delivery riders, uh, for example, employed by the Hungry Pandas or the like, are still considered independent contractors for the purpose of workers' compensation. But you, you rely on the common law test, don't you? Mm -hmm. uh, the test under the Workers' Compensation Act for us is slightly different, but broadly, yes. So the issue is, is that we have multiple common law 
um, decisions arising from different tribunals um, that have all had to look at this question different, well, for different purposes under law, uh, according to different fact patterns that are prevailed at the time within the platforms. But Revenue New South Wales has a case right now um, with Uber that asserts that for a period of time they were employees for the purpose of payroll tax. Uh, Fair Work has, uh, Fair Work Ombudsman has brought various matters against companies like Deliver and all. Uh, all I'm interested in is, is how, when was the last time Siri looked about whether they satisfied the definition of employee for the purpose, uh, an employer for the purposes of premiums? And I want to ask very specifically about Hungry Panda and Uber Eats, because they're the ones where we have um, various forms of dispute around workers' comp. So on notice... I will take that on notice, not a problem. But I'm going to ask you on notice to look at to Deliveroo, mm -hmm. Amazon Flex. I'm going to also ask you on notice to look at uh, Uber Eats, Uber as well, uh, DoorDash, Menu Log. Uh, easy as well because you'll find they're all hovering in this broadly similar space. Yes. Uh, and look, I just don't want to be mean to Revenue New South Wales and only direct my ire at them. So I did say that I would be mean to other people too. So here I am. Uh, <laughs> Very kind of you to, yeah. to share the love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's it for me. Um, Mr Mookie, if I could just quickly close out your questions. So um, we're waiting on a public interest disclosure uh, direction, sorry, to be um, approved by the Attorney General. That'll enable data matching between Service New South Wales data and eye care data, which will enable the contact of that cohort too. So that means the Privacy Commissioner has said this requires a Minister to tick off? That's right. That's and right. that's gone to the Attorney General? I believe there's two approvals required. One is Minister Dominella. I believe that's complete. And the second is the Attorney General. When did uh, it go to the AG? Uh, I don't have that precise date, but subject to that being um, uh, being approved, we expect to commence those notifications in October. Okay. Can you on notice tell us when the uh, Attorney General was asked to approve it? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I direct all my questions to the Secretary, please? But please feel free to refer them to whoever you think is appropriate. Um, can I ask you what the current balance is of the Digital Restart Fund, please? Uh, oh, Mr Wells, you might need to answer that. I know that uh, the majority of the fund has been allocated against projects uh, and there's probably a small amount left to be allocated, but Mr Wells would know more. Yeah, thanks. <coughs> thanks, Mr Primrose. There's been a total of 251 pro projects now approved. Um, so of the 2.2 billion, 1.945 billion has been allocated to, to those two projects. So um, excluding a small amount of contingency, um, there's 242 million. It's been reserved for projects as part of the pipeline we talked about before, but has been yet to be allocated. Okay. Can we on notice get a list of the 1.9 billion and the... Oh, <coughs> the 200 projects and how much each? 51. Yeah, yeah, we can. Look, um, each year we produce an annual report too, so that was produced for 21, uh, sorry, yeah. for 2021. That's on our website. We're in the process of producing that for this year, so that will uh, contain all those. Uh, I think the last part will be just the reservations against the remaining components, which we're happy to look at too. But when you, the reservations framework for the digital restart fund, what exactly is that process? So the process is um, we base th the start of the process is cluster um, digital plants. They have three, ten year, three and five, and sometimes ten year plans depending on the cluster. Um, we go through a prioritisation process across the cluster that sort of um, lines those projects up against some criteria which Digital Restart is meant to do. Um, we rank and score those. Those we take that to ERC and ERC approves that that backlog of projects. If As you like. a reservation. Yeah, that's right. And then and then the process in terms of funding is we take tranches to ERC that are ready for funding. Ready for funding means, you know, we've worked with a cluster to build a business case. The business case is sound. It meets the objectives of the fund, et cetera. Uh, we take those business cases through a working group, Treasury, DPC, DCS. We take those to a steering committee, which is, again, jointly chaired, and that's, at that point, uh, they're recommended for approval via Cabinet. Thank you. Um, Sorry, Mr Primrose. Uh, the uh, bell did go. I've just got one line of question, and then I'm going to throw it back to opposition yeah, so you can go unabated. Um, through you, Ms. Hogan, I might direct my question to Mr. Dent. Um, on the 15th of August, Sarah announced a, a pilot program into, titled Workers' Compensation Assist. Yes. Um, how much is this pilot program costing 
the department? Like, how has it been resourced? Is this part of uh, a serial employee's addition, like existing role, or are they, or is it someone being discreetly employed to? To work uh, it, on it's this. a combination of both, Ms. Fanazic. Uh, there's a number of our existing resources who work in our CIRA assist area, which has previously been predominantly focused on CTP assist. And there's a small number of new staff that have been recruited, I think maybe five or so, um, that will assist with the workers' comp assist pilot. Okay, and obviously that's just a temporary uh, appointment yes, while the pilot... The, that's right, and if the pilot continues, if the pilot generates good results, and so far there is um, there is reasonably good feedback coming from uh, employees about their experience and the, mm. the assistance that's provided, but that'll be looked at at the end, and should it actually stack up as a worthwhile proposition, we'll look at how we resource it going forward. Um, we might look to shift or change it or discontinue it if indeed it hasn't achieved any results. Yeah, how long is the pilot going for? 12 months. 12 months. And it seems you are, are you are you deliberately targeting self insurers? I oh, know you listed uh, no, Aldi, um, Toll, and Catholic Church. They're all self insurers. We made an ask to all of the insurers about who would like to participate in the pilot. Uh, the first on board was Aldi as a self insurer. Then Toll and Catholic Church Insurance came on board. We have recently approached New South Wales government um, self insured clusters and asked them uh, if they would like to join the program and have us contact their workers. And at the moment, we're negotiating through. I think there might be three clusters who've shown interest. So we'll expand the, so as, as basically as we're hitting project milestones, we're looking at expanding to make sure we're making best use of the volume we have. Sure, on notice, can you indicate what those three or four clusters were that have? Oh uh, yes, yeah, so I'm just not sure whether they've actually agreed or not as yet, so. Yeah, thank you. Um, just looking at what the, the brief description of what the uh, pilot entails, it's fair, is it fair to say that it seems like Siri is taking up the work of uh, a previous, well, you know, a previous job that the insurers actually did. Like you talked about calling employees up and talking about their claims journey. That's a case manager's job. So uh, it, from from the outside looking in, it seems like Siri is having to step up to do a case manager's job because the case managers at these insurers aren't doing their job properly. Uh, you could probably frame an argument around that, and I would find it com difficult to totally disagree with you. However, one of the things we have seen through the success of CTP Assist, uh, which has now been operating for a number of years, is that a call from a regulator, as distinct from an insurer, which you might have a different relationship, has proven to be beneficial. So um, while arguably if uh, a case manager was on the job quickly enough and providing the right information, you could say it was um, unnecessary, what we are able to do through the workers' compensation CTP assist services is provide advice on how to manage issues with the insurer, directions to say the independent review officer for complaints. So we're able to provide a, a slightly different degree of assistance from the impartial position as a regulator. Ideally, things would be working so smoothly we wouldn't need it, but that doesn't appear to be the case and it's been a helpful service to date. Okay, thank you. I'll oh. go back to Mr. Primrose. Yeah. Okay, um, can I ask, a few questions in relation, again, to our favourite park and pay. Um, when did the department first have contact with Duncan Solutions regarding park and pay? I'll ask Mr Wells to answer your questions on park and pay. I'll have to take that on notice. Okay. Did the department have any discussions with Duncan Solutions prior to the Minister's office meeting with the company on the 7th of February 2019? Again, I'll have to take that on notice. Not, uh, yeah, I don't, I'll have to take. I'll have to take specific no, dates no, on that. Happy for you to take them on notice, and um, um, how was the decision to award the contract to Duncan reached? Uh, yeah, thanks, Mr. Primrose. As we talked about before, um, the decision to pilot park and pay was based on the location first. Um, so we chose the rocks because, as we've talked about before, uh, there were um, metres and infrastructure in that location that the government owned. Uh, so once that location was selected, uh, we, because Duncan provided the metres in that location, um, we, um, uh, as we've talked about before, put in place a sole source mechanism to work with Duncan to, to you know, trial the solution, if you like. Um, Liverpool subsequently um, joined that pilot as well. So that, so that was the basis of the decision, was, was mostly around location and what we had access to. Did you have any discussions with any other potential providers? Again, it was about the location, not about the provider. So that's no? So we chose the, 
It was based on the location because that's where we could eat most easily trial. Did the department have discussions with any other potential providers? Because we chose the location, we we started direct, direct sourcing with Duncan. Okay, so the answer is no? Again, you're trying to take this somewhere, which is, again, that you asked I'm simply, Mr Primrose, did, did you, you asked... It's a simple yes or no answer. Yeah, well, you asked the basis for... The, the, the trial, the basis for the trial was location. So, yeah, that was so, my, so we didn't have any other... Well, so that was my previous question on basically this question is, did the department have discussions with other potential providers? Because, because Duncan was the provider in that location, the only logical provider to have discussions with was, was, that, lo was that provider. In an email to the Minister's office, um, uh, the Minister's Chief of Staff dated 6th of December 2019, you state there was not a procurement process and can you explain how the contract came to be awarded then? Yep. So as, as Ms Young talked about before, um, so, so as I've just said, because we chose location first, the provider in that location was Duncan. We went through a, a process to sole source Duncan for that trial. That was the basis from which the contract um, emerged. Um, in your email dated 5 December 2019, and as you state, um, the rocks was selected as a trial location by the Minister's office. So I'm sure that there would have been consultation, as the Minister talked about before, around what the right location was. Um, I'm sure there was advice from the department at that time. Again, I'd have to take that on notice in terms of that sequence. But I mean, I'm, I'm sure that was the process around then. Okay. How active a role did the Minister's office play in the procurement process? Uh, none that I'm aware of. But again, that'd be a question for the Minister. So as the Minister talked about this morning, the procurement process is, is with the cluster. Hmm. Your email dated 5 December 2019, as I just indicated, said the rocks was selected as the trial location by the Minister's office. So um, I'd need to check that exact language because I think the Minister wouldn't choose... Um, we would have chosen that process in consultation together. With the Minister's office? Look, I'd, I'd need to check that in the context of that email. I, I, you know. Okay. In that same email chain, it states Duncan Solutions was engaged to expedite the rollout. Nowhere in detailing the background of the app does it disclose that Duncan approached the Minister's office to propose the app. Why was that information not included? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Well, in that same email chain, OK, it states Duncan Solutions was engaged to expedite the rollout, and you've indicated that. But nowhere in detailing the background of the app does it disclose that Duncan approached the Minister's office to propose the app. Why isn't that information? I don't think that's the way it worked. I think, Mr Primrose, as I said before, um, we were proposing a trial of the app and the concept of the app. The location was chosen, the provider was the people that we get the data from, and, and as we've talked about before, we developed the app or came up with the concept of the app that access data from that provider. Did, now I ask you to bear in mind that as a member of the upper house, I also read confidential yep. terms. Um, so without going in that direction, I again ask you, let's be quite clear. Um, um, did Duncan approach the minister's office to propose the app? No, not to my knowledge, but that's probably a question that the minister or minister's office would need to answer. So not to my knowledge, no. Okay, so you're not aware of if that was the case? I'm not, because the concept of park and pay is a, is, is a solution that, that we have proposed and successfully rolled out, not, not Duncan. Um, you signed the contract with Duncan Solutions in July 2019. Can you please explain why the contract award notice was not posted until the 26th of November? Yeah, I can't, and my apologies, I had that wrong before. It is 45 days in terms of contract disclosure, so I'm, I can't answer right now, but I'll try and find on nine as why that took an extra month. Okay, but you agree that under GIPA requirements, the yes. contract must be posted within yes, I do, 45 yeah. days? Yes, yeah. I Okay. Um, after the Minister's Chief of Staff instructed you to seek probity advice, you replied you would do that as soon as possible. Yeah. Is it correct you were the decision maker on which probity firm was engaged? 
I'll need to take that on notice as well. Um, but again, as we talked about this morning, there's a panel of probity advisors that we uh, use. They're under a, a government scheme called Triple Zero Five. Um, so we would have been, we would have worked through a process to engage someone from that panel. It would have depend, it depended on scope, on cost, whether we needed quotes from that process. So I'm happy to come back on notice as to how that process um, worked, Mr. Primrose. Now, I understand the process. Were you the one who made the call? I, ultimately, I, I think I would have been the one that signed off on the on the property advisor, yes. Okay, if you weren't, can you tell us who was? Yeah, sure. Um, has the department engaged O'Connor, Marsden and Associates, and I'll refer to them as OCM, um, in the past? I'll, I'm sure we have. I couldn't. I, I can't cite the individual um, contracts that we would have used O'Connor Marsden for. They're a probity advisor on that scheme, obviously. So I'm sure there's been, from time to time, um, occasions where we've used used them as well. well. Can, can you please just take that Certainly. notice as well? Yeah. Um, why Why were they chosen on this occasion? Again, I'd need to go back and, and uh, determine the process at that point. You, you can't recall your. Decision. I'm sorry, I can't. It was more than three years ago. I'll have to come back. Okay. I thought it may have been something you would have prepared for. Okay. When OCM was selected, were you aware that the minister's cousin worked for the firm? Uh, no, I wasn't. Given the buy New South Wales dot New South Wales dot gov dot au website listed Ms Nillian as an employee of OCM, how did this escape the notice of the department? I'm not sure we knew there was any relationship, and as the minister talked about before, he wasn't aware either. So I'm not sure there was any um, conflict, on, and if there was, we certainly weren't aware of it. You don't, you don't recall the process. You don't recall you making a decision. You don't recall, but you do recall that you weren't aware of this. No, I'm saying we weren't aware, because this has come up at a, a previous estimates. Correct. I, I know. Um, would you agree selecting a probity firm to review decisions made by a minister that employs a member of the minister's family risks creating the perception of a conflict of interest? Uh, had we have known, had that been obvious, had that person been on, on the process, potentially, but again, as we've talked about, the minister wasn't aware, or we weren't aware, so... But in retrospect, you'd have selected, possibly selected another firm to avoid... That conflict. Of Look, I guess that's that's hypothetical now, but I guess yeah. Let's be hypothetical as a decision maker. Would you have? If we had, I guess the, if we if there's a known conflict, we'd we'd work to avoid that. Now, OCM were engaged <coughs> to provide, I understand, two probity reports. Is yes, correct. correct. Yeah. Um, firstly, into the engagement of Duncan Solutions on the trial in the rocks, and another into the broader statewide rollout. Um, did Duncan sign two contracts? Uh, no, as we talked about this morning, we signed one contract with Duncan. Again, I can talk you through how the solution works and where Duncan plays, if that's useful. Um, but we entered into a single contract with Duncan, to my understanding, of um, a three plus one plus one uh, contract. Okay. So if there was one contract covering the trial and the statewide rollout, um, as indicated by the initial Duncan quote in May 2019. Why did you need two probity reports? Uh, because we looked at, we wanted to look at the scope, I understand, separately. We looked into this at lunch based on your questions earlier. Yep. So we wanted to look at, first of all, the sole sourcing of Duncan for the initial trial. Uh, and then secondly, we wanted to look at any potential risks uh, moving forward to a statewide rollout if that was um, successful. But you didn't need two contracts, just two probity reports? So we did two separate probity reports on those two separate pieces of scope, is my understanding. That's correct. Um, request to alter the initial draft probity report, well, as I understand, made 11 February 2020. Um, is requesting a probity report be changed standard practice? Okay, sorry, can you repeat that? Request to alter the initial draft probity report were made 11 February 2020. Is requesting a probity report um, be changed a standard practice? I'm not aware of I'm not aware of what you're referring to there, Mr. Primrose. Sorry. Okay. Can I suggest you take that on notice? Yeah, happy to. If this is relate in relation to that email that you produced this morning. Um, 
as we've talked about before and just a minute ago, the basis for the for the trial was locate was was based on location, not on provider, really clearly. And I think uh, some of the comments that you didn't read this morning in that email went to that fact um, that it was based on location first, and some of the standing order 52 that you probably have go to that as well. So I think if if that's the comment you're referring to from our team, just to make that abundantly clear, then then that's why that request would have been made or that comment on the draft would have been made. But I'm very happy to come back on notice as to Thank you. Okay. Uh, what that exactly refers to. That same email requests the changes because the report reads, and I quote, like we chose Duncan first, then determined the location, end of quote. But um, that's not what happened, is, was it? That's correct. That's not what happened. So why was that in the email? So that email is commenting on a draft report that we didn't think was clear enough about the actual process. Okay. Um, so let's look at the probity report. Was OCM informed of the Minister's office meeting with Duncan Solutions in February 2019? Again, I'd have to take, take that on notice. Was OCM advised that Duncan Solutions pitched the technology to the Minister's office? Again, that's not my understanding, but I'll, I'll check that as best I can as okay, well. Okay, well, I'm, you're the guys who did and accepted the probity report, and yep. I'm trying to work out yep. what the nature of the probity report was and what it actually looked at. Um, <coughs> was OCM advised that Duncan Solutions signed a deed of confidentiality with the department on the 18th of February 2019? I'll have to take the detail of this process, Mr. Primrose, on notice. I don't have that in front of me or, or can remember the detail of this. Was OCM advised that Duncan Solutions provided a quote in May 2019 covering both the initial trial in the rocks along with the statewide rollout? Uh, I think they would have been, yes. Okay. What due diligence checks are undertaken during the, during the uh, procurement process? Uh, look an extensive you know in terms of what what we did in this process because it was a sole source process as miss young talked about this morning most of the pr procurement processes we run are based on internal legal and probity advice within the department so those those processes would have been followed um, and as miss young said this morning uh, occasionally we get um, by exception probity reports as well where it's a high value or a risky program etc yeah I, I ask I'm going to read this statement out and I'm just asking please feel free to comment as you wish, but um, so you're, you're affirming that it's the case that um, in the case of the procurement of park and pay and the application of Duncan Solutions, the department performed um, many due diligence checks, both financial and personal at the time of the application. On Duncan, I think you're going to an email that Duncan is talking about their staff to do with. But again, I'm, I should, I'm going to need to take the, root, the detail of these steps, these dates, these comments on notice. Well, I'm just saying, did you perform um, due diligence checks? I'll, t I'll take that on notice, but we generally do, yes. Generally, OK. Um, the audit office has made several inquiries regarding park and pay. And in an email dated 1 June 2021, you instructed the department to pause all communications with the audit office until a formal process was established. And what was that formal process? Oh, again, I'll have to take that on notice. You don't recall? No. Yeah, I'm just noting the, the time, even though I'm going to let you keep going, it is 3 o'clock, which is our... Oh, actually, no, 30. it is 3, sorry, our afternoon tea break is 3.30, so keep going. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, Getting ahead of myself. Just a few more. Thanks, John. Um, in an email, Mr Wells, dated Friday 6 December 2019, you state that park and pay is generic and could be adopted by any council or meter combination. Is that correct? That's correct. So I'm happy to expand on that if that's helpful because that's one I can't answer. Yep. Um, we talked this morning about other infrastructure providers that the parking solution caters for. And it probably is useful here to explain that there are a few components to the solution. So at its most fundamental level, at an infrastructure level, a, a level where the department plays no role whatsoever, there are many infrastructure providers. Some of those are parking meter providers, some of them are 
parking station providers, as the Minister talked about this morning, it now includes driveways, electric vehicle pay, uh, stations, et cetera, et cetera. So at, at that level, we play no part. Uh, the second layer is how we source data from those providers. Uh, sometimes we source that via Duncan, via this contract, Mr Primrose, that we've talked about a number of times, uh, that uh, essentially feeds the application with data. Uh, sometimes many, sometimes providers work through Duncan, sometimes providers work directly to us. So there's something called APIs that, that feed the solution. The solution itself has been developed by the Department of Customer Service, um, as we've talked about, and there is also a payment gateway that Duncan provides. So Duncan provides two components, one at that second layer to provide us with data, one at that third layer for payments. So to answer your question, um, in terms of infrastructure providers and being technically agnostic to whatever the solution is, there's at least 10 providers now that we, we work with. Okay, so those, there are about 10 additional providers who've been brought on board? 10, infra 10 different sorts of infrastructure providers that we now are working with, that's right. Given park and pay can be adopted by any council or meter combination, has any councillor adopted the app without engaging Duncan Solutions to provide the payment gateway? Yeah, so um, I think there's two that I can, there's three that I can list, which is APARC, ITSL and CDS in various councils. We're working with all of those providers. Uh, as I talked about before, yep. those other infrastructure providers have nothing to do with Duncan either, so it is yeah, completely agnostic to those infrastructure providers. Can you provide us with that list on notice? Yeah, we did also in supplementary last time, but we're happy to, to update that list as well. Yep, thank you. I, I guess my memory is the same as yours. Okay. Um, does DCS solely use Duncan Solutions to provide its payments gateway? Uh, at currently, that's part of the contract, that's correct. How long will that contract, is that contract due to continue? So the contract is, uh, as we talked about this morning, a three year plus one plus one contract. So there's a, it's a three year contract with the ability to extend uh, for two years. The Minister announced the installation of over 3,600 sensors to upload data to Park and Pay. Can you tell us who's providing these sensors? Yeah, that's, um, that's a matter for councils again. If we, you go, we go back to what we talked about in terms of infrastructure, councils will determine how they source the sensors for those dis disability spots. Uh, we play no role in that procurement. We do uh, fund those councils to source those sensors, but we play no role in procurement. So it's really a matter for, for councils. But, uh, the tender process will be up to the local council? That's correct. That they're, the, they're the ones that will be either extending a contract they already have because they may have sensors in place already, uh, or they'd be looking to, to start a process to, to procure those. Okay. Was Duncan Solutions the only company approach to provide the sensors? No, definitely not. No. So, again, we, it's hard for me to comment because we don't play a role there. So the councils are the ones that choose their provider. Um, for councils that don't have providers, um, we're assisting them to look at various options. One of those is a Transport for New South Wales contract that obviously has uh, a range of sensor options as well. Uh, but again, they are decisions for councils uh, and a process we play no part in. Who's going to own the data provided by the sensors? Uh, so that will, f that, will, that will be owned by us. Okay, I'll come back to, if I can, thank you very much. Thank you. Just a quick follow-up question with regard to the um, the sensors. So, did, sort of been following this with a degree of interest, but um, you may have detected I quite like asking questions about property advisors and property orders after the commercial fishing exercise of a few years back. Um, can I just start? So did, did we say this morning that the, there was a property report done on the sensors as well? So we are in the process of getting a probity report for the scale out of the sensors. The, the process we're up to is we've piloted um, the solution for councils that already have sensors in place. So again, no procurement process, but we wanted to, before we scale out the pilot of those disability sensors, to look at the rules around how uh, not so much we procure, but we allocate funding to councils that don't have them at the moment. So that, that process is in, in progress at the moment. Is that unusual that you or unique that you would because you actually haven't undertaken the procurement here but you're getting a yeah, look it is a bit of it is a bit unique and it is a bit of an exception but I guess because of the interest in in the program we thought it would be uh, prudent to make sure we've just checked our processes in terms of that as well okay 
Uh, thank you. Um, Chair, I've got a couple of questions to uh, Ms Livingston, and then I'm not sure about the others, but once I finish these, if no one else got Ms Livingston. Were there any, any other departments? Um, so, Ms Livingston, um, this morning I read with interest the press release around the um, uh, your rate peg methodology review that's being undertaken at the request of the, the minister. Um, and of course, that's obviously created a lot of interest amongst local councils. A few of them have rung me, um, particularly around the, um, and I look at the, the, the task that's been set by the minister, and item four talks about the options for capturing external changes outside of council's control, which are reflected in council's costs. Um, there's a couple of items there that councils have flagged with me to ask, so I guess on their behalf I'm putting this to you. Sure. The first of those is, does that look at costs shifting from government? Is that one of the items that would be considered in that item four? Uh, so, uh, as you uh, allude to, we, we've only just started this review and announced it today. Um, the, the terms of reference give us scope to consult on what those things might be. So it might be that there's some kind of change in regulation or expectation of local governments that does mean there's a systemic shift in their costs and we, we would look at whether there's some way we could incorporate that in the um, rate peg. Okay. Um, because they'd be very keen to talk to you about, um, as they talk to all of us, about uh, cost shifting, quite rightly, quite rightly. It's a serious issue. Uh, the other issue that was raised with me, and I have no doubt it's being raised with my colleagues as well, is what is referred to as the Red Fleet, that is the uh, RFS um, uh, tankers and trucks and whatever else in regional New South Wales, um, essentially they they go on the council's asset register, but the council has no control whatsoever over those items. And so there's a number of councils now, I think we're up around 80 or 85, that are now saying this year they are not going to put those assets on their books. And the Auditor General has indicated that in that case they will receive an audited, uh, sorry, a qualified audit. Um, would that fit into that option for no, task number four, options for capturing external changes outside of council's control, do you think? Uh, I think we'd have to give that careful consideration. I understand there's an there's a accounting issue that the audit office has looked at that uh, councils ought to be depreciating those assets on their books, uh, and that's really a, a matter for the audit office rather than us giving accounting advice. If, uh, as I say, there was some kind of systemic shifting costs for councils uh, that they weren't currently recouping uh, from rates, because we're, we're talking about the, the rate peg, uh, we'd be open-minded to, to hearing the argument for that. Uh, the, the rate peg only applies to income collected from rates, so you'd also have to think about is that the kind of cost that, that ought to be recovered from rate payers? Okay, and the other factor that's of interest is, of course, is the population uh, growth factor and whether or not it's, attending, it's achieving its intended purpose. Um, a lot of regional councils, I think, have already expressed some concern about how that's being applied, but uh, again, um, I'm sure you can maybe shed some, a bit of light or a bit of direction for these councils as they engage in this process around uh, just exactly what you're looking for there or how you're going to treat that particular item in the task list. Yeah, so uh, the population factor has only been applied in the last year for the first time. So the kinds of things we are interested in hearing from councils is uh, how that worked for them in this first iteration. Uh, we ad adopted a, a stance of using ABS um, population data. There, there were obviously other sources that we uh, consulted councils about at the time. Um, so again, we'd be, be happy to hear if uh, there is any advances in the arguments on, on those issues. One of the, the challenges for the rate peg is that because we want to reflect council's costs accurately, we have been using historic data, and uh, that, that's ultimately what's triggered this review because by doing that, the rate peg is a little bit out of step Black. with the current uh, inflationary environment, uh, and that applies to the population factor as well. So we'd be open to considering whether there's a different way uh, of, of using forecasts 
or, or historic data that might get a better outcome for councils or a more timely outcome for them. Certainly, we'll be very keen to engage. Um, so I noticed that you're flagging that you'll, there'll be an issues paper released on the 27th of September. Uh, what's the, will there be consultation with um, stakeholders such as councils and others, I dare say, um, around the development of the issues paper or will you have the issues paper and send that out? The issues paper essentially kicks off the, the process. So on the 27th of September, we'll release an issues paper that uh, talks around the terms of reference and the kinds of things like we've been talking about that councils might want to uh, submit information to us on. Uh, We've got nine months to do the review, so it, it's final in May. Uh, before we get to that final point, we'll have public hearings, we'll have a draft report that councils will be able to um, make submissions to, and we'll have a final report. We'll also have workshops with councils to tease through some of the issues. I yeah, see so on your timeline you're looking at workshops in November mm -hmm. or thereabouts, so, um, and clearly regional centres uh, will, will be a part of this exercise. Um, again, you'll be talking to local government New South Wales or councils about which are the, the ideal locations to hold those workshops? Absolutely, yes. We'll, we'll uh, seek advice on what's going to be most practical, uh, what locations people can get to. We'll also have online options, uh, which does make it more accessible for more people to attend. Uh, okay, I think that finishes me. I, I do have the follow-up on the question you asked this morning on the e-conveyancing yes, timetable yes. consultation. So we received draft terms of reference for that review on the 29th of April. Yep. Uh, we consulted on those and uh, received three submissions and then published a final terms of reference in uh, June. We published an issues paper on the 15th of July we had a public hearing on um, that issues paper. Yep. We had 47 people who registered to attend that. We then had a workshop with economic regulators. Uh, part of our terms of reference asked us to consult with economic regulators from around Australia, which we did on the 8th of August, and 16 people attended that. Uh, we've received six submissions on our issues paper. And we expect to publish those later this week. Uh, we're going to publish a second issues paper in October. We'll have workshops and some other meetings in October and November. Submissions due on the second issues paper in November. We'll publish a draft report in February. Uh, submissions due on that in March. And then the final report in April. Uh, so April next year. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That looks pretty comprehensive. Um, we, we consult extensively, and as we will do on the rate peg as well. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um, th I think that's my questions for um, IPART. But I'm, I would be happy for uh, Ms Livingston to leave the show, so to speak. Thank you very much. Yep, very Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, my next line of questions is uh, probably yeah, um, to Ms, uh, Ms Cameron. Um, in regards to the uh, electronic conveyancing enforcement regime uh, document, um, is going to, um, can I can I just ask? Uh, were Arna consulted on on or well, provided a copy of that draft discussion paper? Uh, thank you. No, Arnick wasn't provided a copy of the draft discussion paper. Um, it was. It was not. It was not. No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and why why was that? Is there a rationale behind that or? It, it was a purely a New South Wales uh, document uh, building on an ARNIC consultation paper um, from 2021. Okay. Um, and so did, have ARNIC been consulted then on the proposed second bill that Mr Benassiak was asking you about? I've kept ARNIC updated throughout, that, throughout uh, the development of the process, uh, including uh, when we put the paper out and sought comments from stakeholders on the paper, we've also... Um, with the stakeholders' consent, provided those comments um, to our colleagues at ARNIC to help them um, understand comments for the national regime as well. Okay, thank you. And Ruth, uh, um, earlier this morning I asked a couple of questions around um, insurance, um, particularly around um, the ELNOs and yep. insurance. Uh, has this been flagged with you at all previously? So insurance... Uh, 
insurance, so any subscriber to an ILNO must take out insurance, so that's lawyers' conveyances. ILNOs themselves also have insurance requirements under the e-conveyancing regime. We've considered insurance implications of the interoperability reform, so we've had two reviews by Willis Towers Watson over the last, um, not sure of the exact dates, but in previous years. So it's been a theme of um, part of the review we've taken um, as part of this reform. Um. And so have you, have you, is there anywhere where you have been able to model what that insurance might look like or what, what the requirements are for insurance for illness in particular? It's sort of a bit of a unique area, so I'm not sure. Uh, the last discussion with Willis, with Willis Tells Watson from Recollection um, was that given that it is a specific area, both the, um, the role of being an ILNO is, is fairly un unusual. Um, that my recollection is that they seek, um, they, they just, the, the Willis Tells Watson recommendation was that they discuss that with their insurance providers, but I'd have to check the, the actual report on that. With, with these electronic lodgement network operators, L knows, um, would, they, um, would they be able to operate without insurance? Is it, are they going to be able to be a part of this scheme if they can't obtain insurance? The, the, the underlying e-conveyancing regime requires them to have insurance, which would be required um, under the interoperability regime as well. Yep. They must have insurance? Yes. Um, yep. And, um, and that would be the same for the conveyances, of course, in the system? Do they have to have insurance? Yeah, there are require requirements for subscribers to ILNO, so, so conveyances and lawyers have to have a particular um, insurance to engage in the system. Um, and... Um, so what happens if the Elnos can't get insurance? If, we can't, if, if all the if, if the Elnos, if there's no Elnos with insurance, thing you just said to us that the part of the requirement is that they would have insurance. This is true. This is um, so we, we have looked, uh, we have reviewed um, the insurance re requirements, um, and that particular issue hasn't um, come up as part of those that review. So I can't give you a specific answer on that question. Uh, how can else can I ask? So, so do you have a degree of comfort then that they will be able to obtain some sort of insurance product? Ba based on the reviews we did with Willis Towers Watson, um, they, their view was that it would be possible to obtain the appropriate insurances. Yep. Do they have to provide evidence that they've, documentary evidence that they are insured? From memory, under the um, the, the, the conveyancing regime, we check um, there's a an annual review process. In fact, yeah, there's a review process where we review things annually, and I'm fairly confident that um, insurance certificates of currency is something that we re we check every year for for um, the illnos. Yeah. Um. So, um, as you can, so I've had some conveyances talk to me about this, they're, they're actually, this is an area where they're quite concerned, particularly around the capacity of the all to obtain an insurance product. Um, there were, I'll, I'll paraphrase one of them, one conveyance, the conveyance spoke to me about the fact that, of course, you can get insurance, but you actually have to be prepared to pay for whatever that insurance product will be. So you may be able to get insurance, but it could actually be very expensive. Um, and so they, there is a degree of concern, I think, about going forward, just what what the insurance product will look like and what's the affordability of that. Um, and this morning we heard the Minister talk about um, his ambition for um, competition and, and uh, sort of a, a transparency in this process. But if we can't get insurers and if none of the LNOs get insurers, I'm not sure where that takes us. Has, has, has there been any work done on what we can do if that in the event of that? I know you've said that you have a degree of comfort, but... Um, the work we have done to date has pointed to insurance being available. So um, it's, it's a really important point and something we need to um, continue to monitor. Um, but the work we've done to date hasn't indicated that it will be a challenge. OK. Um, and the industry code... Um, I'm just interested to see... Um, um, just how, how that industry code, I know, I know this is a, it'll be a, a national code, is that correct? Uh, 
that's correct. So the industry code, so this is the um, the code on the um, the financial settlement side of e-conveyancing. So uh, it's it's a national code in that it's um, the, the participants in the code would be banks who might operate nationally or might be regional, yep. and ILNOs who are required to operate uh, nationally. And um, and there's going to be a, resolu a resolution process as well. As, as part of the code, yes, yes that, that would be part of the, um, the the code that's being developed. Yeah. Okay, so having that framework in place for around you know insurance resolution and the code essentially being in place, um, is there the timeline? Will, will that be in place in t for the second bill that will hopefully go through the parliament in the coming? I can't remember now, um, but in, 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 in coming sittings, we we expect the second bill. That will be in place at the same time or prior to the bill, or is, is that the, the plan? Yeah, thank you. So the, there's three time frames that I'll need to go through to answer your, your question. Um, so on the industry code, um, the work that AusPaynet is running, uh, the, the design and drafting of the code is intended to be finished by December this year, and then the ACCC needs to review the um, competition aspects of that code because you're bringing together competitors. Um, so that takes um, up to six months, that review. In terms of the amendments to the Electronic Conveyancing National Law to adopt a national enforcement regime and to consider the issues that industry has raised um, around assurance, um, that process really depends on the timetable of, um, of ARNIC, the, the group of registrars. Uh, earlier this year, we were uh, confident that it would be possible to, um, we, we anticipate it may be possible to bring that towards the end of this year, but um, we are less confident about that now, although ARNIC has not yet made any formal announcement on that. Um, the third timetable is the separate bill around a New South Wales enforcement regime, um, which is, um, is something we're considering um, at the moment. Um, one of the conveyances I spoke to about this said to me, this is to do with the insurance issue, that they were looking at, their, their suggestion was something like the Tom Torrens Assurance Fund. Mm -hmm. um, has that been considered at all or, or at least looked at as a possibility? Yeah, thank you. So the Torrens Assurance Fund is a very specific um, purpose around registration of titles, so it, it operates in a very specific way. Um, I think over the past uh, year, so more, sorry, 2021, um, we spent a long time, so we being um, an ARNIC committee, spent a long time working with industry uh, peak bodies and ILNOs uh, to understand uh, where risks and liabilities lay within the, within the reform. Uh, and so through that process, uh, we identified mitigations for those risks that are being built into the, um, what's called the model operating requirements. There are other existing mitigations, including through um, insurances that are currently required. And then there are specific um, mitigations. For example, there's a vendor guarantee that um, ILMOs are required to provide in here in New South Wales. So based on the analysis we did, looking at all the different ways things might go wrong, uh, we, we were confident that the, the existing um, the regime um, would, would be able to would be effective to meet those um, those risks without going to a, a um, an assurance fund. Um, and um, claim resolution, sort of some sort of efficient claim resolution. Um, I've had someone talk to me about the fact that there'll be a fee struck uh, on conveyances. Is this? I, I, can you just explain a bit more about one? Is that going to happen? to assist in the, um, the resolution of claims, but also um, uh, how that would work if that is the case. Like, I'm just... Yep. So my apologies, it's a new one to me. I haven't heard about the fee for the conveyances for the fee strap. In terms of fees, um, we're relying on IPART's review for any fees between the illness relating to interoperability. Other fees are covered by the existing regime, which um, re currently requires illness to cap their pricing at CPI. Okay, okay. Um, and... Um, um, I think that might just about have me. Oh, just, just find the industry code. So the the time frame and all that again. What was that? You you were looking at um, the, the three. Yeah, exactly. So the pillars of this process. Right. My apologies. So the code's designed to be drafted by the end of this year, the end of 2022, and then um, the ACCC does its review of the code, um, which can take up to six months. Yep. Right. Um, I think. That might do me for that 
cash. Given that it's yep. pretty close to 3.30, um, we might break for, for 15 minutes and return at 3.45. Mr. Veach, are you indicating? One who doesn't need to. Uh, are you, yeah, are you, we're just having a quick discussion. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. We've got a couple more and then... Okay. Can we potentially indicate that we may not need Miss Cameron? Or are you still undecided? No, we're, well, I think we're fine. I'll just, I, I think I'm fine. I'm just going to check with the Shadow Minister. Okay. And if that's okay, then we'll let Miss Cameron know and you'll be able to... Can I also ask whether uh, Mr Tid Dent well. and Miss Tid are required after um, yep. break? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, Daniel's finished with his bit, so I think Mr Wells is probably... <laughs> Mr. Dent. <laughs> nice one, Mr. Wells, but Mr. Dent. Are we both ready? Did you see the look on the to face? <laughs> how, about, how about we turn, confirm over the uh, coffee over break the, and fine. then we'll, um, you, we'll get back to you. I think they deserve it.
Okay, welcome back after that brief break. Um, I will go straight to questions from Mr. Gra John Graham. Great, thank you, Chair, and thanks to the officials. Um, uh, these questions are for Service New South Wales in the first instance. Um, uh, they've been happily directed to you by the transport agency, so um, <laughs> just to, I'm just going to give you a pre-warning before we... Uh, uh, that was the cue I needed. They <laughs> no, did good. it with a smile on their face too. <laughs> <laughs> That's they happily referred them to you. So I just want to ask some questions largely about the... Um, matter which is referred to on the budget papers at 1-7 of budget paper 1, that's the new toll relief measures, which uh, Transport happily volunteered were in the, um, uh, in your uh, agency budget as a um, line item. Uh, the first question was, of the $520 million over two years in toll relief, how is that allocated between the financial years? 252 million um, in 22-23, yep. and the remaining 276-500 in 23-24. 23-24, right? Okay. And that, um, and are you and the budget line item relating to registration is that uh, with Service New South Wales, the free rego relief, which is now being withdrawn. So I believe the, f the funding for the program that is being mm. decommissioned, I think the funding for that program has historically sat with transport and they would fund us mm. progressively to affect the payment to, uh, or the payment of free registration. Mm. Uh, the, as opposed to this replacement program where Treasury have decided to put that funding directly with the agency. Yep. Okay, thank you. And just give me those figures again for the new toll relief measure, 252. 252 million for 22-23. And 276500 for 23-24. Mm. Okay. Um, and what is the, concerningly, that's higher than the amount that's allocated in the budget? That's more than 520, isn't it? Uh, they're the figures I have in front of me, so. Let me do a reconciliation. Yeah. There, should, there shouldn't be anything sort of too tricky there. Great. Uh, I'll, I'll work out why we have a discrepancy there. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and... Uh, if you could then... Uh, can I then ask about the other measure that... Um, is withdrawn, which is the uh, small business subsidy uh, for which road tolls could be claimed. So under the small business fees and charges rebate scheme, um, small businesses were able to claim road user tolls. That scheme concluded uh, on the 30th of June 2022. Um, can you tell us what was the financial allocation for that scheme uh, for the last financial year. Let me just scan my list. Andy scan. Yeah, apologies, Mr. Graham. I look like I've got all of them except <laughs> the one you've picked. Yep. Uh, I'll um, I'll confirm that on notice if that's okay. Yeah, good. So if you could tell us um, uh, what was the, so what was the allocation in 21-22? Um, and then just confirming now, that's obviously falling to zero uh, in this financial year, given the that's, scheme has now been cancelled. I, I, that was a specifically a COVID. Yeah, it was a COVID measure. So that's not surprising, but I'm just observing that's the um, allocation this year. Um, you'll come back to us on notice about what it was. And could you also indicate how much of the allocation was spent in the last financial year? So those two numbers on notice uh, would be helpful. Um, and w I, will you be able to tell us, or can you tell us, um, how much of that rebate was claimed for tolls? Uh, if, if we can, we'll report that back on notice. Yeah. Presumably you should be able to. You'll need to know what it's being claimed for. It's a, there should be some record of um, what I, the use is. I, I would be confident that we would have that breakdown. Yeah, great. Okay, so again, 
the sub of the money that was spent, the subset of that that was claimed for tolls uh, in each of the financial years that it's, well, really just would have been last financial year when that was a possibility. Is that correct? Uh, I can't recall if that program spanned more than the single mm. financial year, but we'll report on the full period. Yeah. You, well, could you report on each financial year in the full period? Thank you for that. Um, could you also, in doing that, uh, tell us how many people um, were able to um, access that for toll relief? Uh, how many businesses that will be? Yes. yes. Yeah, correct. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, so all of that on notice, and then returning to um, uh, the t new toll relief measure, uh, which was announced in this year's budget. Uh, so the budget allocation goes for two financial years. In the first year, Transport have indicated they believe that about uh, 500,000 drivers will be eligible for that toll relief. I might just ask you, they were going away to check that. I might just, and again, they were keen to send this in your direction, Mr. Rees. Um, how many drivers are eligible in this financial year for the toll relief scheme? Um, I, I don't mean to do this to you. Uh, my understanding is Treasury did the modelling for that program. My understanding is that that one of the assumptions that underpinned that was half a million individual drivers mm. and potentially 100,000 uh, business-related um, vehicles as well. So on top of the 500,000 uh, individual um, drivers, dri accounts, 100,000 uh, and this would be in the light vehicle class, is it? Up to two light vehicles. That's, that, that's to the best of my knowledge. Yeah. yeah. And do you have a view about whether that increases in the next financial year? Is it normally these, no, most of these figures would be um, pegged to grow with either um, population or perhaps traffic growth? Yeah. Um, I, I think we'd need to ask Treasury to provide the underpinnings of their modelling. Okay. Um, so I'll take that on notice uh, in that case and go and ask them in the finance hearing. Um, what um, can you tell me for the toll relief item, which is part of your budget, how many drivers are expected to hit the $375 minimum, uh, which will allow them to claim? Uh, so... Um, you mean under the new program that we're Under the new towards. program. So once you reach a minimum of $375, you can start um, applying. How many drivers will hit that minimum? So, so unlike the previous program where there was effectively two steps and you either achieved a half free rego or mm. full re free rego, this one is obviously uh, proportionate between a minimum and a maximum spend. Yep. So, so, Mr Graham, my... my my expectation would be those numbers we spoke to of the half a million Should hit individual the 100. Yep. We expect that's the number that will enter the program at the minimum and yep. then, you know. And then how many, you know, so I, I agree with that. Um, how many will reach the maximum of $750? I, I think that would be part of Treasury's modelling that would be able to supply. This is your budget line item, though, which is why I'm asking you. Are you? It, it is. They but, haven't the, but the modelling that, that underpins you. those numbers was Treasury modelling, not Service mm. New South Wales modelling. Mm. Yeah, I, I would have hoped that would have been there. There would have been some sharing of that um, information. So yeah, well, thank I well, and I appreciate you taking on notice. Whatever you can provide would be appreciated. Um, the. And just to confirm that um, obviously the funding for the new tolling relief in year three, that is 24-25, drops to zero. You agree with that, Mr. Rees? Uh, we, we've been allocated no budget for that, yeah. for that financial year. And That's again, great. for a sensible reason, because the toll review is ongoing, so. Understanding. Yeah. Um, do you have, oh, uh, these amounts that are allocated, um, the $375, um, is that inclusive or exclusive of GST? Uh, my understanding is it would be inclusive of GST. So that is, if I 
sorry, the toll, yes, so, so the customer's toll spend, yeah. uh, I think toll rates are typically quoted as inclusive of GST, and I think yeah. our calculations would be based Yeah, on so that. if I, I pay an amount on toll, uh, a toll which includes a GST, I, I, that, I still count that when I work out if I'm eligible for the 375. That's my understanding. Yeah, great, thank you. And um, these are, in order to reach the $375, is this for each driver or each account or each household? Which of those categories are we talking about here? Uh, I'd need to take that on notice. There was quite specific and um, precise logic around that for the original program. I need to understand what the equivalent is for this new yeah, program. Yeah. And do you have any concerns? Um, obviously, answering that question would help with this, but um, do you have any concerns about... Um, I, I wouldn't put it as highly as fraud, but do you have any concerns about um, the... Obviously, some of those choices are about the way this is administered and making sure that people claim correctly. Um, uh, in devising this toll relief program, um, how have those concerns about making it ad as ad administratively simple as possible informed which of those choices you've made? Uh, so, so I think fraud is an ever-present risk mm -hmm. through any of these pro programs, particularly where we're paying out on behalf of government. Mm -hmm. uh, I was quite closely involved in the original mm -hmm toll relief program and that was that was a key consideration there yeah, yeah. how different units and groups of people travel and how they yeah. arrange their um, their tags uh, I haven't specifically uh, been close to those discussions as yeah. part of this, this new program but I would expect that's a, a key part of delivering the initiative is to look at those yeah, reasons. And I'm pleased to hear that was part of the original design one of the views that's been put to me is that um, we should not be too concerned at this point that there haven't been problems with the previous Scheme. I'm interested in your view uh, about that. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any yeah. um, significant problems with the original scheme. Yeah. And do you have um, do you have concerns about um, do, does the restructure of this make it more likely, or is this not something we should be particularly concerned about? And I'm, I say that I do not have concerns. I should just be clear on the table. So I'm not asking because I've had concerns raised at all. I'm more interested in the scheme design for toll relief and how heavily this factor has weighed. I think, um, so I, I can't speak to the decision making under the policies. If yeah. I just look at the program from a high level, yeah. th there's a change to the risk profile. We're rebating to customers as opposed to crediting um, you know, a discount against registration. Mm. So that is a that's a change to the risk profile. Mm. It introduce a different type of payment mm. risk. Uh, I think in favour of this program, because you don't have those steps, it, it doesn't have the same motivations to gaming, if you like, so yep. people can achieve, you know, achieve the discount. So I think there'll be a movement in the risk profile, whether mm. overall it's a higher or lower risk mm. program. We'd, we'd need to let the detailed risk assessments inform that. Yeah, yeah. And have they, and you have completed detailed risk assessments on those? I'm matters. not quite sure where that's in its up yeah. its delivery. So would that, would that, that, when you say the program design, that would have sat with Treasury or Transport? Uh, I would expect that it would have been a collaboration between Transport, Treasury mm. and Service New South Wales. Yeah. Uh, the, you it know, was certainly not the only reason I'm smiling is that's certainly not the impression Transport gave. Oh, OK, well. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm happy to go back to that. Maybe it's in the language. Um, but cer look, certainly, you know, we would have a role in um, providing input as a policy like that is shaped. We'd have a view around how one might operationalise it and what the considerations mm. would be. You can imagine then, once the project is passed to us to mobilise, there's increasing levels of detail that are undertaken around the design and the risks that are inherent in the program. Mm. And we would work with trans transport and if necessary, Treasury, if any of that needed any sort of material deviation to the original concept. Mm. OK. Um, can you tell me how much are the um, uh, top 10% of non-business e-toll customers uh, paying in tolls each year? Uh, I suspect that's a question for transport, um, but I'll take it on notice and confirm. Mm. Um, Yes, and I, I might put some other questions to you, perhaps in supplementary questions to this um, hearing. I think that'd be the easiest way to um, to deal with it. Um, I might. 
think that covers off the... Yeah, I think that covers... Um, I do, I've got a small number of um, questions about... It. You want me to... Yeah, OK. okay. <clears throat> I might just deal with that now, then. Uh, and again, these are questions to Service New South Wales and they're questions that have um, uh, also been relevant to the transport um, uh, hearings. Um, uh, Mr Rees, are you aware of... Um, I, I want to ask about the e-toll, what's been described as the e-toll glitch, um, which led to duplicate transactions or, in some cases, what were referred to as multiple duplicate um, transactions. Uh, can you give us any background about what the problem is here? Uh, so I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of transport, but I can um, describe our understanding. I think transport's eToll division was uh, was migrating uh, between two systems. I think there were some challenges uh, experienced in that migration that did impact customers. From a Service New South Wales standpoint, you know we saw a you know material increase in. Uh, customer inquiry and customer need when it came to eToll, mm. um, and we've been working through that both with transport and uh, and those impacted customers. Yep. And from what you've been told by transport, as you deal with the people who are impacted by this, are those problems now resolved? Are you expecting any other uh, problems with the system? Uh, I, my understanding is we're certainly. Um, past the worst of it, um, and I think we've managed to resolve uh, and support the majority of impacted people. There may still be a, um, a cohort out there that have not yet reached out for, uh, for support, um, and we, we have many interactions and many, many, many system dependencies on transport, but I think the, the, um, the change that created this challenge, I, I believe, was a point-in-time migration, and so I'm not expecting uh, subsequent rounds of that to impact us and our customers in the same way. This seemed to occur in three tranches. Uh, in the first uh, incident, um, the first system problem, 45,000 drivers were affected. In the second, a different issue, 78,000 were affected. In the third, again, a different issue, 14,000 people were affected. Does that accord with your understanding of the scale of the problem? Uh, certainly, we, we understood the, the impact to be significant. I'd need to take on notice those specific data points mm. that you've raised there. Yep. Um, are you aware of um, people having... One of the issues that's been reported subsequently is um, people who have been having trouble resetting their password in order to check that um, their accounts are up to date. Uh, do you have concerns or have you had reports that multiple people have problems with online access and are needing to phone in for a password reset? We, we certainly saw a significant increase in volume of customers needing, needing support off the back of that change. Um, I think there was a range of challenges they experienced, so I'd need to, to take on notice the specific problems that are continuing to impact customers. Mm. And um, one of the issues is that um, the account history, one of the views that's been put to me is the account history for people should have been visible for something like 20 months, but is now lo no longer visible past the February of this year. And that's one of the things that's made it harder to resolve these issues. Is that account correct? That, that would be referencing, I think, a transport system. That question would best be directed to them. The way you've described it, it sounds mm. like customers attempting to log on to the mm. transport system to check balances. Mm. Again, again, that was uh, not uh, their view, but I'm seeing them tomorrow, so I'll happily um, happily revisit that. I and uh, and we'll, we'll take on notice just in case. Yeah, OK, that, would, that would be helpful, so... That's added, John? Yep, all good. Thank you. Thank you. you. Um, actually, I've just got a couple of questions that follow on, mm -hmm. um, but more to do with uh, what is known as the EMU casual pass. Who, Ms. Ms Hogan, who's responsible for the EMU pass? Anyone in customer service? Or is that... This is the tag for re mainly regional people. They get the tag as they come into Sydney, they pay the toll. Um, does, it, does it come to you guys? Hopefully it's not in my area because I don't actually know anything about that. Um, it and may well be If Damon tomorrow. doesn't, it might be a matter for transport or regional transport, I'm sorry. It may well be tomorrow, yeah. We have regional transport. 
Yeah, sorry, it, it's it's not something I'm aware of. The D Department of Customer Service doesn't operate any um, any tolling services. No. Okay. Okay. I'll leave those. They're there for tomorrow. Um, I know Mr. Dent's been waiting very patiently to see why we kept him back. So I thought I might just uh, ask a couple of questions. So he's aware of why we kept him back. Thank you, Ms. Veach. <laughs> Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Dent. Um, how much has been spent on consultants, including actuaries, on the workers' compensation scheme in the last 12 months mm -hmm. and then for the year before that? Are you aware? That is an excellent question. I am hoping I have that with me. Uh, so, um, the unaudited figures for the 2022 financial year are for actuaries. Um, it would be around 6 million, and the year prior, 2021, uh, is 9.2 million. Um, um, and are you planning to consult on fixing the Workers' Compensation Acts, that, that process that was discussed this morning? Um, are you using consultants for that as well? Uh, a good amount of the work will be done internally, but where we, once we've developed policy positions, if um, they're aligned with what the government are looking for, we would then have those costed by actuaries, absolutely. Okay. Um, the, uh, we asked a couple of questions this morning about um, deemed diseases. I think my colleague, Mr Primrose, may have asked those, or maybe Mr Mookie. Um, and you commissioned a report to review the latest scientific research to inform policy and develop um, a list of scheduled diseases and guides material. Um, can I just ask, uh, are we looking at adding the additional deemed, are we looking at adding additional deemed diseases uh, to actuaries? Sorry, uh, actuaries are deemed disease. Um, no, no, I, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> are we looking at asking them look for advice? Them. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one of your former colleagues would have probably agreed with the first statement I made. Um, so yes, at the moment, what we are doing, so we've we've taken that work, work from Safe Work Australia. Um, so it includes things like COVID-19, PTSD, um, cancers and skin issues. Um, we've asked our actuaries to start looking at what the costs to the scheme would be of those coming on board. So yes, before we make a policy a recommendation, we would do that with the potential cost impact. And the time frame for that to that, that work? I don't have the time frame with me other than that the work is underway at present. I'm happy for you to take, I, that, I on take that on notice. Yeah, thanks. And, uh, and also who's undertaking the work? Uh, the scheme actuary for workers' compensation is EY. EY? So my, I expect it would be them. Okay. Was there a cost for that work? There will be, yes. Yeah. We budget annually uh, within our actual <laughs> um, sort of arrangements for a number of these type of things. So our, each year, so at the moment we're spending $3 million less than the year prior. We've renegotiated contracts with our providers. So within that window, we anticipate there'd be a number of requests for advice like this. So um, I wouldn't, would, we would ask for a specific scope of work on each occasion from, from the panel provider, which is EY. And so meeting that within budget then? It would be within budget, absolutely. Okay. Yes. Um, and so uh, doesn't um, adding deemed diseases save the workers' compensation scheme the system money in the long term? Uh, you could certainly argue because it would make the claims process simpler, absolutely. Um, it's essentially a matter, a policy matter for government <laughs> to determine whether they agree with that. But broadly, where something is deemed, um, assuming the... Um, the legislation provides enough control around it that it is actually indeed proven to be work-related um, on a general basis, then yes, it would theoretically remove the claims management cost and potentially part of the adversarial nature of developing a claim. Okay. That, would that get picked up in actual, actuarial advice? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, if I could go on to the Personal Injury Commission, um, how much is the Commission costing... Uh, how much of that's coming out of the Workers' Compensation Operational Fund? for the um, cost of running the piece. Just one moment, sorry. So the Personal Injury Commission in the 20, for this financial, current financial year? Yep. Or pre, yeah, so the current financial. If you've got, if you've got both here, that'd be. Yeah, so the current financial year, I have 33.6 million out of the Workers' Comp Operating Fund for the Commission. Yeah. Um, and the previous year was 26.7 million. 36.7. Okay, and how does this compare with the cost of the former Workers' Compensation Commission costs, you know? 
I don't have that with me other than to say in previous years, I imagine on this page where it says commission uh, in 2019-20, it would have obviously meant the Workers' Comp Commission in its previous form. There's about 25 million. So there's been a um, an increase between last financial year and this financial year. I actually understand that relates to some projects around IT systems. It's more likely to have driven the... Um, more significant increase. So it's, it's reasonably on par. The commission hasn't grown substantially um, other than taking on the new functions that it would have funded through the Motor Accident Operating Fund. Okay. Um, and is there a, uh, an increase or even a decrease in the cost of the Personal Injury Tribunal? Personal Injury Tribunal? Uh, the co uh, commission? Uh, so the, the, between last year and this year, there is an increase in the cost. Yeah. Okay. And when I saw it at Matchery's, matter of interest, you're also looking at consultants as well. That, that price you gave for um, the consultants, including actuaries, is that the, was that just for actuaries? I'll just be perfectly clear. Was that just for actuaries? Uh, that number of the total consultants is slightly higher. So this, the unaudited number for 2022, the total consultants was 6.2 million. So there was um, th there's minimal expenditure outside of actuaries, actuaries for consultants within CIRA. Okay. I don't know. I think for the time being, that will do me there. I might just ask a couple more questions, but Mr. Primrose, if you want to... Mm -hmm. uh, I, if I can, I'd just like to finish up on um, park and pay. Just just a couple of quick questions, because um, um, I found my piece of paper. Um, can you tell me, um, and this is again through the Secretary, but I presume Mr. Wells will answer it, how many probity reports have been commissioned so far into Duncan, uh, the Duncan park and pay proposal? Uh, so there are two that we talked about before and one in progress, three. Okay, so that's three. The, the third Just one... To be, to be clear, though, the third one isn't about Duncan, um, and even the second one wasn't about Duncan, to be clear. So the first one was directly about sole sourcing Duncan. Uh, sorry, the first one was about Duncan. The second one was about scaling the solution statewide, which we've talked about, and the third one relates to disability sensors. Okay, so the third one, and that's on... When do you expect to receive... That report. I, I think we've just completed the scope of works for that, so we haven't commenced that that work yet. Um, why did you, can I ask, do a probity report into the census, even though you're not involved in the actual procurement? Look, I think... It, Again, a matter of judgment just because of the interest uh, in, in the program of work. So we just wanted to make sure, sure in terms of you know, that allocation of funds to councils, uh, how that worked and that we were following our, our principles, right? So my understanding is that the actual procurement would be done by local government. Not yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. But, but you did the probity. Report. Well, yeah, the probity is more around the funding allocation than a, pro than a procurement process, if you like, because as we've talked about, the procurement process is conducted by councils. Okay. Can I ask, in relation to each of the probity reports that you've mentioned, were they commissioned before or after the contract was signed? Uh, as Ms Young talked about this morning, we, there's various points that we can, we can um, seek probity advice. I think the first one was after the pilot, um, or after the after the allocation, per the, per the emails you've got there. I'll have to take on notice, Mr Primrose, the second one as to when that happened, but it um, was obviously before we've, we'd significantly scaled the solution across the state, so it was in the, pr in, in the period between pilot and, and scaling it, if you like. Uh, and in terms of the third one, as I've talked about, we have started um, with councils that already have parking agreements in place and they're, they're trialling disability sensors. So we wanted to use that work to inform the process um, uh, of scale across the state, for the, across the state, excuse me, for the 3,600 sensors. Uh, so that probity um, report, which is more about funding allocation, will inform that process. Um, let, let's, uh, hypothetical, um, obviously, if, if the probity report came back and expressed um, serious reservations and you've already signed the contract with, you know, with that particular agency, what do you do? Look, it would depend on the scenario and what the, what the actual well, situation was. If they came was. back and the probity said, don't touch them with a barge pole, and you've already signed the contract, how does that work? Well, uh, again, it, depending, it would really depend on the scenario. I mean, but our contracts do um, contemplate... Um, Termination for its extreme circumstances or non-performance or non-compliance. So there's a, a very, there's various scenarios that could play out from that process. But it doesn't that that doesn't trouble you that you check out 
whether someone meets their the adequate and acceptable level of probity before you've signed the contract. As we said, what we did internally was check all those things first. Uh, and then post the pilot, we, we sought a, an additional check from the probity advisor. So we did, we did that work, Mr Primrose, as we talked about before. Okay. Um, how many times, if I can ask um, Ms Hogan, does your cluster do that in relation? How many probity checks does, would the cluster undertake every year, for example? Uh, I'd have to ask Ms Young, but I'd probably need to take it on notice, I would think. Do you yeah, have an answer? We would need to take it on notice, but it is absolutely an exception that we do that. And, and it it's an exception that we would seek external probity advice, but internally we would seek legal advice or probity advice yeah, on yeah. contracts. So we can take it on notice, um, but I don't think the number would be particularly high. Okay, well, what, what I'm looking at is maybe f so I can understand this process over the last three years, please f take it on notice. One is, in terms of the cluster, how many probity checks have been undertaken? Um, and, and secondly, how many of those have been undertaken after contracts have been signed? Oh, we'll take that on notice. Okay. And um, if they have been taken, uh, um, if we have taken probity advice after a contract has been signed, uh, we'll share with you why that was the case. Okay, I, I'd appreciate that. And um, um, look, I'm, I'm not going to pursue it. I, I, I find it a, a, a very strange way of doing for a government agency to work, but um, um, that, that's not my government. Um, but I'll leave that um, and won't ask you to comment on the politics, but I'd appreciate that. We'll Thank take you. take that on notice. Thank you. Thanks. Just, just to wind out on that, I guess close that out, but I, I would assume that there would be, each time you engaged a probity advisor or a probity auditor, there would be a set of instructions around like the scope of the, the work yeah, that they're course. undertake. Um, is it possible to provide us with the scope of work for the audit, the probity audits that were, or probity advice that was provided for this? Not the actual, I don't want the dollars and cents. Um, and, um, yeah, so. Um, yeah so, so I suspect for the first two probity audits that um, we've referred to today, they're in the standing order 52 that's been provided, I think. Yep. Um, but in relation to the scope for the third one, um, uh, if that's um, complete and that's underway, I'm sure we could provide it on notice. Yep, okay. Um, and just to, just to clarify from this morning, there was a, under 005, there's a panel of... That's right. Um, that's right. ..of probity orders and you sort of, you, you get to... Ch pick one of those off the panel. Yep. It's not a taxi rank that rolls and you have to take the top one, it's just there's a, you can no, choose. No, you can choose from the panel like you can with most things. Uh, some probity um, organisations might specialise more to one set of things than another, so we would make the judgement as to which okay. one we were going to use based on their experience and skills, I would Thank imagine. You. Is it possible in that last three years that Mr Primrose was talking about, just which probity order companies you've used, how many times you've used them? like? I don't want to Over one. three years? Yeah. Yep. That's good. Um, and I reckon I'm, I put, I'm going to put these on notice, so I think that yep. will wrap me up. We're happy with that. All done? Yep. yep. Word, right, Peter, or would you like us to continue? <laughs> word going. Now we go to the highlight of the day, my turn. Yes, your turn. <laughs> it is your turn. I wait with bated breath. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for your time and professionalism. Some of you took some questions on notice. Were any of you in any position to update the committee or share some additional information before we conclude? Um, I think uh, all of the updates we had, we provided before the lunch break and anything else is in a bit more detail. I think Mr oh, so, oh, sorry. I, um, I have two quick updates, uh, if I may. Um, first, a clarification my CFO sent. In relation to the expenditure on actuaries, I need to be clear that, that is for the whole of CIRA. So that includes the motor accident scheme, not just workers' compensation. And I would suggest most of our expenditure on actuaries would be weighted towards a motor accident scheme because there are more significant matters we need actuarial support on, including risk equalisation measures, etc. Are you able so to break those down, um, Mr Dillon? Uh, we can do it on notice, absolutely. Please. I just yes, don't have please. that available today. But it's certainly, uh, that was not just for workers' comp. I wanted to make clear on that. Um, and Chair, for you, the two agencies that we have signed up for workers' compensation assists um, already uh, include Fire and Rescue New South Wales, and um, I'm pleased to say that the Department of Customer Service has also agreed to be part of that pilot. 
Oh, that's you good. would imagine. Well, <laughs> if they hadn't, you would know exactly where you, who you need to speak to. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, <laughs> what, that's what, what I think of the policy. <laughs> Despite how closely we sit, it's stunning, not, uh, not stunning endorsement. <laughs> All right. Well, that, thank you very much. That concludes uh, the hearing today. Um, in terms of questions, you have taken on notice. You'll thank you for a respectful session. Thank no, you. you'll have 21 days. Thank and um, you. Get safe travels home. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Come, Mr. Dean.